to the Vancouver City Council meeting of Tuesday, April 26th. This uh, council meeting is being convened by electronic means as authorized under part 14 of the procedure bylaw of the City of Vancouver electronic meetings. As such, council members and the public may participate in person or by electronic means. If a council member attending by electronic means loses connection during the voting process, staff are available to get you back online quickly and you've got the information. For those contacts, uh, video of, of council members speaking presentations and vote results will be projected on the live stream when available. And um, uh, council members must enable their video to confirm quorum if you're attending online. As always, we acknowledge that we are on the unceded traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Slabletooth uh, people and thank them for their generosity to all who uh, live, work, and play on their lands. And I must report that I had a great uh, about two hour session with uh, Chief Wayne Sparrow a couple of days ago. We were going through uh, current and future business, and I have to say, those are. It's a delight to uh, be able to sit down with with the chiefs and and talk about how how we're working together. Also, want to thank a staff. I know it's been a really uh, tough couple of weeks with uh, with the Winters Hotel and uh, all the all the regular administrative work we do here. But uh, thanks very much to the staff and the Vancouver Fire and Rescue Services, all the city staff that helped uh, through that tough uh, incident, and all the regular work that you do. So thank you so much. Uh, clerk, can we have the roll call, please? Mayor Stewart in the chair. Councillor Carr? Here. Councillor DiGenova? Present. Councillor Fry? Here. Councillor Swanson? Here. Councillor Hardwick? Present. Councillor Weeb? Present. Councillor Boyle? Present. Councillor Dominato? Present. Councillor Bly? And Councillor Kirby Young? You core Mayor Stewart. Thanks very much. Um, Council, I'm going to start uh, with an acknowledgement this morning about our day of mourning, uh, April 28th, 2022. Uh, that's when we're recognizing uh, the day of mourning here in Vancouver. So I'd like to begin today's Council meeting with an acknowledgement that this Thursday, April 28th, is Workers' Day of Mourning. Every year on April 28th, we pay our respects and remember those who have been killed, injured, or suffered illness as a result of work-related incidents. Sadly, we lost one of our own earlier this year in a workplace accident. Uh, Gord Liniak uh, was a, uh, sorry, a truck driver in engineering services for 32 years, was killed in a workplace accident on January 7th, 2022 at National Yards. In 2021, we also lost four retired members of the Vancouver Fire and Rescue Services due to work-related illnesses. And thank the city manager for uh, and other councillors for attending with me um, uh, a service uh, on the weekend for uh, one of those fallen members. City employees have always played an essential role in making Vancouver a city that works for everyone and the importance of their work and the work of everyone on the front lines has never been more clear. Essential workers continue to provide us with the critical services to keep us safe. The City of Vancouver is committed to creating safe and healthy workplaces so that everyone can go home safe at the end of their shift. We will share this day with the family, friends, and colleagues of those who have lost loved ones and feel this loss every single day. Please join me for a moment of silence to remember those who have been killed or injured in the workplace and those who have suffered from work-related illnesses. Thank you, Council. Uh, Going to move to the plan for the day. Uh, any comments on the agenda items can be sent to Council using the web form on the City's website. A link to that form will be tweeted out on at Van City Clerk. I also want to note that we have a very long-standing commitment to equity, diversity, and, and inclusion, and remind Council that when addressing speakers and staff, please avoid using gendered honorifics. Today we have three administrative items, one item of unfinished business, four reports, ten bylaws, four council members' motions, notice of council member motions, a new business inquiries, and other matters. And the plan for the day is to uh, break at noon uh, for lunch and in camera and then return at 3 p.m. Uh, there's no public hearing this evening, so if needed, we'll break for five for dinner and then return at 6 p.m. to finish business. 
Uh, we're inquire, required to meet in camera later this week. The reasons and authority under the Vancouver Charter are listed in the agenda. Would someone like to move a motion? I'll move. Thank you, Councillor Dejan. Okay. Second, Councillor Carr. Thank you. All in favor, yay. Yay. Opposed, nay. Carries unanimously. Thank you so much. We have eight sets of minutes, Council. So, uh, so I'm going to go through these one at a time. Mm -hmm. Minutes are one are from special council meeting for the purposes of having a workshop on the draft uh, capital plan. Are there any corrections? Move adoption. Thanks very much. Councillor Dejanova, seconder. Councillor Carr, thank you. All in favor, yay. Yay. Opposed, nay. Yay. No nays. Unanimous. Thank you. Minutes two are from the special council meeting for the purposes of going in camera of April 5th. Any corrections? Move adoption. Move adoption. Councillor Dejanova, thank you. Seconder. Councillor Kirby Young. Councillor Kirby Young, thank you. All in favor, yay. Yay. Opposed, nay. Great. Minutes three are from the council meeting of April 12th. Any corrections? Move adoption. Move adoption from Councillor Dejanova. Do we have seconder Councillor Carr? All in favor, yay. Opposed, nay. It's passed. Thank you. Minutes four from the public hearing of April 12th. Any Move corrections? Move adoption. Councillor Dejanova moves adoption. Second Councillor Carr. All in favor, yay. Yay. Opposed, nay. Was passed. Council five are from the council meeting immediately following the standing committee on policy and prior strategic priorities meeting of April 13th. Uh, any corrections? Move adoption. Second. Uh, I heard Councillor Dejanova first, uh, and then Councillor Carr second uh, for the seconder. All in favor, yay. Yay. Opposed, nay. Opposed, passed, thank you. Minute six of the special council meeting for the purposes of going in camera on April 13th. Corrections, minutes. Uh, mover, please. Move adopt. Thank you. Seconder. Kirby Young. Councillor Boyle, I heard. All in favor, yay. Yay. Opposed, nay. Thanks. Minute seven uh, were withdrawn from the approval list. Okay, I don't need to read that. Minute eight are from the special council meeting for the purposes of holding a business license hearing of April 20th. Any corrections? Mover, please. Move adoption. Thank you, Councillor Dejanova, seconder. Councillor Boyle, thank you. All in favor, yay. 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 Opposed, nay. Thank you. Those passed. Last one, minutes nine are the Auditor General Committee meeting of April 22nd. Any corrections to the minutes? Mover? So moved. Heard uh, Councillor Weeb, seconded by Councillor uh, Hardwick. All in favor, yay. Yay. Opposed, nay. Thanks very much. That's all passed. Okay, Council, we're going to move to matters adopted on consent. We have report three on the consent uh, agenda for consideration. Report one has a staff presentation. Report two has a staff presentation as well as speakers. Report four has speakers. So we may adopt the recommendation uh, in the report in a single motion. Uh, do we have a mover? Um, Sorry, I've got Councillor Dejanova on the list here. Thanks. You want to hold report um, three? I'd like to hold uh, report number one, official oh, yeah, apology to the Italian Canadian community in Vancouver. Okay, thanks. Yep, that's held. Anybody else want to hold report three? Okay, Councillor Carr moves adoption. Um, seconder? Second. Second. For the consent agenda, right? Uh, all in favor, yay. 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 Opposed, yay. nay. Great. So thanks so much. Uh, the following report has been approved on consent. Report 3, 2021 property tax exemptions. Okay. So, Council, we have one item of unfinished business today, and this is the uh, CD1 rezoning on 1477 West Broadway. Uh, I just as prelude, on uh, April 14th, 19th, and 21st, Vancouver City Council held a public hearing on the above noted matter, and on April 21st, following the close of speaker's list and receipt of public comments, uh, referred closing comments, questions to staff, debate, and decision to the council meeting today is unfinished business. Council members who were not present in the public hearing must confirm that they have reviewed the proceedings of the meeting if they wish to vote. Councillor Bly was absent on April 14th, 19th, and 21st. Councillor Boyle was absent on 14th. Councillor Carr was absent on April 19th. Councillor Dejanova was absent for the portion of this item on April 19th. I'm going to ask um, Councillor Bly. Is Councillor Bly here? I don't think she's. No. Okay. So, uh, Councillor Boyle, have you uh, have you reviewed the proceedings? Will you be voting? Thank you. Have and will. Uh, Councillor Carr. Councillor Carr has and she will. Uh, Councillor Dejanova. 
Great, all three councillors have confirmed. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to hearing closing comments from the applicant and staff. And I'm just gonna make sure that we have the applicant here to speak. Just gonna check with clerks. Do we have the applicant here? Maybe while we're waiting for the applicant, uh, Councillor Bly, I was just wondering, we're on um, the uh, 140, 1477 West Broadway. Okay. Uh, thanks, and you did miss uh, the 14th, 19th, and 21st, uh, the leaves of absence, and I was just wondering uh, if you have reviewed the proceedings and, and whether or not you'll be voting. I, get you I, I have and I will. Have and you will, thanks so much. Okay, that's been recorded by the clerk. And so we have the applicants online, I, I gather, so I'm just gonna ask the applicants, do you have um, any closing comments? Good morning, Mayor and Council. It's Tim Grant, PCI uh, President. Please go ahead. Um, th thank you for the opportunity to speak this morning, and, and thank you for your consideration of our application. Um, in July 2021, at the Broadway Plan Issues Reports proceedings, you strongly supported staff's recommendation and unique merit and, and need of considering our rezoning application urgently ahead of the Broadway Plan. Today, the supporting rationale of your decision last July holds even more true, and the need to continue progressing our development urgently is increasingly acute as South Granville Station gets closer to opening in 2025. By supporting the rezoning now, you are facilitating successful unobstructed completion and opening of South Granville Station, the only fully integrated station on the Broadway line, which is necessitated given the many challenges and constraints inherent at this prominent busy intersection and transit node. Delaying decision on our development today <clears throat> will exacerbate our ability to complete our work for South Granville Station amidst an already complex public infrastructure, private development collaboration, and prolonged challenges for transit users, pedestrians, local businesses, and vehicle traffic, and standing challenging conditions experienced through COVID and Broadway subway construction. We are, we are one of few developers in the region who have built adjacent to operating transit stations and who have to do so here above an operating South Granville Station would present challenges in maintaining transit user experience and safety and that of pedestrians, bicyclists and vehicle traffic far beyond what we've had to address at other stations. Supporting our project now would facilitate continued progression of complicated collaborative development plan we have with the province and the transit project to best mitigate these pronounced challenges at South Granville Station. Supporting now would also facilitate completion without delay of 223 new market and below market rental homes. In closing, I just wanna take the opportunity to thank, to thank again, those who have participated in the rezoning process to date and this public hearing through submitting comments, calling in and attending in person, and of course, city staff. We are particularly appreciative of the variety of people and organizations in the neighborhood that we've connected with and their willingness to discuss our application with us including a number of local renters, stratas, property owners, local businesses, and nonprofits such as the South Granville BIA and Granville Island Council. We look forward to continuing these conversations and expanding these relationships as a proud long-term member of the South Granville community. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, again, just closing comments from the applicant today, but uh, any closing comments from staff? Well, this is Desiree Drew at the rezoning planner for this project. Sorry, you're a little faint. If you could speak. Oh, I apologize. Could you hear me now? Yes, we can. Thanks. Good morning, Mayor and Council. This is Desiree Drew at the rezoning planner for this project. Uh, the only thing that staff wanted to mention was the yellow memo dated April 19th, which was issued uh, regarding the clarification of exclusions for amenity areas, and it supersedes the memo posted on April 14th. Um, and the posted bylaw. So it's just a reminder that that is something that we would need a motion on. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, now, um, does council have any questions for staff?
Councilor Carr, up to five minutes whenever you're ready. Yes, uh, thanks, Mayor. Um, so a few questions. Um, why wasn't this proposal delayed to after the plan? Uh, sorry, the Broadway plan? Why did it come in under the interim? Good morning, Councilor Carr. Um, so this project was considered, as you know, by Council under the interim rezoning policy for the Broadway plan. Um, at that time in July 2021, Council did approve the recommendations of that issues report uh, and staff were instructed to consider the rezoning application as an exceptional circumstance, which is policy, policy three um, in the interim rezoning policy. Um, and at that time, the issues report stated that by allowing the application to advance, the potential access, safety, and circulation impacts to the stations could be mitigated um, due to the future construction um, in anticipation of the subway station opening toward the end of 2025. Is the timing of this, um, um, this uh, uh, approval um, critical in terms of that opening and uh, the, yeah, the timing of the development of the station? I'm sorry, could you rephrase that? Is is, the, is the I'll let you do that. Is the timing of the approval, the timing of this decision um, critical in terms of the opening of the hmm. station? Um, I will pass it to our friends in uh, transit integration to answer your question. Hi, uh, Michelle Lee Hunt, uh, Development Planner, Transit Integration and Projects. Uh, so the desire was for limiting the overlap of construction between the development overhead, the station, while the station was open and functioning. So to sort of mitigate the impact of uh, public safety and that sort of thing while people were using and accessing the station. Okay. So what's... It all right. Okay, I get that. And it's and is it critical? I mean, are we talking about a difference of a month or a week does make a difference, or months or two months? That is critical, that timing? Uh, it was felt that reducing the overlap of construction of the development and the station was critical. That was approved by council. Okay, what, what's the rationale for, this, uh, for the extra height? I will defer to uh, Desiree. So the the project that was, um, or sorry, the application that came before us came in as you see it as a 39 story tower. Um, the analysis was done by real estate on the performa and the project does propose an increased amount of commercial space, which is above and beyond what would be in C3A and all in line with the Metrocore plan. Um, and it also does consider housing in the tower consisting of uh, secured rental units with 20% below market units. Okay. So it just came in at that height. And that height is consistent with the interim rezoning policy for the Broadway plan? The, so the, the height on this project, uh, so the draft Broadway plan uh, for this area, the, the draft Broadway plan is uh, talking about or discussing uh, 35 to 40 stories. Okay, so the Broadway plan, so is this building influencing the Broadway plan or is the Broadway plan, is this building consistent with what is being drafted in the Broadway plan? Just want to make sure, because many speakers talked about the fact that this would influence the Broadway plan and this were to go ahead. So I'm looking at the timing of decision making here and which influences what? Yes, thank you for the question. Councillor Carr, I'll pass it over to my colleague and the Broadway planning team, John Grottenberg. Thanks for the question, Councillor John Grottenberg on the Broadway plan team. So uh, this project is, is not influencing the proposed heights for the draft Broadway plan in the area. The heights and densities and use mix that we've developed through the planning program, uh, we've arrived at independently um, through the planning process based on technical work, extensive economic tents, uh, testing and community engagement. Okay, um, great. And um, can you speak to the sustainability? I'm, I don't have many seconds. I'm sorry. Is this building good in terms of climate or not? 
Uh, good morning, Mayor and Council. My name is Doug Smith. I'm the Director of Sustainability. Uh, short answer, yes. Uh, this building, uh, their rezoning application indicates about 5% of the emissions compared to the average building of its size across Vancouver, so very, very low. Um, lower than we actually require. Um, and uh, coming up in the next month, there'll be some updated reports that are lowering the emissions continuously and also requiring uh, reduced embodied emissions in uh, buildings of this size as well. Thanks so much. Uh, we're over to Councillor Weeb next. Councillor Weeb, up to five. Uh, yeah, first question, recognizing this is um, a rezoning process, are we able to see the applicant boards or the architectural models in the future? I know that we're moving through a hybrid process, but normally we have full books behind me, full boards, and an architectural model to help give us clarity on that information. So I'm wondering if that's something we'll see in the future. Thank you for the question, um, Councillor Weeb. Yes, we're, we're currently looking into uh, evolving back into an in-person or a hybrid model. As you can understand, we're sort of in that in-between right now. So this is something that we're looking at through all of our processes, our meetings with the Urban Design Panel, other advisory committees, DP board, and council uh, at this point. This application came in uh, and went through that process during COVID, which meant that we weren't requiring physical materials for those other processes and didn't require it for this. However, we are exploring what that looks like with clerks and other staff, IT, et cetera, for okay, future. Thank you. And a follow-up on that, <clears throat> some of the speakers talked about not being able to attend an open house where they could have dialogue with staff. Can you talk about the opportunity for the public to have dialogue in a town hall or any um, events that we propose? Sure. I'll defer to uh, Des from rezoning on that and uh, possibly John Grottenberg as well. Okay, thank you. Thanks for the question, Councillor Weeb. This is Desiree Drew at the Rezoning Planner. Um, so, since this rezoning application was considered uh, during COVID and we have COVID protocols in place, uh, the project did still follow typical rezoning application review and public consultation as we do for all our rezoning applications during um, this challenging time with the pandemic. So, we did follow those consultants consultation protocols. We had three weeks of a virtual open house, which was open online. We sent out four th over 4,000 notifications to the surrounding neighborhood within about a two block radius. Uh, we did receive over 400 uh, responses, including about 10 questions directly um, to staff regarding the application. Uh, we also attended urban design panel at the beginning of December where the project was supported unanimously. Um, so these are all typical processes that we would uh, include as part of the rezoning review and, and public consultation. Okay, thank you. Um, my next question is on the DCL waiver. Will this project get an increased affordability by applying for the DCL waiver or not? Thanks for the question, Councillor Weeb. I'll pass this over to um, my colleagues in housing. Thank uh, you for the. Oh, go ahead, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Excuse me. Go ahead, go ahead, Dan. Sorry about that. Sorry for the confusion. I'm Dan Garrison from uh, Housing Policy and Regulation. Uh, yeah, the, the project is anticipating applying for the uh, DCL waiver. Um, one of the streams in the DCL bylaw through which you can access the waiver is providing uh, to at least 20% of your floor area secured at the moderate income rents. <laughs> uh, this project will do that. So um, these are significant discounts uh, to market uh, pegged to the moderate income rents that were uh, established in 2017. So now looking at very significant discounts uh, below what the market rent would be. Okay, and recognizing that if they get provincial or federal funding, that will not decrease the affordability of the project or increase the affordability of the project. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, and I think through the process, the applicant uh, had had confirmed in the initial round of questions that they aren't sure yet whether they will be pursuing or, or accessing federal or provincial financing for the project. But uh, if they do, it would it would not necessarily impact or change the um, affordability levels that are being secured uh, uh, today. So we have to approve the affordability rate, and if they get provincial or federal funding and it increases, improves their performance, it doesn't actually increase the affordability of the project. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, that, that, that would be correct. It's not uncommon for projects to have to uh, proceed through rezoning approval prior to um, securing all their financing. In fact, usually approval at rezoning is a, is a condition of financing, and so 
that is um, that, that's fairly to standard. Identify that the provincial and federal funding doesn't actually increase the, the affordability on the project. Right. Maybe the feasibility. Um, recognizing the current zoning C3A as an FSR of three, which is 77,000 square feet, and proposed zoning of CD1 would give an FSR of 12.3 at 318,000 square feet. That difference about 240. And if you look at the development cost expectation of 425 square foot, that's about 103 million. And with the DCL waiver, that's 105 million if this was market. And so I'm just wondering, how do we determine the amenity contribution of the rental and the affordable rental to the city of Vancouver? So how do we as city councillors make that determination on if this was market versus a rental building? What is the benefit? You're, you're well over your five. You're well over your five minutes, so perhaps... Uh Maybe we get a second round and I can be asked. Thank you. Councillor Dominato up to five. Uh, thanks, Mayor, and, and thanks, staff. Um, just a couple of follow-up questions. Um, with respect to the timing of this, so council, um, while not unanimous, gave direction to have this come forward uh, prior to the Broadway plan. Um, had that not taken place, um, would the likely outcome have been that um, the applicant would wait until after the Broadway plan and make an application? And so then the station head would be built out and um, they would be building above if a future council was supportive of the application? Thanks for your question, Councillor Dominato. Um, so at the time, if council did not did not recommend that staff pursue review of the application in advance of the Broadway plan, then the application would be considered at the time that the interim policy was lifted. Okay, and and in all likelihood that would happen after the Broadway plan is approved? Or is there a lag time between the Broadway time plan being approved and the interim policy being rescinded? Right. Um, I can't say for certain since we're not in that. Um, maybe what I'll do is I'll hand this over to my colleague, John Grottenberg in Broadway Plan, and he can address that. I, I can Thank I you. can take that, Des. Um, Councillor, the, the Broadway plan, the timing of the Broadway plan in this application just is was actually coincidental. We didn't know last summer when council approved the IRP, or approved this application to move forward that they would be coming so close to it, each other. So it, so it was, basically random but yes after the council makes a decision on the broadway plan one of the recommendations in the broadway plan will be to rescind the irp so when the council has a favorable consideration of the broadway plan that irp will be rescinded okay thank you i appreciate that and and just for reconfirming um the uh, with the proposal, the applicant made the application for 39 stories, which includes the market rental and below market rental, the 49 units. Uh, those 49 units are largely just confirm my understanding are largely subsidized by um, the market rental. Is that correct? Hi there, Desiree Drew at Rezoning Planner. Um, I will hand this over to my colleagues in housing to answer. Thank you for the question, Councillor. Uh, this is Sarah Robin, Housing Planner. Um, yes, in effect, that, that's correct. I mean, in order to make the project viable, um, we really do need to see uh, the, the market rents, um, so that sort of cross-subsidization, cross so the below market rents um, and, the, and the market rents working together to make the project um, financially viable. Okay, thank you. And then um, my other question uh, stems from, uh, there was a number of speakers who spoke to the issue of families and appropriateness of uh, these units for families. Um, so re regardless of them being one or two or three bedroom, uh, there's concerns around square footage and appropriateness and livability. I'm curious, I looked at your summary of public feedback up to public hearing, which is included in the package. When you get that public feedback, are you able to disaggregate? Um, do you individuals identify as being members of families of whether they have young children or not? Do, do you have any of that information? Because when I didn't sorry, sorry, Council, Council Dominato, your, your um, audio is breaking up. I didn't hear a lot of people call in sorry. who commented. Okay. Curious. Councillor Dominato, your audio is breaking up.
Clerk, so I'm just going to stop Councillor Dominato's uh, clock at four minutes and move on to Councillor Fry. Councillor Fry? Is that better? Can you hear me? Uh, uh, Councillor Dominato, we're just... We can hear you now. Okay, can I continue? Yeah, you just have a minute left. Okay, so really quickly, do we, when we get that summary of feedback, do we disaggregate um, uh, people who identify as being members of a family or having young children? Thanks for the question, Councillor Dominato. The, the response form does not have that as a specific ask. Uh, some will respond saying that they are part of a family, but there's no way of us knowing for each respondent. Okay, thank you. I may move for a second round of questions. Thank you. Okay, sorry. Okay, we have a, a, a motion for a second round of questions. Second. Seconded by Councillor uh, Dejanova. All in favor say yay. Yes. Yay. Any opposed? Okay, thanks so much, Councillor Fry. Sure. Uh, thank you. And um, just, just off the top, just following up on, on Councillor Dominato's question just now um, regarding the subsidy of the, the uh, subsidized units being funded by the market rents. I was of the impression the MERP saw them subsidized by the DCL waiver. Can I get some clarification on that? Thanks, Councillor Fry. I will pass that over to our colleagues in housing. Hi, thanks. I'll, I'll, I'll take that. Um, yeah, uh, Dan Garrison from Housing Policy and Regulation. Uh, the, there are uh, a numerous um, or several incentives that the city uh, provides under our secured rental policies for uh, to secure rents and then to uh, try to secure and subsidize below market rentals. So there, um, those include things like parking relaxations, development cost levy waivers, and additional heightened density. Uh, so it's the combination of those things that are creating the financial viability in a below market rental project, particularly one where the below market rents are as deeply discounted as this one. So it's both the additional heightened density that's creating the capacity for the rental uh, market rental, uh, as well as other incentives like DCL waivers, the combination of those things. So what, what do we imagine the percentage of the DCL waiver kind of contributes to the subsidized portion? Uh, it's, it's a good question. I, I don't know the, the off the top or the, the sort of the structure of the pro forma enough. I mean, there, the, the pro forma for a project like this would be quite complicated in some ways. It's more than just the market rents in a project like this that are creating the viability for the below market rental. It's the, the project in its entirety, right, along with the commercial space and, and, and it creates a financially viable project. Okay. okay. No, I appreciate that. Thanks, Dan. <clears throat> um, on the subject of parking, um, do we feel that uh, almost 300 units of parking in a transit-oriented development is, is still appropriate in this day and age, or are we moving away from that amount of parking? Thanks for your question, Councillor Fry. Um, my colleague in development planning would answer. Yes, thank you, Councillor Fry. It's Kevin Spence from uh, Development Planning, Senior Development Planner. Um, I can't speak for my colleagues in engineering, um, but I will say that we, in this location, under current zoning, approved a project that met the parking bylaw, and there are no parking maximums uh, for the area. So the applicant intended to, or, or applied through the development permit, to go for a large amount of parking, and we had no mechanism to uh, suppress the amount of parking that they delivered. Now, it was a it was a question. Obviously, we had the same question, you know, with the accessibility to transit and everything. But it was what the applicant pursued and was uh, permissible under the bylaw. Yep, appreciate that. Uh, that's work for us to contemplate for a later date, I suppose. Um, we, we've heard the urgent impetus uh, with the Broadway subway planning as, as driving this decision outside of the Broadway plan. Why is it we're not hearing about this urgency with any of the other stations in the Broadway plan, like Oak VGH or Mount Pleasant or Arbutus? Thanks for the question, Councillor Fry. I'll pass you over to my colleague in transit integration. Hi there, um, Michelle Lee, Development Planner, Transit Integration and Projects. Um, so overbuild of the station sites is a priority for the city and at other station sites, we have made provision for future overbuild. So um, when this project went to, or sorry, when the Broadway subway project went to the urban design panel, we outlined a number of strategies uh, to facilitate overbuild. So for example, we have allowed 
uh, provision for future uh, structure at uh, Mount Pleasant Station. Um, Oak VGH um, also um, looking at potential for overbuild there as well. Um, the Broadway, Broadway City Hall Station um, also has an overbuild concept. Um, so some of the some of the stations have more potential, some have less, but it is something that we are um, studying and focusing on. So, so we're, we're building in the infrastructure now, or are you talking, when you say overbuild, are you talking like a cantilevered overbuild, or are we talking a fully integrated? Yeah, so uh, where overbuild comes um, later and isn't sort of planned in tandem with the development, as we have done at South Granville uh, Station. Uh, cantilever is the likely scenario, um, but at certain stations there is the possibility to drop structure on the other side of sort of the station facade to allow for overbuild of the station entrance. Okay, thank you so much. Councillor Kirby Young, up to five minutes. Yeah, thank you. A lot of my questions have been asked, which is a benefit to going later, but I'll just zero in on a couple of points. And I want to focus back on this notion of timing and the overbuild now. And in response to, I think, the um, answer from the director of planning that was random. And then I'm hearing, for example, from just from the staff member that there are overbuild provisions for the other stations that can be accommodated. I'm just really not understanding how we can end up a month apart and we cannot better synthesize those processes in order to retain some integrity in our consultation around the Broadway plan. Like what, what do we know, what have we learned from how we could avoid a situation like this where we could actually synthesize it and we don't have this very, I think, valid reaction to the fact that these things are a month apart and the urgency argument is very difficult to comprehend. Thanks for your uh, question, Councillor Kirby Young. I'll pass it over to my colleague in Broadway planning. Yeah, thanks, Councillor, for the question, John Grottenberg, Broadway plan team. So the issue around timing with with this rezoning at South Granville Station is there is full integration with the transit station and the development. At the other stations where my colleague mentioned the opportunity for cantilever development, that development would happen following uh, construction of the Broadway subway stations. So it, it's a bit of a different process in how that um, overbuild would occur. That, that's an interesting piece. So can we zero in on that? Can you describe or define full integration? Because obviously there's sort of separate entrances. Are you literally going down an elevator into the transit station? Is it the, simply the fact that the building is contiguous and it's not cantilevered? Can you explain that a bit further? Yeah, I can provide some additional insight into that. So um, where when we talk about full integration, we are looking at a building and, and station that has been designed as one building. So um, it's fully contiguous, as you mentioned. There are no gaps between the station and the development structure above, and we're able to better coordinate the overall urban design uh, response. Whereas when development comes later, um, there are some uh, compromises that need to be made, and the building um, sort of has to respond to the station below. So it's a different, a different approach entirely. What? So what is, an, what is an example of a compromise that might have to be made? Um, well, one thing would be a gap between the structure of the development above and the station roof. Um, so in the case of South Granville, we were able to fully integrate that as one building, one design. Um, but where it come, when it comes later, uh, due to a number of factors, uh, there is a bit of a discontinuous design. So that could also be subjective, could it not? Because gaps sometimes can provide light and air and break up form, depending. I think we feel it's a better approach when we are able to um, design it as one comprehensive sort of development. Okay, I'm going to use, thank you for that. I'm going to use my extra time. I just want to get clarification as well on the questions that 
Councillor Fry touched on earlier with respect to the, the DCL, and I'm looking at the slide presentation that had the summary of public benefits of about 5.2 million, 2 million in the citywide DCL. And I'm just looking for clarity here that this relates specifically to the residential component or um, versus the overall development, including the five stories. Can, can, we get, can we get clarity around that? Sure, thanks for the question, Councillor Cabriang. Um, you're correct. The DCL waiver is applied on the residential portion of the project. The commercial portion of the project will still pay uh, a DCL of about just over two million dollars as well. So the, the, so the five point two million does that all relate? Does that two point seven seven million the citywide DCL? Does that all relate to the commercial project component? The citywide DCL relates to the commercial portion of the project. The utilities DCL relates to the full project. There is no waiver for the utilities DCL. And then there's a public art contribution. Okay. So without the, if the residential tower was not completed, just so that people are clear in the value of the public benefits, it would be a bit less than the 5.2 because part of the utilities and part of the public art would not be applicable. Uh, the public art contribution would still be applicable um, on the commercial space. But at a different rate. But the, Thanks, correct? It would be. Five. There is a second round, so I'm just going to move on to uh, Councillor Bly now. Thank you. Councillor Bly. Thank you. Thank you very much. I uh, also have had many of my questions answered, but I just wanted to zero in on the timing of this application and the adoption of the Broadway planning program and the, um, the interim rezoning policies. Can you just clarify if this application, what the timeline was from adopting the Broadway planning program entirely and this application coming forward in terms of submission? Thanks for the question, Councillor Bly. I will pass it over to my colleague in Broadway on the Broadway planning team, John Grottenberg, to answer your question. Yeah, thanks for the question, John Grottenberg, on the Broadway plan team. So uh, the Broadway planning program launched in March of 2019, um, following direction from a terms of reference adopted in June of 2018. In June of 2018, the interim rezoning policy was also put in place by Council. Uh, and so the Broadway planning program has been underway for the past three years. Uh, COVID did have a significant impact on our just, timeline. Just to clarify, because I have limited time, I'm just looking for the when we received this application. Maybe I'll, I'll ask my rezoning colleague okay. to answer Thank that you. one. Thank Sorry you. Hi there. Yes, we, we received this rezoning application in August of 2021. Okay. Okay. So my question then is in the Broadway planning program and... Um, in IRP and the terms of reference, it, it does talk about rezonings, uh, not preempting or diverting the planning program, and that there would be exceptions that included uh, non uh, nonprofit institutional, cultural, recreational, non market, heritage retention, and maybe some minor housekeeping amendments. And that would be all that would be considered for rezoning um, to basically maintain the integrity of the Broadway planning program. I'm reading right out of the document here. So I'm just wondering um, where was it, was it a miss that, that, that it wasn't included, that we would need to consider full integration over a SkyTrain station potentially as part of this process? Like how do we as council, we're supposed to say, does this fit with the existing policies we have in place? And yet there seems to be um, uh, sort of a misalignment, significant misalignment with what we've been told by staff in 2018, 2019 with this application. So I'm wondering what's what's the missing piece here? Thanks, Councillor, for the question, John Grottenberg, Broadway Plan Team. So um, originally when the Broadway Planning Program was underway, um, we were on track to complete the plan for Council's consideration by late 2020 or early 2021. So the planning program and the work on the subway was in sync. Uh, as I mentioned before, COVID ha had a significant impact on our timelines, particularly around engagement. So the Broadway plan uh, process was, was delayed. Recognizing those delays uh, and, and the considerations around sta station integration at this site, staff recommended through an issues report uh, under policy three of the IRP that this rezoning be considered a, as an exceptional circumstance. Okay. Uh Thanks. Oh, I'm going to come back to that. I'm just keeping an eye on my time. I just wanted to follow up as well regarding the views. So we heard from a lot of speakers, um, the view call and the view corridor of this particular um, uh, site. But, and so in this a similar document, it talks about um, 
there is actually a, lot, a, a, a statement here that uh, m while many of the protected public views would be negatively impacted or completely eliminated through minimal introduction of new development, one of the exceptions is the Queen Elizabeth View Corridor, so it goes on to talk about that, which we're not considering today. Um, but I, I also would like to hear staff's feedback on that because, you know, um, that is a, I, I would say that the, the integration makes sense, the, um, the, the rental, uh, the density around rental does make sense in terms of need, but we have this uh, sort of staff directed statement here that says we have to be very, very careful negatively impacted or completely eliminated through minimal introduction of new development. Thank you for the question. Kevin Spans, New Development Planner. Um, uh, are you referring specifically to the report of 1477 referring no, to? No, I'm referring to the Broadway Planning Program and the guidance around the IRP. Sure, sure. so I'll, 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 I'll direct to uh, John Grottenberg in a moment, but I'll answer the question regarding views at this site. There is only one protected public view related to the site, and that's 20, which actually starts at the intersection uh, of Broadway and Granville. So the site actually doesn't fall under, under any other protected public views, uh, which is one of the reasons why we, um, were, uh, we looked at additional height here. It doesn't have any impact to uh, any protected public views, including Queen Elizabeth. Regarding uh, the uh, information in the draft plan, I'll defer to John Grottenberg. Actually, we are at the five minutes, and there is a second round, so I will move to Councillor Swanson, uh, who is on the first round of questions, and then Councillor Hardwick, I'll put you up next, because you're on the uh, first round as well. Okay, thank you. Um, I wonder if uh, some someone from staff could explain uh, for the public uh, what a development cost ex expectation is and how it works on this project. Does it include DCLs and CACs and or both or something else? Uh, thanks for the question, Councillor Swanson. I'll hand it over to my colleagues in real estate to answer your question. This is Mario Lee with Real Estate. The, the prior purpose of the DCE is to limit land purchase speculation uh, during the plan development and to preserve room for developers uh, to make a public benefit contribution, uh, while the primary purpose of the CAC is to help address uh, the site-specific growth impacts uh, of the rezoning. So negotiated CACs are specific to the development and calculated after the rezoning application, so they would be different than what the DC uh, is estimated at to be right now. So, does this project pay a development cost expectation, and if so, how much? This project does not pay a DCE. And why would that be? I thought it applied to everything in the Broadway corridor. This project uh, was done through a negotiated uh, CAC, um, and through our review, the public benefit of uh, the below market rentals is what is being contributed here uh, and not the DCE. So the, in your estimation, the value of the MERP units is equal to what a DCE would be? No, no, again, a DCE is, is separate to a CAC. A DCE is really, um, uh, uh, it's, it's essentially 100% of the land lift that was estimated to, um, you know, help curb land speculation uh, during a planning uh, stage or plan development stage. Uh, and the CDC is, is when it's site specific and we have gone through the review. So I'd say that, you know, when we do a CAC review on this specific site, we are looking at the proposal uh, that is delivering, you know, 20% of the area as below market rental units. And that is factored into the valuation um, for, for this project. So what's the point of having a DCE then? Again, I'd say the, the main purpose of the DCE is to limit land purchase speculation uh, during the plan development uh, stage. Uh, really, it's, it's to preserve room for developers to make public benefit contributions. Um, you know, it's, it's to help curb land speculation with, if the market participants are looking to potentially 
develop uh, or buy sites to develop a very high tower of strata condominiums. Uh, in this so, case, this is a rental project uh, proposal. So in this case, how, how would having a DCE help prevent land speculation or is it even relevant? A DCE could help uh, curb land speculation as the market participants who are looking to buy land would uh, expect to pay a DCE um, if they were looking to purchase based on a higher use of uh, a condo uh, strata residential development. So, so it, a DCE it, it only, place, only applies if it's strata? The DCE was technically uh, established based on a uh, a study for strata development, correct? Okay, thank you. So, Councillor Herbeck. Thanks. Um, I've been looking at other stations, uh, for example, in New Westminster, where high rises were built above the station and the mall, and it's all integrated. Uh, it was built 25 years after the opening of the original station. So how do you reconcile, um, you know, the fact that we have precedents throughout the region of building high-rise development on top of stations uh, over time? So I guess the question is why the rush given the reality? Thanks for your question, Councillor Hardwick. Uh, my colleague in, uh, in transit integration can answer your question. Hi, Michelle Lee Hunt, uh, Development Planner, Transit Integration Projects. Um, so this project, uh, if approved, would represent one of the few, if only hyper-proximate integration uh, development projects. So this is one of the only projects where the station would be directly integrated into the building and designed and conceptualized as one building. So some of the other... Uh, High rises uh, in other areas, while they are close to the SkyTrain station, they don't achieve this level of integration. So? <clears throat> um, well, I think it, it's a bit of a different approach um, because the construction of the um, development above the station is happening directly above the station. And once the station opens, there'll be hundreds, if not thousands of people circulating in the area outside of the station on opening day. And so uh, having construction completed in advance of that or concurrent with the completion of the station really minimizes the impact on circulation and pedestrian and passenger safety. I guess the question is then uh, whose priorities and benefits come as a result of that? But the, I think the point that I'm trying to make and why I would like you to acknowledge is that we do have a choice um, on this and, and uh, you've stated the priorities, but it's not essential. I think the priority is public safety and uh, I think council decided that that was um, a priority. Are you saying that there wasn't public safety at any of the other locations that hey, we, there have you been high rises uh, built over? Um, uh, uh, Councillor Harvick is not interrogation, this is fact seeking, so. Okay, but I'm afraid when um, the information is limited or the response is limited, there is an opportunity for continued questioning. And yeah, but, this but is questions a like, Questions like so are interrogative. Well, so is so, so this being the case, then what? It's a series of if then statements in a question, Mayor. And uh, yeah. I was not satisfied with the answer and I was looking for further elaboration. But I will leave now, it there the because I think the point is Mayor. It's a more polite way of putting it. So maybe we could go down that track. All right. Well, uh, polite would also be getting a full answer, but I will leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. We're moving on to our second round of questions. Uh, Councillor Dominato. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I'll rattle these off really quick. Can uh, staff just remind me of the anticipated opening date of uh, the Granville Broadway station? Thanks for the question. It, anticipated date is toward the end of 2025. Um, and can you, from someone from transportation engineering, tell me um, when we anticipate having Granville Street upgrades complete? I know there's seismic work underway, but also the uh, broader complete streets work around the sidewalks and uh, cycling routes. 
Thanks for the question. Um, Michelle, are you able to answer that question? We may need to get back to you with an answer on that shortly. Oh, that's fine. If I can get it before we make a decision, that would be great. OK, um, I'll move to my other question. Is the UDP's feedback included opening up and significantly increasing the public realm and to increase weather protection? I know the applicant applicant can't respond, but could staff comment on whether um, uh, that feedback is being incorporated. Um, just given how busy uh, an intersection this is, I, I thought that that was an important point raised by UDP. Yes, thanks for the question. I'll pass it to my colleague, uh, Kevin Spans, to answer. My apologies, Councillor Dominato. Um, we, were, we were trying to get an answer for your question from engineering. Um, would you mind repeating the question, please? Uh, simply, um, UDP's feedback was opening up and significantly increasing the public realm and increasing weather protection. I'm wondering if that is going to be uh, fulfilled by yeah, the applicant. Absolutely. The, and those are priorities that we had both at the DB stage uh, and at the rezoning stage from an urban design perspective. So they're reflected in the uh, uh, conditions of approval, uh, one of which is... Uh, looking for significant changes to the massing and design of the building over the central plaza, over the entrance, to ensure that that's a, uh, a well-performing open public realm that contributes to the performance of the public realm. And weather protection, protection continuous weather protection is, is something that we anticipate for any development at this scale, and so it is also conditioned. Okay, thank you. Um, there was also... Um, I know there's a public art, I believe there's a public art contribution as part of this proposal, but I seem to recall a speaker spoke about the value of, of integrated art into buildings. So if this were approved, is there an opportunity for that uh, as opposed to a standalone art piece, but um, art by design being integrated into the building facade as we've seen with a number of other uh, buildings in the city? Thanks for your question, Councillor. So um, as part of this project, since they do have a public art contribution, they will have to prepare a public art master plan that will go to the public art committee. Um, that plan will present opportunities to your advisory committee on what might be the best approach for this project. So that is something that will be inherent in the project and they will have to seek um, advice from your public art committee. Okay, thank you. And I want to circle back to a question that was posed by my colleagues about the rationale for um, the integration. And um, it was referenced to public safety. So what I'm hearing, and I just want to make sure I've heard this correctly, is that um, by if the station's built out and then the development were to come later, um, there's public safety concerns of having active station hub and intersection and building above. And presumably you'd have to shut down some part of the block to do, accommodate that with um, construction. I'm just curious because uh, can you just walk me through that? Yes, thanks for the question. Uh, my colleague Michelle uh, might be able to address your question. Uh, uh, Michelle Lee Hunt, Development Planner, Transit Integration and Projects. Um, yeah, so, as a continuation of uh, our previous answer, this project um, involves construction directly above a transit station. So Unlike some of our other transit stations where uh, tower forms are located two to 300 meters away from the transit station, uh, this would mean development is occurring directly above. And so in, <clears throat> excuse me, in allowing the construction to proceed and be complete by the time the station is opening, we really minimize the impacts on circulation outside of the station. So if you think of a typical construction site that has Boarding and um, you know, sort of barriers to protect uh, the public while they um, are using the sidewalk. If we can have construction complete, we don't need to have sort of that infrastructure there, and therefore there would be more sort of open space um, for the public to circulate. Okay, great. And uh, I think that's my time. And I'll look forward to the answer about the grid bridge. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kirby Young. Second round. So Kirby Young, I'll put you at the end of the list. Okay, thanks. Uh, Councillor Weep. 
Um, yeah, I wonder if I can get an answer to the question about the performa and the 105 million. Um, kind of a follow up to Councillor Swanson's conversation about if the DCE is about 105 million, what is the value that we're putting on the public benefit for rental in this project? Um, and what is the transparency on the process with Proforma recognizing we were able to get 22% on the Birch project? So how do we determine that we get getting the valuation and what is the price or value we put on that public benefit contribution? Thanks for your question, Councillor Weeb. Uh, my colleague Mario Lee in real estate will answer your question. This is Mario Lee with real estate. I'll, I'll try to uh, touch on uh, all parts of that that question, uh, Councillor. Um, at the time of application, we, we value the merits of what has been proposed and, and cannot assume a different use or a different proposal that has not been vetted or reviewed by staff. Uh, it would be difficult to assess a hypothetical CAC for a development that may not be supported or is inconsistent with the current policy. Uh, really, in order to assess a CAC for a hypothetical development, we would need to go through a proper CAC review. Uh, rezoning submission needs to be vetted and accepted by staff with the bill form approved. Uh, to do a pro forma analysis to determine the land lift, uh, we would need project specifications, area, suite mix, uh, construction material, quality of finish and appliances, etc. cetera. Uh, we would also have to engage in a discussions with, with the applicant over some of the assumptions regards to the valuation and market data before concluding the CAC. Uh, it would not be as simple as flipping over a current bill form to a different use or assuming a different bill form entirely. So without concluding a negotiated CAC for a hypothetical strata scenario, it is difficult to calculate or compare the value to the current rezoning pr proposal in front of you today. Right, as for right. the topic of, yeah. Merit, but do we not have a development cost expectation? So we talked earlier about we put this in place so that we can make sure that the developers don't overpay for a property so that they have an ability for public benefit contribution. So we already have an amount. We don't have to do a, a hypothetical amount. We have an amount. Of 105 million dollars so from there it should allow the developer to be able to deliver as much public benefit contributions as possible we saw in other projects they raised it 22 percent you think in this project we'd go a bit higher so can you talk about we have an expectation amount the developer knows about and we have to give them the ability for public benefit contribution so can you talk a little bit about what value we have put on that contribution Sure. As for the as for the topic of DCEs, uh, using DCEs uh, as a proxy for a potential CAC uh, may lead to inaccurate results. They are both developed in different ways and represent different assumptions. Uh, you know, therefore, a site specific CAC will likely differ. Uh, you know, differ from the DCE. A DCE actually represents 100% of the land lift of a strata strata development. And, and at this juncture, we're not sure what that would like. What I guess built form that what would be supported for a strata development. So it, it's really hard to okay. determine what that would be. Okay, so to be clear, so what is the value? If 100% land lift is 105 million, what is the public benefit contribution of the rental that we valued it at? 50 million, 20, like do we have a number that we've determined that this value for uh, the rental is valued as a public? contribution so the public understand what they're getting out of this yeah uh, i'd say without doing a proper cac review for the specific site it would be difficult to pinpoint an exact cac uh for, for this for a hypothetical strata development no no uh, I'm, what, I'm saying for this project what is the public benefit value we put on the rental so in the pro forma right if we said there's no rental or if it's all rental and no merp there is obviously a public benefit to having rental what is the value that we've contributed to that to, to make sure that the performa met at 20% and not a higher number. So your, your, sorry, your question would be, what is the delta between a market rental and non-market rental for this project? Yeah, and what, so what is the value we're putting on the non-market rental? So uh, if, if we were to make broad assumptions and, and just to use the average rents across the building, uh, you know, mm -hmm. we can estimate the total net, net difference in CACs would be you know, somewhere between nine to 12 million. Now, I want to condition that figure. One is that we're assuming this is on average, meaning that the numbers can be higher or lower depending on the delta between the market rents and the MER rents. So, so the delta between the two can vary depending on the unit type, 
location in the building, views, et cetera. Uh, this figure can yeah. also fluctuate. I, have, I guess depending. I don't have time. So 9 to 12 million. I'm just trying to re recognize how some buildings can get 22%, and this one we could only get 20. And how do we ensure there's transparency in that process? Sure. You want me to answer that question? Well, actually, we're just at the five minutes, so I, I am going to move to uh, Councillor Kirby Young. Councillor Kirby Young? Maybe on mute, Councillor Kirby Young? Um, yeah, thanks, Mayor. I'm going to follow up on Councillor Weeb's question. I'm really wanting to understand that. And, and so I just want to frame it a different way for clarity. The 9 to 12 million that you cited, can you just go on to explain a little bit? Because I think that was um, cut off because Councillor Weeb was running out of ta time. In terms of, is that a simple equivalency or no, that if this building was strata, for example, and it was not rental, that that is a notional amount that might be payable for a CAC for a building of this number of units height and density. Um, so I'd say I'd say that the the nine to twelve million uh, there will be some caveats attached to that. I don't think it's as it's as simple calculation. Um, you know, the the delta between the two in terms of the CAC can vary depending on the unit type uh, as mentioned. Right, if there's a delta in the market rents versus the below market rents. The wider that gap, the higher that CAC or foregone CAC uh, would would end up at. Um, also, that figure is a net difference in CAC, meaning where one would ultimately land after negotiation may be different, especially if the starting CAC is actually negative. Um, also, if we're using this figure to compare to other rental projects, we should make sure that they're very similar uh, project economics. Um, and, and I want to emphasize that this is for information purposes on, on a hypothetical scenario only, and, and that this okay. figure is not exactly a real alternative at this moment. Okay, um, but it's an know. illustrative example. And I ask for um, fair to say, because I asked the question in the sense that some of the tension that we are hearing, and we heard from a lot of the speakers keeping on this topic um, and the specific rezoning, was concern with the density coming in the neighborhood in an amenity deficient neighborhood that doesn't have parks, schools, lacking childcare, et cetera. Um, and so is it fair to say that really we are choosing rental itself as the amenity over a different type of housing form that might not be affordable for people, but could yield more public benefits? Like that is really the trade off here, right? Because you could get those CACs and contribute them towards buying land for park space or contributing towards a community center or a senior center, which is desperately needed in the neighborhood. So is that is that the trade off here is we're getting in simple terms, we're getting a different type of housing versus cash that we could invest in amenities. So, in Councilwoman, terms, that, that, um, so Mario, let me let me jump in and take a shot at this. Thanks, uh, Councilwoman. I think you've hit the nail right on the head. Um, that is the that is the compromise of the Broadway plan and of this site. Um, and it and you're right. It's not a true equivalency because the staff recommendation for form of development would never would would not, neither the policy nor the staff would support 39, uh, 39 stories of strata at this location. Uh, we would probably be in the neighborhood of about 25 if we were looking at strata. But the Broadway plan in this site in particular encourages rental, below market rental, and rental protections. And that's, and that's the, that's the trade-off, and that's some of the information that we'll be bringing you um, next month on the Broadway plan. Okay. Um, speaking of, I can follow up on that with Teresa, with our director of planning. Um, one of the questions that we heard um, was from neighbors that are concerned with the existing affordable rental um, immediately adjacent in the Fairview area. Um, is there, what is the connection between possible approval of this building and protections for that existing affordable rental that is close by? Well, I think the connections you'll find in the policies that we do bring forward for the Broadway plan, in fact, we've just been reviewing them and going over them uh, in depth in the last couple of weeks. So there are a number of things that limit um, the, uh, the, the rate of change, if you will, pace of change, if you will, in the Broadway plan, including tower separations, block lengths, setbacks, uh, a number of things, uh, plus the rental protections. There are significant rental protections in the Broadway plan because we know that this is some of the most affordable and some of the most desirable rental in the entire city. So Just those are baked in. But adding this correct. additional supply does help. 
I, I understand that and I appreciate it, but just because I have a few seconds, can you describe what a significant rental protection is for somebody that's living on West 10th, for example, an affordable rental and has sees three buildings for sale on their block? What's their protection? Yes, Dan, to help me with that one. 15 seconds. Yeah, thanks, Councillor. Uh, just, just quickly, the rental protections that we're proposing through the Broadway plan uh, include uh, limiting the amount of height and density that's achievable there to ensure that we aren't incentivizing redevelopment. We're providing perhaps a pathway for redevelopment when it's time, but but ensuring we're not incentivizing it. Uh, we're also, in addition to the current uh, city's current tenant relocation and protection policies, adding two fundamental uh, factors. One is the requirement for if renters are out of a building for any period of time, the developer would have to top up their rent so that it's no more than they were currently paying. Uh, secondly, they would have the right of first refusal uh, uh, to return to any building in, in a redevelopment scenario uh, at a rent that's not only at their current rent, but in most cases a significant discount to their current rent, uh, recognizing that many renter households in the Broadway corridor are actually paying uh, too much of their income uh, on rent today. So uh, pretty significant enhancements being proposed in the Broadway plan uh, compared to our current um, tenant relocation and protection policies. Thanks so much. We're at time. Councillor Boyle. Um, thanks. I I'm prepared to move the staff recommendations with the yellow memo attached. Okay, thanks so much. Do we have a seconder? Second, Dominato. Thank you. We're on the main queue now for debate. Councilor Boyle, do you, uh, as mover, do you want to go ahead with uh, up to five minutes for? I'm um, sure. I'd, I'd be happy to. Uh, I'll be speaking in support, and I want to speak to, in particular, a couple points that came up during the discussion. The first is that there was some discussion about how the building fits with our current action on the climate emergency. I'm glad to see this be a discussion um, all of the time. And uh, I think it's important to remember that carbon emissions from transportation make up 40% of emissions in Vancouver. And so building mixed income rental homes so close to public transit and so close to employment centers <laughs> in a complete and walkable community is an important piece of our climate action plan and something we should do in every neighborhood. There was also some discussion about the impact uh, of living in tall buildings on children's mental health, and I've been thinking a lot about that since it was raised in the public hearing. And the thing that keeps uh, coming up for me is the countless stories that I hear of families living in insecure rental housing in someone's basement or a secondary rental, worried about having to relocate and move their kids to other schools. Uh, or having their kids' friends get priced out of the city. That's certainly um, been what we are experiencing, my kids and I, and those are the stories that I see and hear the most often. And so it makes me uh, confident that these new rental homes in South Granville will be good, secure housing for families wanting to stay in the city. And lastly, I want to speak to the built form to reiterate something that I've been saying uh, certainly for the last three and a half years, which is we often hear opposition to tall buildings like this one in favor of the type of density that great cities like Paris have, four to six story buildings everywhere. And, uh, and I would also love to see that, to see low and mid rise buildings throughout residential neighborhoods across the city. I'm glad to see the Vancouver plan moving in that direction. Um, however, as we've seen, when broad missing middle zoning is proposed, even something as modest as the secure rental housing on and just off arterials, there's also vocal opposition to that. Um, we've also heard opposition to this building in favor of more non-market and co-op housing, which again, I also want more of. But when I uh, oppose, uh, proposed we allow more density for non-market and co-op housing, that was voted down. So. The choice before us is a mixed income rental building with no displacement of any existing renters right above a future SkyTrain station. So more residents, more seniors, more families can have uh, stable and secure housing in a beautiful walkable neighborhood. And I will be supporting it. Thank you, Councillor Boyle. Councillor Hardwick, up to five. Yes, thank you. I have submitted an amendment to the clerk. Thank you. Just Putting it up on screen here. There we go. So that's up on screen. Do you want to speak to it? I do. Um, so uh, we've heard repeatedly the, the, the phrase cart before the horse uh, from our extended number of evenings in this public hearing. And we've heard commentary about that here this morning as well. 
the Broadway plan is imminent, um, but it is not here yet, although I found it interesting, again, the commentary that we've heard here from today, including from the Director of Planning. So this postponement that I am uh, putting forward here is that we would, um, we would reconsider th this after the Broadway plan has been considered by council. And in doing so, I think we'll build uh, a, a lot of public trust. The public trust has been seriously eroded through this. Um, I'm concerned that we are pushing through profound changes during a pandemic when we really should be, um, you know, pressing pause and going through this systematically. The larger question is one of, of sequencing here, but also pace of change. And again, I hear this the same uh, narrative over and over again without really considering um, that there is sequencing that needs to be taken into consideration. So in the interest of building public trust or restoring some public trust, I strongly encourage council to uh, get behind uh, uh, postponement until the Broadway plan process is complete. Thank you. We have a seconder for this. We once, twice, Councillor Dejanova has seconded, so we are now on an amendment queue. Anybody like to speak to this? Councillor Dejanova. Thanks. Um, I appreciate the sentiment of the amendment, and while I'm torn, I do appreciate uh, staff's answers to other council members' questions. I took myself off the queue because many of my questions have been answered. Um, I do have some concerns about the process. I understand that it was the timing of this that brought confusion with the public, perhaps, as to why this didn't come after uh, the Broadway planning process was complete. Um, so for that reason, I will support this. However, I want to be clear that I also do support this rezoning. I, I'm just concerned about the process and the timing as to when this came forward. So um, I just, I wanted to add my comments to uh, to the amendment. Thank you. Thanks. Um, City Manager, did you have a comment? Thanks very much, Mayor Stewart. Just a, a clarification, I think it's important to understand, uh, for council to understand the implications of the amendment that's been proposed, uh, and there are two. Um, obviously, this is your decision to make. Um, one is that we believe the intent of the motion would be that staff, uh, sorry, that council would be deferring this for the purpose of considering the Broadway plan uh, and considering this rezoning in the context of the Broadway plan. The public hearing on this matter has closed. Uh, so we believe that council would be obligated to conduct a new public hearing for this rezoning uh, in this case. Secondarily, just to clarify, um, it is not feasible at this point that this rezoning could come back to this council. The public hearing schedule through to the end of July is booked. Um, so we would be looking at um, a minimum delay to the next term. Um, so again, just want to make sure that council is clear on the implications of uh, a deferral if, if that's what council chooses to do. Thanks. Uh, you can. You have the floor. Could I ask a point of information through you? Sure. Yep, sure? You have the floor. Um, just to, to the city manager on the comments that were made, I'm wondering why council couldn't schedule public hearings in September. Um, from what I've read in the Vancouver Charter, our rules of procedure, um, and any provincial uh, regulations, even governing the community charter, there's no reason that council during even a writ period can't be hearing from the public and doing our jobs. We do our jobs up until inauguration, so I'm just wondering why we couldn't have a public hearing after July. City Manager. Uh, Mayor Stewart, thanks, and I defer to the clerk on the procedure bylaw. I'm, I'm not sure, uh, and we, we could check and get back to council if there's any question around whether council is precluded from under the procedure bylaw from conducting a public hearing uh, in September. Certainly, it would not be our advice to do that. Um, again, council's discretion um, should you choose to do that. I think what we've uh, found in the past is um, it's uh, in council's interest and the interest of the process that in, in that pre-election period, immediate pre-election period, that council do focus on the election as opposed to conducting regular business like this. But uh, again, if there's 
clarification on the procedure bylaw impact, I'd defer the clerk. In accordance with the procedure bylaw, uh, section 2-9, in the year of an election, no uh, council meeting or other meetings, including a public hearing, can be held between the last day of nomination period and general voting day, which is August 30th to October 15th. The only way a meeting could be held is if it were a special council meeting. Mr. Desnova? Um, I, I just had a question, if sure. possible. Um, yep. Mayor Stewart, just another point of information is, will we be having no regular council meetings or committee meetings during that time? Because I seem to recall there being many, and I, I see Councillor Carr nodding her head too because we sat here together last term through them. <laughs> The, currently, the procedure bylaw precludes meetings during that period, so council would have to amend the bylaw. Okay, thank you. Councillor Carr, on this uh, motion to defer. Yes, uh, thanks, Mayor. Um, I won't be supporting it, and I won't be supporting it because um, uh, I don't think it's putting the cart before the horse. I think these are two different decisions. This particular um, uh, rezoning application came to us under the interim uh, Broadway plan uh, procedures and so a, a rezoning policy. Um, I believe we need to judge this based on that policy. Um, as staff have already indicated to us that, um, uh, that the Broadway plan is already in draft form. We're going to be considering it very quickly. I realize that um, uh, it wouldn't be a long delay, but it, we are going to be considering it on its own merit. Um, and uh, I think we need to consider this on the merits of the uh, Broadway plan interim rezoning policy. Thank you, Councillor Kirby Young. Uh, one quick point of information, follow up first, if I could, through you to this, the staff, and that was the reference to the procedure bylaw that the clerk read out. Am I correct that that was actually just recently implemented in procedure bylaw changes by this council and is new for this term, but was not the case in previous councils? Ask the clerk. I I'd have to double check, but I believe this change was made in 2019 amendments for right. the current term. So that's why people have experienced that council did meet and do public hearings in September. They did have regular council meetings. It was actually this council that changed that and agreed to that change, correct? I've got a head nod here. That's correct. Okay, thanks. I just want to, thought that might be helpful to clarify. Um, speaking to the amendment, I quite honestly find this situation that we're in to be a deeply troubling and um, appalling one in terms of timing and process with this with respect to the integrity around public confidence and public process. Um, having said that, I don't think that this amendment is going to help the situation um, and make it better. I think that when there is a reason my council is tasked with the responsibilities and when put in these difficult situations, I think it's incumbent upon us at this point to make a decision. And I think if council feels strongly, they um, either way, they should vote for or against the project um, based on their rationale and reasoning and state that for the record. But I don't think that a deferment is actually going to solve um, the challenges that we find ourselves in or the associated issues that we have discussed at length. I think it's actually just going to create um, additional ones and it's going to trigger not only potentially a, public, a new public hearing, but an awful lot of cost and time both on staff side on, on the city side that which use of public resources um, but also on the applicant and that adds to housing so I think at this point I think people just need to step up and make a decision um, accordingly so I won't support the amendment thanks Councillor Herbick yes uh, mayor I have a question through you to the city manager please sure. go ahead city manager um, I submitted this amendment um, two nights of public hearings ago and uh, when amendments are submitted by council, uh, council members, they are reviewed by the clerk and staff. Um, I did receive a note from uh, one of the city clerk department and amended the wording of this, uh, this postponement accordingly. Why am I just hearing now uh, about issues around timing for uh, potential public hearings? Through you, uh, Mayor Stewart. Thanks, Councillor, for the question. Uh, yeah, there there was uh, some initial an initial staff review that was conducted the evening that you presented the uh, amendment or circulated it for review. There was some subsequent discussion with our legal services department after that hearing um, over the last few days, um, and that's the basis for the advice that we conveyed today. So I appreciate well, was, there was again, a lot of time there. 
two ni two nights previously that I have circulated this um, to council. So I just want to point that out. Thank you. Okay, thanks so much. I don't see anybody else on the queue, so I'll call a vote on this amendment. Please vote on your screens, council. And uh, that fails with councillors Kirby Young, Bly, Domino, Boyle, Weeb, Swanson, Fry, Carr, and myself in opposition. Thank you so much, council. We are back on the main queue. Councillor Hardwick, uh, we, um, you have three minutes left on the uh, board debate. Uh, is this for the final debate then? Yeah, it is. Thank you. Okay, well, um, I'll start with trust in the public process and timing and sequencing is no excuse for undermining democracy. Uh, we are pushing through profound changes here that will have a significant impact on the future of our city. And this has occurred during a pandemic. I mean, I have larger problems, not just with this application, but with the Broadway plan and the Vancouver plan. Uh, because our legacy in this city of a full public participation process has been basically obliterated uh, through this last couple of years of the pandemic. But here we are. So poor public consultation, cart before the horse, sequencing wrong with a controversial development that is leapfrogging the, the Broadway plan. And we heard repeatedly from residents that they are extremely concerned and have had inadequate ability to, um, to consult outside our Shape Your City website. Um, and despite having the tools now, uh, the city has not hold a, held a public forum or properly engaged uh, meaningfully. The anti-democratic process has also lent itself to a bait and switch. We uh, we saw a five-story building start, and then all of a sudden, magically, we now have a 39-story building. And it's uh, really been a question throughout about when staff knew or didn't know uh, that this was happening. Councilor Hardwick, I'll, Again, I'll just... Further undermining... Uh, Councilor Hardwick, I'm going to stop you there and just say we're not supposed to uh, impugn the, the motives of, of staff here, so... I, I am not impugning the motives yeah. of staff. I'm saying that there is uh, a certainly question switch, that has uh, been saying, articulated. Saying bait and switch, not knowing when staff knew something, oh. not trusting what they're saying to you is impugning uh, motive here. And I'd, I'd steer you. Well, I am, I am echoing certainly what we have heard from the public on this. There are issues around social issues on the livability and human scale urbanism. Um, and why are we building things that are in excess of pace of change? We've heard discussion about the impact on mental health and well wellness and social isolation from this form of development. We've heard concerns about the environmental con um, impact of this, even though it's, it's interesting to me that we hear people come and speak concerned about the environmental impact and yet we, we discount it when it doesn't align with, uh, with our narrative. And then finally, on the economic side of it, the affordability of this, I think there's something uh, that, to suggest for a minute that this is not going to have an inflationary impact together with the, the, the larger Broadway plan is I think um, just, I mean, I can't imagine a scenario where this would not have inflationary impact. Thank you. BC assessment will come in okay, thank um, you. as you're, soon as this is done and reassess at highest and best use. Thank you. Councillor Carr, up to five, please. Great. Um, let me just start by saying that this um, has not been an anti-democratic process. This has been a democratic process. And the proof in the pudding is how many people engaged, um, wrote to us, um, came to speak to us. And, uh, you know, it, it was long hours. I was away on, on civic business, so had to watch some of the tapes and uh, late at night. Uh, and But it was fascinating um, just in terms of really getting what people are feeling about this. So I counted up in the, I, I found that of the speakers that I, I, I could ascertain yes and no, 44 said no to this project, 40 said yes. Written input, 607 emails, yes, 409 no. Um, that's democracy at work. 
The issues that seemed to me on the no side were that it was ahead of the Vancouver, sorry, ahead of the Broadway plan, um, worried that it would set a precedent for and influence that plan, worried that it would set a precedent for development in the neighborhood, particularly around the older affordable rental buildings and the character of the neighborhood, and overall desire that Vancouver develop at a lower height, not towers. Those are the points I really took away. On the yes side, Rapid transit stations are most appropriate uh, for taller buildings and specifically rental of all locations in the city. It's rapid transit stations that should be the highest. Um, there, um, uh, there is some real affordability. I still say that that, you know, the MERT process where you get at, it's too few, but it's 20% of the units at 30% of household income with Vacancy control is the only real policy that we have in the city that truly attacks the um, issue of, of affordability in the city. People love the grocery store. Granville Island loves a greater number of people nearby. Um, so, uh, so, you know, I, I, I took away both sides um, and landing around the following. This project is consistent with the Broadway plan interim rezoning policy. We voted on that at the council. It comes in completely consistent with that. I don't believe it'll set a precedent for the Broadway plan. Staff just told us today that in fact the Broadway plan is in draft form already. So it's not the cart before the horse. The Broadway plan has been going on on its own. Um, pieces of it already um, signaled within the interim rezoning policy, which this is consistent with. Um, the Broadway plan, I believe, is where the discussion about height ensuring some of the concerns that people expressed to us, like a potential wall of towers, um, retaining the neighborhood character, retaining affordability, that's where we need to address those issues on the more holistic scale. Um, staff said the timing is critical, and I uh, will um, uh, take that as uh, advice to this council. It's critical in terms of the delay um, of this project and the need to gear to the opening in 2025. Climate impact, as all of you can imagine, is one of the key things in my mind all the time. Um, so I asked the applicant at the beginning of this process about whether or not they would um, consider using new products that reduce embodied carbon, low carbon cement, concrete, low carbon steel. Are they willing to investigate these? And they said yes, that they, uh, that they are. Um, and in fact, um, a staff um, responded prior to this and today um, with the, um, the Director of Sustainability, um, Doug Smith, um, telling us that um, this building will have 95% less emissions than other buildings um, in Vancouver of this type. And it will be subject to new measures that are coming in to require reduced car uh, embodied carbon. Um, so, uh, you know, that to me is really important. Other key points that I want to end on, um, we haven't talked about it too much, but the, the urban development, uh, sorry, urban design panel, um, I thought gave some very thoughtful comments and requirements, including significantly increasing the public realm. And this is a key corner in the city of Vancouver. So I think that addressing public realm is incredibly important. You know, some people um, went on at length about not wanting towers throughout the city. That it's, it's, you know, there's not livability, it, it impacts the neighborhood negatively. I live in the West End. We've got the greatest concentration of towers in the downtown core, but the West End has a fair number of them. The livability of the West End is unbelievable. The towers are separated. There's not walls of towers. There came a rule, a council voted to have only two per block. Um, and they're, they, you know, in between, you get older character homes that are 100 years old. You get three-story buildings. You get six-story buildings, eight-story. I mean, it's a real mixture. I love the trees. Everybody loves the leafy green West End. Um, but it's wow. not about towers are not unlivable. People, the people, I, I wouldn't live in them. It's not my choice. But the people who live in them love them. Um, and I think it is about how they're placed and uh, the surrounding development and the varying heights. That's important. Ugh, am I out? Um, yep. Well, anyway, um, I conclude that I will be supporting. Thank you. Councillor Dejanova, up to five. Thanks. I, first of all, really want to thank our staff. Uh, I appreciate the work that 
you've done with the applicant, and I appreciate the work that you're doing in parallel to this. I understand that we're only supposed to be considering this application, so I will, but in hearing many of the comments, you know, from people in support and opposition, I realize that you're doing your job in uh, a very, uh, I would, I would say in, in a process that isn't forgiving and that requires us to sit as a quasi-judicial uh, body. So I, I do want to appreciate that because I do feel sometimes uh, that during public hearing, our staff, uh, perhaps uh, there can be misunderstandings and miscommunications with the public, uh, not the fault of anyone, but our staff, you know, have to sit in silence and listen to that. So I just wanted to acknowledge that and thank our staff for their work on this. Um, overall, in considering this project, and although the postponement did not pass, I'm going to talk about this project. I think that this project is important for our city. I think that when moving forward and looking at other great cities with transit, we have to look at where we're putting our density and its geometry. We can build up or we can build out. So when we think about green space, when we think about climate change and the action that we're taking against it, I think that it's important to do what we can and maximize that space. And what I hear is that although not affordable for everyone, this will be affordable for some middle income families, for the missing middle. And I've been fighting over two terms here. I was looking back at a motion that I put forward uh, for miss missing middle housing uh, back in 2018 with former councillor Hector Bremner uh, and the other many uh, types of housing motions, such as affordable home ownership, um, expediting, you know, uh, processes for rental. And one day I would actually like to see uh, our short, short program. It's called Short Not Chart. It's uh, social housing or rental tenure, not just social housing and rental tenure, apply to all rental tenure. Because I think that it's important that we do what we can to make this housing as affordable as possible. That being said, I've heard that there are families that are struggling, people who might not live in Vancouver but want to live in Vancouver are being pushed out of Vancouver. I've heard from families, I have friends where when I visit their home, they'll show me a pantry that they've made into a bedroom for their child because they'd like to stay in the city and not move out to Port Moody or Coquitlam or now it's Abbotsford and beyond. So I think that it is important that when we consider transit-oriented development, that we are, we are considering for the future here. I appreciate, um, you know, and as other councillors have mentioned, uh, the importance of democracy and listening to speakers. And I do appreciate hearing from speakers, you know, that, that talk about uh, the impact that this will have in their neighbourhood, how, how this uh, is going to be a huge change for them, and it's not a change they see as coming for the better. But I'd ask them, where did their they want their children or grandchildren to live one day. And how are they going to help to make housing more affordable in the city of Vancouver? I didn't hear any solutions coming forward from those speakers. And this is a solution. It might not be the solution. It's not going to fix all affordable housing in the city of Vancouver. But when we look at the great European cities, High density housing is near transit. There's a reason that 100 years ago they were able to build that transit and we are so far behind. And if we don't move forward now, we're never gonna get there, not in 100 years. When I was first elected to park board, I was taught that you plan 100 years out. You look now for 100 years in the future and I think that it's really important that we do this. That being said, to a point that was raised by another councillor, the council didn't approve a process that would take the power away from us to not do our jobs, to hear from people democratically and approve housing and listen to residents. Although I'm approving this and I wanted to listen to people because I believe in the democratic process, it doesn't mean that I'm against housing. I wanna be very clear about that. And I think my voting record proves that. So I will be supporting this. Um, I do appreciate the change that this will bring to the neighborhood and the community. And I want people who came out to speak to know that I did hear them, um, even those in opposition. But as we move forward in our city, we need solutions for affordable housing. And this is one of them. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Fry. up to five. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, I guess just off the top, just pushing back on the notion that somehow democracy wasn't served here, uh, I was just remarking to somebody this morning in the dog park about how 
uh, post-COVID, our ability for folks to phone into public hearing has expanded access significantly, whereas before you would have had to spend all day waiting here in council chambers to say your piece. Uh, it's made it a lot more accessible, and, and indeed, uh, we heard a lot of voices on this particular project, and I think that democracy was well served in that capacity. Uh, that said, I think there's some problems that we could possibly learn from. I think, obviously, there were some issues with the, how the process and how this landed um, from the first referral report and the Broadway plan, and hopefully we can learn a little bit from that. I appreciate these were extraordinary circumstances. Um, I, and I appreciate the clarification around view cones. It wasn't explicitly mentioned uh, in, in, in the package, but certainly we saw citizen journalists who were putting forward renderings, and we've seen a number of these, and I think that we need to sort of anticipate some of these view aspects and put it forward uh, so that we're not having the public swayed by citizen journalists who are putting forward renderings that may or may not be accurate. I'm not an architect, I don't know. Uh, but certainly it, it, it can it can pique people's uh, attention on, on issues around view cones. And I, again, I appreciate that this does not explicitly intrude into the view cone, but I think it's an important kind of takeaway for us to work on. I'm still struggling with six levels of parking for up to 300 cars on what we're calling transit-oriented development. We need to do better. I know that this is meeting the policy, but we need to move our policy. And I thought this was work that we were doing through the climate emergency planning, so I'm, I'm a little frustrated to see that. Um, and I, I was frustrated through the process because we saw, and I appreciate the mayor gave a lot of latitude to speakers to talk about their concerns with the Broadway plan, but the issue at hand is this development, not the Broadway plan, and I think that became an unwelcome distraction um, to, the, to, to the larger conversation about this building. So what I did appreciate um, was the answers from staff. Uh, you've done a really great job in, in, in going through a lot of this. Uh, I, I struggled with some of Teresa's comments about Broadway plan and how that we were going to have to make sacrifices to, to public amenities in order to accommodate rental. I think that's something to take away for Broadway plan. I very much appreciated uh, Dan Garrison's comments, though, about stronger rent and protections that are coming, to, are coming through the Broadway plan. That's got me very excited. But again, this isn't really about Broadway plan, so I want to just focus back on the building. Uh, there's no displacement. Um, I think that the, the UDP response to public realm is, is going to be really fantastic. Um, obviously, integration with transit as opposed to what they're calling an overbuild, I think, is great for this project, and, and it's going to make a huge difference. In talking to folks around, around the, the neighborhood about this, I heard a lot of folks who were really excited about the idea of a grocery store there, and I think that that's one that hasn't really been fully articulated in a lot of the conversation, but for just regular people who live in the area, they're like, yeah, we need a grocery store. Meinhardt's isn't cutting it for us because it's it, it's not fulfilling our needs and we could use a big grocery store. So I think that's a, a big piece. Of course, the rental housing is, 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 is a big part of this and I think that we are delivering. Uh, I'd love to see us deliver more and I'd love to see us deliver more um, specifically on the family style housing, but I think this is, a, is, is still a good project. And Lastly, just on the actual aesthetics of this project, I think it's actually quite a handsome building, and I really do appreciate that we're moving away from that sort of window wall approach and, and, and doing things a little bit differently around the fenestration and, the, and how we have some sort of like more uh, sturdy structural look to it. I, I think it's a, it's a good match to the kind of local vernacular, and I, I look forward to seeing this building's completion, so I will be voting in support. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Weeb, up to five. Um. Yeah, I think this process has taught us a lot and hopefully there's a lot of learnings that we can do moving in the future. Um, one of the big ones is obviously coming out of COVID is how do we reopen the public process and ensure that we are having public open houses and dialogue. Um, I do also agree that there was a lot of great responses and more people have been able to connect throughout this process to councillors. Um, for me, obviously there's also the transparent public benefits. I really want to see us in the future um, put evaluations that people really understand the trade-offs we're doing when we do projects like this, recognizing that we do have a shortage of amenities in this region. Um, and also that the province, right, there's some significant um, contributions here made by the city today on affordable housing. And I know that we had multiple letters from provincial MLAs and there is a need for the province to recognize that this is an area that is short in schools and is red lit when you look at the um, school facility report just done by VSB. It's also an area with park deficient 
um, and that's something that we're seeing in the park van play. And so we will need um, to be working collectively together with other orders of government to make sure that this is a very livable region and that this project fits in within that region. Um, in the public realm, we talked about accessible public washrooms, bike storage, and I'm hoping that these integrated stations um, can be more for the city in the future. And it is surprising to me that we're only doing one of the six um, to be integrated and recognizing that this is a huge opportunity lost on some of the other stations that we could have delivered uh, affordable housing um, and other public amenities. And hopefully we can work better with the city and the province in the future to deliver on future sites to make sure that we are getting the best benefit we possibly can. Um, I also hope in the future that we can learn on how we can um, reduce costs and projects like this to increase the affordability. Um, I think I love the MER program. However, 20%, we saw 22% on others. I felt with this type of density, um, we should be able to deliver more on the affordability and increase that number closer to 25 or 30, um, recognizing the critical need we have for affordable housing in the city of Vancouver. Um, from my bird advisory committee here in Vancouver, we need to make sure that buildings of this height um, on the Pacific Flyway need to be bringing those elements into building design um, because it is integral that we do recognize the land and waters that we do build on and that we integrate all of our buildings with that in mind. Um, so it will be supportive um, and it'll be interesting to see how we continue to have a uh, more thorough discussion with the Broadway plan. Thank you. Councillor Swanson. Yeah, so um, my big thing is affordability, not vague affordability, not rental as opposed to ownership equals affordability, but real affordability for people earning under the median rent or household income of about 50K. So I'm judging this project with that in mind. I'm not against towers per se, but nonprofit developers have told me that six story wood frame is the cheapest to build and therefore could be the most affordable. With this project, we have 20% affordable to people in the 50 to 80K range. Nothing for people below that, nothing for the median senior household of 28K, nothing for people on disability or social assistance or single minimum wage earners or students working part time. According to the housing report that we're getting tomorrow, we have about 86,000 households in housing need in the city, 86,000, and 52,000 of them are in need because they're paying too much for rent. This could provide housing for 40 of them, but what will it do to the hundreds of surrounding renters who are paying below average rent? That's what I'm afraid of. We have in this building 80% of the units, probably in the 2,500 to 4,000 or maybe higher range on the higher floors, meaning you have to have 80K a year at least to rent 80% of the units. So 28% of Vancouver renters have 80K or more. There are more people who make 80K a year who are looking for rentals. I get that. In this case, 80% of the units will be for the 28% of the renters who can afford expensive units. I don't get the argument that richer renters will move out of a cheaper rental into an expensive one, freeing up the cheaper one for someone. This is called filtering. It may work in places where there's vacancy control, but even CMHC knows that when people move out of cheap places here in Vancouver, the rent goes up to what the market will bear and we lose the affordability of that cheaper unit. And there's also the issue of gentrification. The average rent in this area is about 400 less than the rent in newer west side buildings, probably a lot, a lot less, more or less, maybe six or 800 less than in this new building. I was gentrified out of the Fairview Slopes in the early, early 80s, along with hundreds of other low income folks when it was upzoned. Land values, taxes and rent went up. Our homes were demolished and replaced with expensive ones. I watched in horror when the new Woodward's project opened up, providing over 100 units of social housing, but also about 500 units of expensive housing. And within about a year, the rents in the 400 or so SROs surrounding Woodward's went up by hundreds of dollars a month. Broadway and Granville is an area where we have some of the more affordable apartments. Why would we jeopardize them? 
this project is tied in with the Broadway plan. If we don't require airtight affordability measures, the Broadway plan will gentrify. The plan that I've seen calls for rent top up for displaced renters until the new building is built, at which time they could get 20% below market, which will be much higher because of the new expensive rental units. So I'm not convinced and lower income folks will be pushed out like my family was pushed out in the 80s. And it could happen here unless, unless we require affordability as a condition of extra density. The more affordability we require, the lower land prices will be and the more affordability we can get. Real estate folks are already advertising lots along the corridor saying high rises are possible which means land value is going up. The housing minister wants us to approve this. He sent, sent a letter. If I vote against this, I will probably be a bad counselor, I guess. But there's lots of things the housing minister could do to promote more affordability. Raise the safer limits so seniors could afford even the MRP units here. Give us vacancy control to protect the rents in the 25,000 apartments in the corridor in the whole city. Buy lots for non-market and co-op housing in the corridor. Make genuine affordability a condition of cheap provincial financing. Build lots of non-market housing. If the housing minister would do that, I would vote for this. But until then, I'm not going to jeopardize the little bit of affordability that we have. Councillor Damanato. Uh, thanks, Mayor. Um, I'll start by just saying um, thank you to staff for the work um, that has gone into this and for addressing the, the numerous questions that we've had as council. And thank you to the residents um, who both took the time to write us and um, to call in over a number of nights. And uh, I think Councillor Carr um, aptly summed up um, much of the feedback that we had, including the numbers. And so obviously, uh, very engaged um, residents and community and I think that's important as part of this process um, and acknowledging that in all of this um, that uh, there will be um, uh, different perspectives on ultimately um, the outcome of this one way or the other because there are different perspectives on uh, the direction the city should go in what it should look like uh, what built form where things should be um, speaking to this particular uh, proposal um, did clearly hear concerns from the public around the process and timing um, and height and scale and understanding uh, the rationale for com this coming forward uh, as an exceptional circumstance uh, to the interim rezoning policy and and um, to a point that may have been made earlier about making decisions. Ultimately, Council, while not unanimously, did make a decision to hear um, this proposal and um, and, and I appreciated that staff clarified a few points in terms of the timing around this. I, I based on the feedback that staff uh, provided information today, I gather the applicant was waiting for the conclusion of the Broadway plan, uh, which uh, was delayed um, based on the time of the submission of their application. And um, but the Broadway line was going ahead and the station development was going ahead uh, and so um, made the application and then staff, as they noted, uh, prepared an issues report. So just acknowledging that, that um, in an ideal world, uh, perhaps we would not have had COVID. I think all of us would love to have not uh, gone through the last number of years of COVID, but um, there's obviously some impacts around uh, the timing. Um, and certainly some lessons learned, uh, I think, in terms of process. But um, speaking to um, the proposal itself, I want to touch on a couple of themes. One around housing. Uh, we have heard loud and clear over the last number of years that um, the critical need for housing and a diverse uh, diversity of housing. And, and so to the points that have been made by other councillors, it, it's not just about rental, but uh, this is specifically a purpose built rental proposal uh, with below market rental. And I think we need to still recognize that as a city, um, we uh, have a 1.2% vacancy rate. It is the lowest in the country of the major cities. Um, and so this project, well, it is not a silver bullet. It does add a supply uh, to the city and it provides options and choices for people. Uh, and I, and I, I appreciated the comment that Councillor Boyle made at the outset around um, some of the feedback and concerns around families um, and that this may not be a livable environment for children. Um, 
And she echoed exactly what I hear from families about concerns over insecure rentals, um, the, the uh, having to move and relocate, which means then potentially relocating schools, or families who simply um, can't stay in the city because they can't find an option or choice for themselves, um, uh, rental or not. And so they live elsewhere and then they commute in. Um, and there was a speaker last week that spoke to trading space for time. Uh, and in fact, I, I, I do believe that is a consideration of, of many people is that they have consciously made a choice um, to live in the city um, because not only because of employment, um, but they would rather live in the city than spend their days and hours commuting, uh, as my mom did for much of my uh, childhood, an hour and a half each way. Um, and they would rather spend more time with their families. And the city is desirable. Um, I want to speak about this in the context of transit oriented communities. This is a major intersection. I spent many hours at that intersection commuting uh, with to UBC. And um, we are seeing this around the lower mainland with um, the application of uh, uh, the stations is we are seeing um, uh, communities, housing being developed. Um, uh, and I think I asked about this, about other neighborhoods. We're seeing this in Burnaby. We're seeing it in, in Surrey, in Coquitlam, and uh, a focus on transit-oriented communities. And I think the other piece to this is that, and I, while I don't know when our upgrades to Granville Street Bridge will be complete, I think we need to think very far into the future here is that this is going to be even more walkable and accessible as a neighborhood with uh, the station there. People are going to be able to um, not only get off there, but go across the bridge to downtown. It'll be more five. accessible for cycling. And I also want to just address the We're issues. We're just at five. Sorry. Okay. Thanks, Mayor. But uh, in short, I will be supporting the proposal. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Bly, up to five. Thanks very much. Um, and I will um, be brief as I typically am. Um, I just want to acknowledge the, the conversation and, and the uh, comments from my colleagues. So I'm not going to repeat, but very much aligned with um, those comments that fit uh, with this particular application and how it works within the policy. We've heard philosophical discussion about, um, about uh, growth and change, and I get all of that, and maybe that this project is about trade-offs, things like that, but I think at the end of the day, um, after uh, hearing from speakers and, and then hearing staff's responses, and I'm challenging, particularly around the views and around the process with the Broadway planning program and the, um, the IRP, is I'm satisfied with staff's responses our job here today, which is very different than perhaps when we're debating policy or debating motions, is to decide whether or not this fits within the policy. And I know that is the toughest thing for us to have to do, particularly when there is so much public feedback that is not, um, that, that, that is of two minds. So um, for me, when I look at this, this is not in, uh, in um, the sight line of a uh, protected view. We needed to challenge some of the public rhetoric around that. We've got clarification that it does fit within the policy. Uh, I'm satisfied with um, the timing of this application and um, that it came in after um, the other interim uh, rezoning policies. However, um, with the various amendments that came after that, it does fit within the, R uh, the amended IRP. This is rental. This has rental protection. It's below market rental. And I know for sure, and maybe this is slightly philosophical, we don't need 25 stories of strata at this particular site. We just don't. I rented in this community with my kids for 14 years. I know South Granville very well. Th that is not what's needed here. This community is a rental family community. And um, I'm actually quite uh, intrigued by some of the discussion. And I think we ought to keep this top of mind when we go into the Broadway plan discussion, that there are connections potentially between this development and how it could actually support preserving affordable rental that will be contemplated in the Broadway plan. And I think we do need to challenge the Broadway plan to make sure that we're able to uh, maintain to the best of our ability um, the secured rental that's already existing in this community. So I think at the end of the day, um, I'm excited to see the full station integration. Uh, absolutely see that as an opportunity uh, for those who are living and also um, 
we had a discussion just last night around uh, planning and the planner that was there in that discussion said, try something once and show us how it works. And so there's so much potential that's coming with the UBC extension line that we want to see not that this particular height and density, but what are the ways that we can sort of challenge the status quo and do things better? And we see that right now with the commercial and Broadway site that we underdeveloped that station for 35 years. And now we look at it and think that that's the norm, and it just doesn't make any sense in terms of growth or how things move forward. So um, the only thing I will say is I absolutely agree the parking is a mistake. Um, and again, it fits with policy. So the, this is the difficult decision that we have. So I'll leave it there. Um, appreciate all the work from staff and, and the responses. Um, and of course, hearing from the public, it was critical to this process. Thanks. So much. Uh, last speaker on the list is Councilor Kirby Young. Yeah, thanks, Mayor. Um, I, I will perhaps be a bit more direct in my feedback around the process. I'm really quite honestly deeply disturbed and challenged by the timing um, and the impact that it has on public trust and confidence when we concurrently have a planning process underway for a very critical future direction of our city with respect to the Broadway plan. And I'm actually really deeply disappointed um, at the impact that I think that this has had negatively on that process and people's confidence in it. Um, and so I, I just think that we need to do better in terms of lining up how these reports come forward and how they are presented. I remember when council received the issues report and I did not vote to refer this project to public hearing. And when we received the issues report at the time, I asked if this could conceivably be 40 stories and there wasn't an answer or response given at that point. And it is. And I think when, if we are, we understand that that's the direction that we're going and that's what it's going to look like. It's lack of perceived transparency that creates issues with people when we want to engage people positively in the future of how we're going to grow in Vancouver. So I, I want to sort of state that clearly that I'm deeply troubled by it. And given the fact that these decisions are a month apart, I actually don't buy into the safety argument um, and the timing argument that this would have impacted the ability to concurrently deliver this construction in time for 2025. It's now 2022 in April and we're a month apart. So I'm just going to say that straight up. So having said that, let me speak to the merits of the project that we are considering now. And I think that we heard a lot from speakers, not just around this project, but because of its location around where they're coming from and how Vancouver grows um, and in the Broadway plan in general, I heard loud and clear the concerns about affordable rental. Um, I think there's a lot of, and how we protect that moving forward. Um, we heard a lot about um, the need for amenities um, in an area that people love. I also used to live here. I love living here. It's very walkable. It's got nice leafy trees and all of that, but it's not other than the library. There really isn't and a very small senior center. There's really very little in the area. And so I think those are really important things for us to take away because that is honestly going to be one of our biggest challenges is trying to deliver on that tension between desperately needed housing and creating livable and affordable communities at the same time. So having said that, let's uh, zero in on the merits of this specific project. It is 223 new rental homes, which are desperately needed. I think that um, we heard in the presentation that the vacancy rate, while it you know, hovers over 1% or 1.4, it was about 0.4% for bachelors in this area. Um, this project has 434 studios and bachelors. Um, and then when you think about the practicality of it, if somebody's going to try and rent today, a new renter coming in the area looking at an average CMHC rent, $2,000 a month, a one bedroom for that below market unit for the 20% um, or 46 units approximately would pay 1200. That's pretty significant um, difference on a monthly basis. So I think that is a real positive um, for this particular project, the grocery store. And, and you know, you might think that either small details that we're discussing, but I have to tell you, they're super important to livability. Um, I'm sitting here working from home in a neighborhood that's grocery deficient um, and restaurant deficient, and I have nothing and no way to get lunch in the middle of a very a busy 10 hour day and a work meeting because there's no grocery. Um, so I either, you know, you have to travel, you go without, and that's not the type of community. I know that seems a small thing, but it's not the type of community you want to build um, because we actually want to try to have people live close and be able to fulfill their daily needs. 
Um, I think what I want to say most significantly is what really struck me with the speakers is that we are having a conversation about how our neighborhoods change. And I think it's a generational conversation about making space. And we heard from one speaker who said that generationally, um, the younger people and families are being choked out of the city, regardless of whether or not they have education, they have gainful employment. Some of them are professionals, but they are struggling and cannot afford to find housing. And I think that we need to keep families in our city. We need to keep young people in our city. We need to keep talent in our city. And a lot of folks are going to be looking at rental. Um, we did have an interesting discussion in a housing forum last night and about the notion of what defines home. And it's not the same for everybody. Not everybody's going to want to live in um, a taller tower. Not everyone's going to live on a busy intersection, but for a lot of folks, um, they do really appreciate that convenience and the security of um, tenure for your housing, um, whether you're renting or owning, really cannot be understated. So um, I will support the project based on the benefits and its merits, but I deplore um, the process um, and I think the impact of what that has had. Thank you. Thanks very much. That is the five minutes and we're going to move to a vote now on this item. Councillor, there we go. Uh, thanks very much. This has passed with Councillors uh, Hardwick and Swanson in opposition. Works to pull that up so everybody do that. Okay, thank you so much, Council. We are at, thanks everybody who worked so hard on that item. Uh, we are at 11.35. And um, we are going to move to the next item. We have uh, the next item is an official apology to the Italian Canadian community in Vancouver. Uh, and there is a staff presentation of 11 slides that I think we could probably get through before lunch. So if that's okay with council, we'll proceed there. I am going to ask uh, if anybody has a conflict of interest on this item to please uh, recuse themselves at this point. Otherwise, we'll uh, turn it over to the staff uh, for the report. Good morning, Mayor and Council. Mary Claire Zach, Managing Director of Social Policy and Projects. And to all Italian Canadians who are present or listening, uh, bonjour. Um, today, we're here to report back to Mayor and Council on a Council motion from uh, 2021. And just before we get started on that, I want to thank Ray Koulos, Raymond Koulos, who's going to be joining me in this presentation, who's a very well-known historian for the Italian Canadian community, particularly in Vancouver. Mario Michelli from Il Centro, the Canadian um, or the Italian Cultural Centre here in Vancouver, and members of the Italian Heritage uh, Committee. I also want to thank staff, um, Mumbi Mena, who is uh, acting senior planner in social policy and projects, as well as Wilma Clark, our assistant uh, director in social policy for her guidance and support through this. So on the next slide, it just describes the report back where staff were asked to research uh, into a, an official apology from the city of Vancouver for any actions that contributed to the discrimination against Italian Canadians because of their ancestry. We were also asked to identify opportunities for the installation of public art to commemorate the apology and to do this work uh, with the Italian Cultural Centre Il Centro as partners. The recommendations that are included in the report before you um, are, are in total three of them. And one is that council approve the attached draft apology for the injustices and harms to members of the Italian Canadian community that occurred as a result of the city of Vancouver's actions, policies, and public support of measures, including reference to enemy aliens during World War II and that the formal apology be issued during Italian Heritage Month, which will take place in June. Secondly, that Council directs staff to create a plan to use the overview of the historical background that outlines the discrimination and the decision to intern members of the Italian Canadian community, the requirement to report to the RCMP on a regular basis, and the impacts that it had on the com community at large, including women, children, um, during World War II, all of this for public awareness and education. And lastly, that council directs staff to consider and identify opportunities for a public art installation to commemorate the official apology. And that this be in alignment with and following the completion of the citywide commemoration policy. 
The next slide speaks to the related policies and initiatives in the context um, that we're doing this work in. It is part of broader reconciliation efforts across the city where we acknowledge and understand that, that we are on unceded ancestral lands. We remember that Indigenous communities have experienced loss over time. However, they've left a legacy of welcoming all, all uh, newcomers here. It also um, examines our shared humanity and recognizes this and acknowledges the impact of city decisions, um, recognizes the resilience of communities and acknowledges the truth, which is really critical for our, us to move forward in a positive way. Council's motion to issue an, uh, issue an official apology is further demonstration of a commitment to upholding the principles of human rights, justice and reconciliation. This apology was preceded by the federal government's apology in 2021. And the Italian Canadian community is among multiple communities that have historically experienced stigma and discrimination due to their um, identity and their place of origin. And it recognizes that. And since their arrival to Canada, uh, many Italians have been discriminated because of their language, customs and foods uh, that were strange to a host society and stereotyped. But this impact was most evident between 1940 and 1945. So at this point, I'm going to ask Raymond Koulos to um, take us through um, what that was, and um, he'll go over the next five or so slides with you. Welcome, Raymond. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, I, I'd like to uh, offer a little background information about myself and my family to put uh, my involvement in, uh, in this uh, process uh, um, in, uh, in some order. Uh, for example, <clears throat> I was born here in, in Vancouver uh, during the city's uh, Jubilee year, um, uh, 50th anniversary of its incorporation um, as a, a city in 1936. Um, my parents arrived uh, uh, in 1910. My dad from Italy, a child of four years of age, and my mother from the United States. Uh, uh, at, she was only 40 days old when she arrived in Vancouver and spent her entire life living in this fair city. Um, during their lifetime, um, uh, they participated in um, uh, many ways uh, to, uh, to, uh, to the, the enhancement, if you like, uh, of the Italian community's activities by uh, being involved with the Sons of Italy Society. <clears throat> My dad uh, and mother from the years 1926 uh, to 1976 uh, were active. My dad was uh, president of the men's side uh, for over 10 years, and my mother, 22 years as president of the ladies' auxiliary. Uh, so this demonstrates, I hope, uh, that uh, I come by what I understand of the Italian community uh, quite honestly, because we, uh, this subject uh, uh, was uh, at times very dominantly uh, reviewed uh, and uh, discussed. Um, I'd like now, if I may, to, to, to read some pre uh, from pre prepared notes. Um, uh, you, you have my name, of course, Raymond Kulaz, and uh, 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 I have um, uh, served uh, as a um, um, sort of a unofficial uh, spokesperson, um, as a... Uh, an author, have written several books on the Vancouver's Society of Italians, and in particular, uh, one volume on this question of um, uh, injustices that took place uh, uh, during uh, the, the war against um, uh, Italian Canadians, uh, some of which were uh, have been proven to have been um, Un, uh, unsupported by, well, not unsupported, supported by, by, by the experiences of many people, including those who were in, uh, interned 
and others up to 1,800 uh, people of living in Vancouver to report uh, to the RCMP um, on a monthly basis uh, during uh, the war with Italy, um, 1940 to 1943. And I am here uh, today, uh, uh, via this marvelous electronic connection to express my full support of this body's proposal to initiate a formal apology to Vancouver's Italian community. Uh, this has been done, of course, to acknowledge the in injustices perpetrated against a segment of Vancouver's Italian-born citizens during the war. On uh, June the 10th, 1940, uh, Italy declared war on France and Great Britain, and Canada, already at war with Germany, um, retaliated in kind a few hours later by declaring war on Italy. Uh, let there be no mistake in understanding that the majority of Italians living in Vancouver at the time supported Canada's action in declaring war on Italy. Only a minority group, no more than 50, Italian men were members of the Giulio Giordani Club, uh, the local uh, pro-fascist organization. Uh, these Italians were suspected by the RCMP as being uh, pro-Italy and perhaps a danger uh, uh, to Canada. Uh, most had been born in Italy and therefore were classified as enemy aliens. Uh, those who had uh, retained their Italian citizenship status were deemed citizens of a belligerent country. After the initial round roundup rather of uh, suspected members of the fascist organization, uh, 33 were incarcerated at Kananaski, Alberta, uh, later to be transferred uh, to Petiwawa, Ontario's uh, POW camp. The uh, perceived way in which the RCMP conducted the arrests and the force's subsequent failure to inform the wives and other family members of, the, of those det uh, detained are subjects uh, in question. The RCMP's con conduct truly appears to have been seriously flawed. For example, uh, those uh, apprehended were taken from their homes or places of work without a warrant. They were never charged with any offense against Canada then or at any time during their incarceration. In the process, the internees from Vancouver were denying access uh, to private counsel. Family members of those taken uh, into custody were not informed as to why their loved ones had been so summarily, summarily uh, taken from them. And in some, for some inexplic inexplicable reason, it uh, took two weeks before those incarcerated at the old Canadian Immigration Building were permitted to inform their families as to their disposition. This communication, uh, was sent via unsealed postcards. There was never personal voice contact with any of the POWs uh, by their families whose detention averaged 15 and a half months in duration. In addition, upwards to 1,800 Vancouver Italians uh, were required to register with the RCMP. That was on a monthly basis. The stigma attached to those who made the monthly sign up in a visit to RCMP headquarters uh, plagued them for life. Now, these were Italians who had arrived from Italy after October 1922 uh, to the onset of the war with Italy in 1940. Grappling uh, with the realization that being classified as an enemy alien was tantamount to having a lifelong cross to bear was, for many Italians living in Vancouver, truly demeaning. On behalf of the committee, uh, which, uh, which included uh, Chelsea 
Boscario, a QC, uh, whose contribution proved invaluable, and others, including former educators Bill and Frank Berzo. I, and myself, of course, uh, I thank the council and involved City of Vancouver staff for the opportunity to, to, to participate on this file. It is clear that an apology statement to the descendants and the Italian community at large is in order. An expression of regret and remorse from the city of Vancouver certainly con would constitute a gesture of goodwill. It also uh, would serve as an antidote, antidote for the lingering mental anguish felt by the descendants of those who endured such pain and suffering. And in some cases, financial loss as a result of uh, often inexplicable actions taken by overzealous authorities over 80 years ago. Thank you. Thank you, Raymond. I'll just uh, speak to um, these next steps that um, should council approve recommendations in the report. Staff will work with internal external advisors on public awareness and education and the communications and protocol teams will you know support the, the launch of the attached historical overview and the draft ap apology uh, widely the approved apology would then be read in a council meeting in june coinciding with the launch of italian heritage month and the in the opportunities for commemoration of the official apology to italian canadians would be will be considered in alignment with and following the completion of the citywide commemoration policy that will take place in 2023. However, uh, during that period, the Italian Cultural Center and staff um, can certainly talk and communicate and, and start making plans around that. So just in closing, um, you know, it is unfortunate that uh, none of the interned Canadi Italian Canadians are alive today in Vancouver, but their descendants are here and deserve a recognition and apology for the injustices visited upon their families. The historical overview and the apology provided serve to acknowledge this truth about the past and are a crucial part of moving forward and ensuring that past injustices are not repeated in the future. So that concludes the presentation. Again, I'm very grateful for um, Raymond and uh, others who provided their uh, and volunteered their time to this. We thank you very much. Grazie a tutti. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I don't see any questions for uh, staff, so we have somebody move the... Uh, uh, okay, Councillor Dejanova, go ahead. Up to five minutes. Thanks very much. I do have a question for staff, and I hope I'm not putting staff on the spot, but um, in looking back at the original motion, and, and uh, just to say that I have actually drafted an amendment and circulated it, but um, the original motion had had asked that the apology include the City of Vancouver's actions in 1942, where Council um, referred to and offered to help uh, the federal government and the RCMP uh, to find enemy aliens. And I'm just wondering, is that something that staff see as a, as a possibility to include? Because it's what defines us and sets us aside from Burnaby or Coquitlam. Other cities didn't make that same declaration that the city of Vancouver did. Absolutely, we think it's, um, we, we fully support this being included and specified. It was a February 16th, 1942 council motion. Thank you very much. Okay. And that's the only question I'm prepared to move the motion if that's okay. Would you Mr. like to Stewart? move it with the amendment? Um, oh, sorry, we have to do the amendment first. Uh, no, we, we can move the report. Oh, I can move the report with the amendment. Okay, great. That's what I'll do if, if Great. Councilor Second, okay. Dominato. Thank you, Councillor Dominato. So we're on the main queue now, and we're speaking to the uh, report uh, with the additional amendment that uh, Councillor Dejanova has sent in. Uh, Councillor Dejanova, go ahead, up to five. Thanks very much. I'd like to begin by thanking our staff, um, notably Sandra Singh and Mary Claire Zach, for all of their work on this, um, and your entire staff team. I'd also like to thank representatives from Il Centro and Il Museo, including Mario Michelli. And I'd also like to thank um, Maria Moreno, who's the president of the National Congress of Italian Canadians from the BC region, for all their organization has done to represent Italian Canadians nationwide, including 
including their advocacy and efforts for decades on the apology that was finally delivered by the federal government last year. Um, last but not least, certainly not least, I'd really like to thank Raymond Koulos. Um, Raymond and I had spoken about this a long time ago, uh, many years ago actually, when I had found this original motion. This was something we had talked about, but I know that the efforts were being moved forward towards a federal apology first. Um, he's a historian who's well respected and well known in the Italian Canadian community, and I appreciate him sharing his knowledge and research with our staff. I'd also like to offer a special thanks to Randy Rinaldo, Michael Cuccione, uh, Carmen D'Onofrio, and Brunella Gaddio for their work in the Italian Canadian community and their advocacy and support for this, including the motion that I brought forward last year. Last year, the Prime Minister and the federal government officially acknowledged and apologized to Italian Canadians for the injustices brought against them and the internment of approximately 700 Italians simply because of their heritage, ethnicity, and for being born in Italy before they immigrated. In Vancouver, 44 Italians were arrested, torn from their families, and sent away to internment camps. Many more had to report to the RCMP. These were the heads of households, the breadwinners, and by, by order of the government, they worked for free, while their families, including small children, lost their houses and property and struggled to make ends meet. They were released from their imprisonment years later. When they were released, it was with no charges filed against them and no reparations. My great-grandfather was among these 44 people, and before my nono died, he shared with me the pain, trauma, and shame the internment brought um, on our family. In fact, he changed the spelling of our name from D-I to D-E to make it sound less Italian because it was hard to find work and fit in. My no-no shared with me how he and others were called a disgusting ethnic slur, WAPS. For those of you who don't know, it means without papers. 80 years later, I'd like to think that we've moved forward, but the slurs and stereotypes brought against people of Italian heritage are real and they still exist. I know because a few months ago, a group of activists who disagreed with me on a policy printed a t-shirt calling me Melissa Spaghetti Di Genova and suggesting a money trail be followed. What I can only infer was a reference alluding to the mafia. The policy we disagreed on had nothing to do with my ethnicity, so I am not sure why it was made fun of, but this I share to show that it still happens far too frequently. The Italian community is strong, it's resilient, and it's proud. While the Italian community has long deserved an apology, community has not let them hold this not let this hold them back from their contributions to our country and especially to our city i encourage you all to read a piece published by charlie smith in the georgia strait in april of 2018 titled italian day on the drive deserves official official civic status just like pride black history month and lunar new year along with raymond kulas's wonderful book I appreciate the unanimous support of council last year on my motion that led to this apology, and I am proud to join my council colleagues to right this wrong and acknowledge the harm that came to Italian Canadians because of actions and positions taken federally and here at the city of Vancouver. My only regret is that my no-no and my great-grandfather aren't alive to hear this. I also just want to note that I did, uh, out of an abundance of caution, uh, consult uh, a lawyer on conflict of interest and I understand that I have no more interest in this than anyone else in the Italian community and also conferred with some of my colleagues at the federal government who are of Italian descent and also brought this forward so I just wanted to assure council of that as well thank you thank you uh, councillor Weeb um, yeah I also like to thank Mumi Mina and uh, Wilma Clark and others for putting together a report that helped me understand a little bit more of Vancouver um, it's great and thanks for bringing it forward um, as someone born and Council, raised Council we are just going to stop you here because we're one minute to noon so I'd need uh, an extension just to finish this item so I motion to extend from Councillor Weeb seconded second. by Councillor Dejanova all in favor any opposed great sorry about that Councillor Weeb please continue yeah, as born in Vancouver, right, it is always interesting to learn more about our dark history and what opportunities we can to learn from past to move better together forward. So I really appreciate this work because it helped me understand a little bit more um, and how we can right these wrongs and ensure that we do better moving forward. So thank you very much for the report. Thank you. Councillor Dominato. 
Uh, thanks, Mayor. And, and simply, um, I'd like to start by uh, thanking Councilor DiGenova for bringing this forward and, and the collaboration. As she's noted, a number of people that were involved in the work and also to our staff. Uh, and uh, appreciative um, of the really intensive work that was done to, um, in terms of the report and the apology, in terms of detailing the history and as a, a Canadian of Italian heritage, uh, very much appreciate it. While my parent, my great grandparents actually immigrated from Italy uh, to Canada, um, my father, my grandfather was born here, and my father was born here, and my father still recalls post -war, World War II um, that latent uh, racism and the slurs that Councillor Dijanova referred to um, in, in, as a young man, and so um, I think that uh, it's very important um, that as a city. We acknowledge the history, um, we acknowledge the wrongs, we acknowledge the city's role uh, at that time. And um, I do thank um, the Italian Cultural Centre uh, in their involvement in this as well as Ray. Thank you for presenting this morning and for, for your references and, and input into this. It's very much and deeply appreciated, but uh, simply um, uh, we'll be supporting obviously the report and the recommendations and thank you. And again, thanks to Councillor DiGenova for bringing it forward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Kirby Young. Yeah, thank you. I'll, I will be brief. Also want to thank Councillor DiGenova for bringing this forward. And I would simply say that I think initiatives like this help to increase uh, cross-cultural understanding and that creates, I think, more more um, celebratory communities um, in terms of appreciating the diversity and the richness of the different cultures that we are very fortunate to have in Vancouver. Um, and I think that I would simply say that history um, unacknowledged is history invalidated. Um, and a big part of this is really honoring the experience um, that different cultural groups have had and oftentimes for new immigrants and new Canadians, they have faced significant hurdles, not often just to get here, um, but to build new lives in their city. Um, and they are often the most staunchly proud Canadians, um, while also re um, remaining very proud of their individual heritage. And I think that that's the spirit that we wanna have more of in the city of Vancouver. And so I'm very happy to uh, support this report. Thank you. Councillor Fry. Yeah, I, I really want to, uh, uh, thanks to Councillor uh, Tijanova for this, but I, I really want to acknowledge the contributions of Raymond Koulos as well. I've um, had the pleasure of, of reading uh, some of Ray's writings, including the Shoeshine Boys. Uh, I, I live across the street from the Padulo residence where uh, young Attilo Girardi was, was arrested. And uh, I heard many stories uh, courtesy of uh, the late uh, Mr. Ramon Benedetti and uh, the various folks who would come into the store from the old Prior Street reunion gang about those days and about the, the impacts that a lot of this had on, on Italian Canadians and, and Japanese Canadians who were li both living in Strathcona at the time of World War II and, and some of the, um, the, the, the actions of the state that fell off on them. And I just, I just really want to acknowledge that uh, Raymond Coulos in particular has done some really fantastic historical writing that's well worth folks checking out. Uh, because I think it's a glimpse to uh, a lot of what makes our city today and um, really want to acknowledge and thank Raymond for the contributions to writing this report. Thank you. Councillor Kerr. Yeah, thanks. Um, I too uh, want to acknowledge and thank Councillor DiGenova for bringing this forward. Um, I grew up in a in East Van, which was very largely a Slav Italian neighborhood. All my neighbors were either Slav or Italian. Um, my own family came from Croatia, Yugoslavia at the time, but there was a lot of um, a, a lot of sharing of food and joint making of wine uh, in, in the neighborhood. Um, and uh, you know, for me, um, apologies can't right a wrong, but they can really help people move beyond. Um, in terms of uh, moving forward in a more um, equitable and uh, respectful way. So I'm happy that this has come to us. Councillor Swanson. Yeah, <clears throat> I really want to thank all the people who worked on this. I learned a lot um, reading the report. And yeah, it's, it's good to acknowledge all this stuff. Really important. 
Thanks. Uh, that's it for uh, council comment. So I'll move to the vote on this uh, amended uh, staff report. And that's uh, passed unanimously. Thanks very much, council. We are at uh, five after 12. So let's, uh, we'll be moving in camera. Let's do that at five minutes after one, give you the full hour back here in council chambers at 3 p.m. Thanks very much, everybody. And we'll see you after lunch.
Welcome to TELUS Conferencing. Your access code is not valid. Welcome to TELUS Conferencing. To join the conference, enter your access code. Welcome to TELUS Conferencing. To join the conference, enter your access code followed by the number sign. Hey, Denise, can you hear me okay on the TELUS line? Hello, yes, I can hear you fine. Awesome, thanks.
Thanks, Council. Welcome back. Uh, we have finished item uh, report number one, so we're moving on to uh, report number two, the draft capital plan. Uh, the reason this item was held is we do have a number of speakers, but we, uh, um, I'll ask first if anybody wishes to declare a conflict of interest on this item. And if not, we'll move on to Patrice Impe, who will uh, uh, lead us through a presentation on this. Hi. Great, thank you, Mayor. Uh, Patrice Impe, General Manager of Finance, Risk, and Supply Chain Management and Chief Financial Officer. And I am here today with some members of our city leadership team, as well as a large number of staff uh, in the chambers, as well as online, who are here to answer any questions you may have on the draft capital plan. And I just want to take this moment to just really appreciate express my appreciation for the team. It's a huge amount of work, and, and I think you'll notice that as you've gone through the process with us, and so really thanking them for all the work uh, that went into that. Um, I'm just going to share my screen here. Is that working for everyone online? I'm not hearing a no, so I'll assume it's going all right. Great, so I'm just going to uh, do uh, a, a quick update on some of the capital plan context. You've seen some of that, but just as a reminder, I'll run through that. And then we'll speak to the draft capital plan. And we'll focus on, you know, Council had three motions for us. Um, so we've, uh, that you've asked us to bring back information on infrastructure um, and uh, climate and housing. So we'll have presentations on that. And then we'll talk about the public engagement and close off for questions. And Council, as you know, this is uh, in our process. This is uh, just for your information, uh, and then we will be going out for public engagement. So just in developing the draft capital plan, it really is an exercise in allocating our scarce resources for the goal of building our city and delivering our services. And um, staff balances many complex variables in uh, pulling together this, this plan. We've got a lot of ongoing capital programs that continue. We've got projects that are already in progress from previous plans. Council has approved a number of community plans, strategic plans, and we've got our council resolutions. All of those are taken into account in building the plan. Um, recent motions, uh, external our opportunities for external partnership and funding are a key part of our capital planning. And of course, the restrictions we have around unique funding sources are also things that play into the development of the plan. So today's so the draft plan that we're presenting, it aligns with the city's fiscal reality. It does so represent a very sizable increase in investment compared to the last plan. And those investments focus on the key council priority areas. And I just wanted to um, note that it does expand the financial capacity to address uh, the, the needs of renewing our existing assets and infrastructure, and particularly some key uh, large one-off projects. And I know that uh, we'll... we'll, we'll, we'll um, provide you more information on that. That was one of the council's areas of interest. And there are also projects that support the growth, um, population and employment growth over the next de decades to pre uh, prepare uh, the city for that. And it also balances the needs around across our <laughs> very wide array of service areas within the city. Uh, as I mentioned, we are um, at sort of step three, which is a draft capital plan, and we'll initiate the public engagement, which will take place through the month of May. We will then um, work based on that feedback, provide a briefing to council, and report out on that uh, public engagement findings and any adjustments that we make to the draft plan that we recommend to make based on that feedback. And we'll come back to you July 6th for your final approval. Of course, that is needed for us to ensure we've got the plebiscite questions um, in the October uh, election in place. We have received uh, about 72 questions from members of council and you've received responses over the past three weeks. So let me jump into a little bit of the context uh, on the capital plan. Just as a reminder, two main areas, we focus on renewing our aging infrastructure and amenities and of course building new ones to serve uh, our growth. But at the same time, we look to evolve our infrastructure and amenities to address our emerging needs policies, service delivery model changes, and really this, and many partnerships that uh, we develop um, uh, as, as we evolve uh, our, our planning. 
We look uh, not just at city assets, but we look at partner assets. And again, it is sort of a holistic view of the services available within the city and where the, where the city needs to use our funding uh, to, to um, fulfill the needs. And I won't go through all of that, but we've got uh, categories across all our, our service areas. And then you can see the detail around our assets and, and partner assets, uh, each of which are in the area of uh, replacement cost estimated over $30 billion each. Now, Council has approved a number of, of uh, things over the last many years, and they inform the capital planning process. So you uh, approve service strategies, so uh, Housing Vancouver, our transportation um, strategies. You also approve citywide strategies like climate. And then community strategies like the West End or Canby, where we commit to delivering uh, amenities within a certain geography to meet the needs. So all of those are factored into the capital plan. You've also seen our financial sustainability guiding principles, that these guide all of our financial decision making, uh, fiscal prudence, affordability, cost effectiveness, and in this case, a key piece is asset management. One thing I do want to highlight, and it is, it comes up quite a bit in our understanding of uh, the financial side of the capital plan, is the difference between funding and financing. So funding sources are who pays. That could be the city, could be development contributions, it could be contributions from partners. I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about this in more detail. And then the payment, um, the when to pay. And that could be reserves, which is, we, which is where we have contributions and we set them aside to use in the future, pay as you go, where we use the contributions immediately in that year, and debt, where we use the contributions to finance, to pay the debt servicing charges and finance over multiple years. So we often hear, well, can we get increase our debt to do that? The, the, the constraint isn't necessarily the debt, it's the ability to have the city contributions to, to um, service that debt. So that's really the constraining factor is the contribution side. The other just financing plans. In that same structure, um, we'll just go through this, uh, um, some of the key parts of the plan. So the city contributions that we talked about, those are mostly for renewal. They come from property tax, utility fees, and we have some other funding sources like empty homes tax. Development is primarily for new, that, though it does work with renewal in that it funds the expansion portion of a renewal, and those come from de development cost levies, other cash contributions like community amenity contributions, density a bonusing, and then also in-kind that we receive from developers, whether it's land or infrastructure and amenities. And then the third um, pillar is our partners. And of course, partner funding can fund renewal and new, though it tends to focus uh, on new and be available for new. And that could be regionally, TransLink and Metro Vancouver, senior government, and also our community partners, nonprofits and donations. So, so council has you know, full control over the funding um, from the city. Development funds are really driven by, they're subject to development economics and the development community. And partner funding is the most unpredictable. But just as a reminder, we, we generally um, plan based on our current assumptions around partner funding. But as it changes, this is just our, our initial plan. We would update the plan if we have more partner funding that comes forward over the four years. So, it, um, so we do expect that to change through the plan. And we know that funding is always limited and we rationalize and prioritize and try to balance all those needs. On the asset renewal side, we have some of these really large one-off projects like the Aquatic Centre that take up a significant amount of funding. And then we have you know, smaller programs like roof replacements that sort of fill in the, uh, fill in the balance and, and balancing those out. And also it's balancing between community facilities and civic facilities. So we often hear from the community on the community facilities, but we have to make sure that we're looking after our facilities like fire halls and things like that. So we have that balance as well. On the new and expanded amenities, again, supporting growth um, and integrating that with renewal. So we're really leveraging our renewal dollars and our growth dollars by doing them together. We, this has more of a higher likelihood of leveraging partner funding, so we look for that in a, as we're looking at new amenities. And all those new amenities would look to advance our climate equity reconciliation goals. Now, when we look at the capital plan allocations, sort of another look at the flexibility and, and lack of flexibility that, um, that we have as a city or that council has. So where council has approved a land de dedication or we've um, uh, committed to getting in-kind, amenities through development, that's not flexible. Those are already decided and, and we um, uh, don't have control over that. Less flexible would be some of those big one-time projects that can't be phased. So once we start, it goes in for the full amount and, and, uh, and, and is less flexible. Or where we're partnering with other um, 
agencies, for instance, the Recamp Community Centre, uh, partnering with the province on that, that we're sometimes committed to their timeline. More flexible are projects where we can phase them. So if we don't have enough money and we're trying to balance a number of things, we can maybe do it in, in phases or we can scale um, the, the service level as well. So the next section is just a, a summary of the draft capital plan. And again, there's a huge amount of data, but we'll use our same sort of format to um, familiarize you with the, with the plan. So under the city side, which is mostly for renewal, you can see that there's the debt, the pay as you go in the reserves, and that's 1.7 billion. So more than half of the plan is uh, city contributions. Under development, again, for new and expansion, We've got our development contributions uh, and then our in-kind projects, so that's the next largest. And then our partner contributions, smaller as, as a percentage, but again, we look to add to that over the, the life of the plan. So that's our total of uh, 3.4 billion, 2.7 would be cash and about 700 million in-kind. Another look at this is so how does this plan compare to our previous plans when they're the same the categories, you'll see that the city contributions have grown by 64%. And I really want to highlight that this is the focus we've had on renewal and, uh, and increasing the capital plan um, for renewal, which we know is a challenge for us. Development contributions slightly lower. And again, this is from the original plan. Again, we had done a midterm update of the um, uh, last year, and so we had to reduce the development contributions in the current plan, and partner contributions uh, estimated to be slightly higher. So overall, the plan is 22% higher, but again, the city contributions at 64, and we'll talk a little bit more about how we got there. The plan provides a, a huge amount of data um, and information on each of our service categories. So there's a, a section for each, an overview of the service. There's an inventory of all of the assets in the city, so visually and in a table. And then we look at what has um, happened in the last 10 years, because in deciding for this four years, it's really helpful to know where have we been investing uh, in the past, and then also looking in the future, what's the vision for this category? What's the strategy that we have in place? And then that informs the capital plan. And as the plan may evolve over the four years, we look back to those 10-year strategies to help us decide um, on any changes we may make. If we get into the detail, you'll see for each of the service categories, there's a detail around the projects or pro programs. And then for each of those, we outline the uh, details, like what are the outcomes, for instance, in housing number of units, uh, whether we're investing in existing or new, the total and the funding source. So all those things we talked about before are then broken out uh, by each project or program. So this table is just as a, as a summary of all of that by service categories. So the service categories on the left and all the things we've talked about, whether it's existing or new, whether city or non-city assets, and then the different funding um, sources between city developer and partner and uh, to, for a total of 3.4 billion. And I've got a couple of slides visually that will show this a, a little bit easier for you. So this is our investment um, by service category for existing assets, so primarily renewal. And you can see the vast majority is water, sewers, and drainage um, by far. And uh, that is primarily funded through utility uh, rates. Uh, the second largest being streets and the third being community facilities. So a little bit easier way to sort of get a sense of, uh, of how those uh, infrastructure dollars are, are allocated. And then the next one is uh, by service category again, but for our new assets. And so quite different in this case, where the vast majority is housing, at, uh, almost half a billion dollars in housing over the four years, again, reflecting council's priorities. And then community facilities, and it's worth uh, flagging here, there is a significant um, amount of funding going into new facilities uh, for, um, for, for the community. And that's a double-edged sword in that it's great. We're getting a lot of new facilities. They will then come back to us as facilities that need to be renewed and, uh, and uh, increase that infrastructure renewal challenge that we have. Just as an example of some of the visuals, so this is a case of, of facilities. And uh, the blue and the green are items that have already been completed or are underway out of our current plan. And then the red are projects that are currently, that are in the draft capital plan. And you can see uh, you know, quite a number. And on the right, the, the actual specific details of the larger projects that we've either undertaken or um, are, are part of this uh, new plan. So that sh should help you as far as prioritizing and understanding where the investments have been and, and will be in this, in this plan. Uh, similar for childcare. Again, uh, similar sort of format. And you can see 
uh, all the projects that uh, either are have been completed or underway or that are planned in this uh, in this draft plan. And we're going to shift and talk about the three areas that Council had asked us to provide you information on infrastructure, climate and housing. So I will start with the infrastructure and then uh, I'll pass it on to uh, others for the next two parts. So again, we talked about the city owning 34 billion of infrastructure and amenities. And I think you know the lifespan is very different. So from vehicles or IT, which have a short lifespan to water and pipes that we're planning over 80 to 100 years. So our asset planning um, processes and, and, and work is quite extensive. In coming into this plan, we looked at the infrastructure deficit um, and looking forward, we need about $800 million a year to do everything we wanted to do. And in our last plan, we had about 300. So a gap of about 500, but you'll see that 500 million, you'll see that we have closed that gap to some extent in this, uh, in this plan. So why do we have an infrastructure deficit? Uh, really, there's two main drivers. One is that we continue to add assets. So it's the quantity of assets, and that can be assets that support growth, but it can also be where we have new assets, we're getting into new lines of business, and, uh, and we need infrastructure to support that. Or the other is just the cost per unit. And again, two drivers. It could be just cost escalation and inflation, but it also could be improved service standards. So when we build a park today, it looks quite different than when we built a park uh, years ago and, uh, and the, the, the activities that happen in a park and the infrastructure to support it is uh, uh, much more extensive and therefore more expensive as well. So addressing the infrastructure deficit. So we've talked about uh, what we know is it's significant and growing. Uh, these amenities need to be renewed or we need to decommission them. And most of that funding comes from taxes and fees. So we do have a multi-decade intentional strategy to address it. It includes increasing our funding capacity. It includes really actively pursuing federal and provincial funding. Really looking at as we grow our assets that we try to limit that and look at other options for providing services. And we are actively looking at how we can deliver infrastructure and amenities more efficiently. So how we can deliver quicker um, at lower cost uh, and, and through partnerships with others. So this is a chart that helps you see what we've done uh, to date around uh, the funding capacity for infrastructure. So uh, back in since 2019, we've had a 1% uh, property tax increase and 5% utility fee increase dedicated towards asset uh, renewal above our regular run rates. And so above that basic funding, you can see how that additional funding is working to close that gap uh, against the, the ideal target rate. And again, that doesn't include senior government funding. As we get other partners, then that can help to close that uh, as well. But we are, you can see here that from the last plan to this plan, it's a $190 million increase, a 64% increase in the funding that we've set aside for renewal. So it's quite, uh, quite significant. And this is a similar slide you've seen as far as the renewal breakdown. We've got some of the major projects um, in infrastructure renewal. The uh, Vancouver Aquatic Centre, which as we all know is a high priority. The Raycam Community Centre, we've got investment in our Granville and Canby Bridges. Uh, Gastown Water Street and the Animal Shelter, which is a partnership. And then we've got all of our ongoing programs that keep our facilities um, maintained and running uh, in both facilities, parks, um, street sidewalk signals, our underground infrastructure, which you sometimes forget, and, uh, and our technology. So I'm going to pass it now to Doug Smith, and he's going to talk a little bit about climate, which is uh, one of the areas that he'd asked us to report back on. Thank you, Patrice. I'm Doug Smith. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. I'm the Director of Sustainability. Today I'll be covering climate and how it shows up in our four-year capital plan. There isn't a standalone component called climate in our capital plan, but it can be found across multiple, dis multiple categories across the plan. Uh, therefore, staff have gone through and pulled out the different amounts in the draft plan associated with the climate and also have identified any of the gaps. So for the next few slides, I'm going to focus on climate mitigation, reducing, actually, I missed a slide, hold on, there we go. Um, our work on climate has two categories, mitigation, reducing our greenhouse gas pollution by 50% by 2030 and 100% before 2050, and adaptation, ensuring that Vancouver adapts to the impacts of our changing climate. So for the next few slides, I'm going to focus on climate mitigation, reducing carbon pollution, over the past four years, we have made some significant headway here. 
Since 2007, emissions from within the city have decreased 15% while population and economy have, a grown, have grown. We've cut emissions from our own facilities and our own fleet dramatically. We've also taken bold steps to reduce community-wide emissions, including strengthening the Vancouver Building Bylaw so that all new buildings will soon be zero emissions, building new and improved bike lanes and sidewalks, and installing new charging infrastructure for EVs. But we need to accelerate the pace of our mitigation work, and to that end, Council approved in 2020 the Climate Emergency Action Plan, which sets out a five-year action plan and a financial framework to achieve our 2030 targets. So staff have gone through the draft capital plan and identified all of the projects that directly align with the Climate Emergency Action Plan. There are approximately $246 million in projects that support climate emergency in this plan. That's roughly $35 million more than what was in the previous capital plan. This is great news. It's still below the $400 million in funding that we identified in the Climate Emergency Action Plan, uh, so about $150 million shortfall, but still an increase is greatly appreciated. And I'm briefly going to highlight some of the climate emergency related work in the draft capital plan. So under Big Move 2, here you'll see the continued rollout of part of walking, cycling and traffic calming, active tra transportation. Um, we often use uh, temporary and more cost effective approaches to maximize the amount of work we can do here, especially with uh, slow streets and some of the bike work that we're doing. We also have funding earmarked for transit priority projects, including priority bus lanes as seen on 41st Avenue. Under Big Move 3, which is electric vehicles, we'll continue to roll out public charging as we have been doing for the last few years. We'll also have additional funding for supporting charging in rental buildings, which is leveraging provincial funding. Under Big Move 4 and 5, which is green buildings, we have funding earmarked for regulations to reduce emissions from new and existing buildings. As well, we'll continue to expand the neighborhood energy utility. In terms of bang for the buck, the funding in this area is the most critical. Under Big Move 6, which is climate sequestration, there is funding earmarked for the continued implementation of green rainwater infrastructure, new park space, and replacement of, of existing street trees. I should also note that there, out of the $246 million, there's about $76 million worth of projects that are directly supportive of climate adaptation. Uh, for example, green infrastructure both is a mitigation and an adaptation piece of work. In addition to the work that uh, directly aligns with the Climate Emergency Action Plan, there are other projects in the budget to help us reduce emissions. By our, our estimate, these total around $150 million. A few examples of these include landfill gas collection, the purchase of low-carbon fuels for our fleet, and reducing food waste. These are all important projects, but they weren't actions in the Climate Emergency Action Plan because they were already underway. And um, so these are sort of considered business as usual or ongoing work that we do. These projects often have other drivers, such as cost savings, and also meeting regulatory requirements. Okay, so oh, there we go. Now we're going to switch to climate change adaptation. Uh, with last year's heat dome and flooding events, adaptation has become a much more pressing issue. The city has been moving ahead under its climate adaptation strategy, updated in 2018. And these, these slides include a few of the highlights from our past four years. The Sea to City project is underway right now, and this is looking at how to adapt our coastline around False Creek and the coming decades to accommodate sea level rise. We've also installed new flood protection infrastructure and tide gates along the Fraser River. Council approved the Rain City strategy and phase one of the Healthy Waters Plan. We've also seen significant green infrastructure projects built, like Long Richard Street. Our tree canopy target of 23% was recently achieved, and Park Board continues to naturalize turf areas in some of our parks. And lastly, the city became one of the first cities in the world to disclose its climate risk under the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures. In terms of the draft capital plan, there are about $180 million in projects that directly support climate actions um, in the climate adaptation strategy. Unlike climate emergency, we don't have an estimate of how much we should be spending annually on adaptation. However, we plan to bring that to Council as part of the next adaptation strategy update in 2023. You can see here some of the projects that are in the capital plan that directly align with the adaptation strategy rebuilding damaged portions of the seawall and improving its structural stability against waves, continuing to acquire parkland and in some cases converting parkland to natural habitat areas, 
Continuing to implement green infrastructure across the city with several significant blue-green corridor projects, including the St. George Drainway. We are also planning to install 20 more drinking fountains and to continue to roll out water meters to reduce our water consumption. <coughs> so similar to mitigation, uh, there are a number of projects that support adaptation that are not explicitly part of the climate adaptation strategy. These projects add up to about $180 million in the draft capital plan. A few examples of those include the ongoing sewer separation work, renewal of some of our libraries and recreational centres, which normally includes cooling and air quality improvements for the public. These projects are typically driven by other needs, such as adap uh, with adaptation as a co-benefit. Thank you. Thank you, Doug, and I ask Sandra Singh, our General Manager of uh, Arts, Culture, and Community Services, to speak to non-market housing, and that's the third area that Council had asked us to report back on. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Uh, good to be with you again. Um, I'll just go through these slides very quickly, some of the content you will have seen um, last time. So as a reminder, in terms of the, uh, the non-market housing asset class, there are a number of different uh, places where uh, capital dollars uh, advance our, our work. Um, there's our portfolio deployment, which is where we deploy um, uh, where we deploy city capital into non-market projects to, or sorry, non-profit projects to deepen affordability. We deploy turnkey housing from private, private developers through, uh, achieved through CACs or DCLs. Uh, we have our own projects that we deliver, including the RHI funded program, uh, 223 units, for example, the permanent modular supportive, temporary modular, our own land. We have our own buildings that we, uh, 12 buildings that we own and operate low income housing, about a thousand units that we need to maintain. We have uh, hundreds of leases with nonprofit housing providers and we have building owner maintenance responsibilities as part of many of these leases. We work in partnership with senior government on delivering supportive housing and on uh, an emerging SRO strategy, as well as we deploy emergency shelters to, uh, in response to our ongoing homelessness crisis. Uh, and the council at the last presentation asked about the previous capital plan. So here you see the allocations for non-market housing in the last capital plan, about 625 million in total. 400 of that was in kind and about 223 was uh, cash. In terms of the uh, what we delivered with the last capital plan, uh, we have a lot of work underway. Um, but to, just to show you our progress, we did have a question on what have we actually spent. Um, so we we have so far spent about 107 million. Uh, about 106 of that was acquisitions and site pre uh, site preparation. We offered some grants into SROs um, as well as undertook some feasibility and planning studies. We have a lot of work underway, and as council knows, housing. Um, housing projects will often span multiple capital plans, and so um, we have encumbered about 57 million, 27 in, in chip grants approved by council. We have purchase order commitments, and we have uh, payments to the PEF for Valhav transfers queued up, and we have earmarked around 61 million. So, as council knows, we're work planning the demolition of the Balmoral. We have other projects underway, like 162 Main. Uh, we have rental protection commitments that, uh, that we have made, uh, uh, for example, at First and Clark, um, and we have a number of grant programs. Um, and we have earmarked about $35 million for new acquisitions. So of the previous capital plan, there is nothing that is unallocated. Um, everything has a, has a plan uh, to, uh, to, to deliver. Uh, you saw this slide uh, earlier a few weeks ago when I presented. These are some of the actual key achievements uh, that, uh, that the capital funding helped us achieve. We deployed land with nonprofit delivery partners, um, about 866 units completed, 860 under construction, and 737 under contract and development. Uh, we've deployed three airspace parcels. Um, we delivered the remaining uh, temporary modular housing units. We started to deliver on the permanent supportive housing uh, MOU with BC Housing. We've completed land assemblies. We took action on the region in Balmoral. Um, we completed three uh, city-owned facilities and, uh, and um, invested about $30 million in grants uh, for over just under 800 units in nonprofit projects. And we initiated um, a number of uh, studies on our own, uh, our own current buildings and 
how we how we plan to renew them moving forward, as well as started discussions with the senior government on um, SRO uh, SROs and uh, and that stock. Uh, you saw this in the last presentation as well. This is the current draft 2023 to 2026 capital plan. Um, and it, uh, it includes a substantive uh, amount of funding for land acquisition, as well as, um, as the, uh, the preparation of that land. Um, it uh, includes uh, funding to support the relocation of temporary modular housing, as well, including our own terminal building, um, supporting the SRO strategy, uh, as well as grants into SROs, as well as maintenance of our existing, um, our existing programs investments in nonprofit uh, housing projects, as well as delivery of in-kind uh, uh, units through delivery. Total, it's about $617 million. Uh, about 335 is developer con um, contributed, um, and uh, um, uh, 84.3 city. And we have $12 million uh, earmarked for partner contributions. As council knows, this this, um, the aspirations in this uh, plan here will not be met without senior government funding. And uh, over the next four years, as we work with the senior government, we do anticipate contributions in the delivery of this plan. All told, uh, this represents about 2,600 newer replacement homes over the four years. It's about 2,200 new and about 380 renewed. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sandra and Council. That uh, uh, summarizes uh, the detail that we would plan to share on the capital plan. There is a lot more detail in the uh, in the report, and uh, um, should you have any questions, we just wanted to focus on those three areas. And now I'll ask uh, Maria Pantikas to come up and speak to the public engagement plan. So, so you know, this is uh, you're receiving this report for information, and we'll kick off that the engagement, um, which will then inform the final plan. Thanks, Patrice, and good afternoon, Mayor and Council. I'm going to take you through in brief this year's approach to public engagement for the capital plan, and this will kick off on April 28th. Um, as preconditioning work to help increase broad understanding of the capital plan, what it is and how it benefits from Vancouverites, from the 25th of March through to April 26th, uh, we've been running a public education social media campaign to really introduce uh, in broad ways capital planning concepts. And this took place across the city's social channels, uh, using plain language, you shared information about what a capital plan, what's included, using accessible methods such as quizzes, stories, and did you know style content that was uh, subject to quite good engagement. As I noted, the engagement will launch on the 28th and will continue for a month through to the 22nd of May. So residents and businesses will have a variety of ways to participate, both online and in person. Um, first off, by completing the Tom Vancouver survey that will be at shapeyourcity.ca slash capital plan. This will be translated into the city's five top languages, traditional Chinese, simplified Chinese, Punjabi, Tagalog, and Vietnamese. And this will be complemented by a very plain language user discussion guide that's design friendly um, and accessible. Uh, in addition to that, public engagement through the Talk Vancouver platform, a third party firm will be conducting a market research survey with the identical questions to complement that process. We'll be hosting online information sessions on May 11th and 12th uh, through this, uh, participants will have opportunity to learn more about the capital planning process, ask questions, and share their thoughts through facilitated sessions. And those also will be available for registration through Shape Your City. Across the city, we'll be hosting 11 pop-up events, um, including on the downtown east side, at locations such as Mission Impossible, the Broadway Youth Resource Center, neighborhood houses, and Vancouver Public Library branches, Please. where people can meet and with reduced barriers to Just digital engagement. Here. Just checking to make sure we're not advancing any slides. Are there? Oh, slides? I'm sorry. Forgive me. That's okay. Everything I've said is up there. So here's your map. And we'll skip ahead to those tactics. So um, as I just noted, I'll repeat that because uh, there may have been some distraction. 11 pop-up events throughout the city at places including Mission Possible, the Broadway Youth Resource Center, neighborhood uh, houses, and VPL locations. Um, and through this in-person engagement, we hope to enrich the mainstream engagement findings uh, through a more representative range of feedback through, from equity-denied communities. Um, a facilitated session will also be held for council advisory committee members, and that'll take place in mid-May with an invitation going out. Uh, Vancouver Board of Parks and Recreation is holding a supplementary engagement process with park facility users and stakeholders, such as meeting with their youth council. 
And following all of this engagement, the feedback will compile, be compiled in an engagement summary report that will be available in June to a four-year decision-making alongside financial information and capital considerations. Uh, results from our public education phase will also be included within that report. So I appreciate your attention about this, and I'll turn it back to Patrice to wrap us up with the last few slides. Great. Thank you, Maria. So just to uh, conclude, uh, the draft plan that is presented today aligns with our city's fiscal reality. It does represent a sizable increase compared to the last plan. It invests in key priority areas such as uh, climate, housing, affordability, equity, and it does uh, expand the financial capacity specifically to address our needs of renewing our existing assets and includes a number of very key large one-off projects. It also includes programs and, and projects that support our population and employment growth uh, for the next decade and balances this across the wide uh, array of city service areas. So with that, I will uh, stop sharing and uh, we have uh, staff here and online who'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thanks very much. Uh, there's a whole uh, slate of councillors with questions. So I'll start with uh, Councillor Kirby Young up to five minutes, please. Yeah, thank you. First of all, thanks for um, sort of the realistic presentation and the response to the uh, direction from council on the number of motions. I'm going to zero my questions in on civic infrastructure and facilities and hoping for sort of short, quick responses. And some of them are just to provide clarity for the public in terms of um, what we're hearing that they want. So some of these could be quick yes or no. So the Aquatic Centre in terms of the full re renewal fully funded in this capital plan. Correct, not stretching over one or two, but fully funded for a full rebuild. Ms. Chang, Director of Long-Term Financial Strategy. Yes, correct, it's 100% funded for the entire construction. Okay, East Fraser Lens Community Center, also fully funded in this next capital plan for the long-awaited East Fraser Lens Community Center. Sorry, can you repeat again? The East Fraser Lens Long-Awaited community, community Center, also fully funded in the next capital plan. This will be done through um, development and we will be contributing cash as well. Okay, uh, with the aim that uh, it's not spreading over multiple capital plans, but the full or bulk of the funding is in this coming plan. I just this, want to clarify that. This is the intent, but we're still working with the developer on this. Okay, but we're, we're that's that's our goal. That's what we're aiming Correct. for. Correct. Okay, super, thank you. Um, with respect to... Um, Sewer separation, um, and I know I brought that motion forward in early 2019, recognizing that there's going to be a responsibility with our aging pipes um, and the new senior government requirements for reduction or elimination of CSOs and separation. How much are we increasing the amount of sewer separation as planned and the investment relative to a normal year? I think we used to spend about 36 million a year, and we're increasing that, I think, by about $20 million. Is that correct? Thank you for the question, Margaret Whitkins, Deputy General Manager, Engineering. Uh, the rate is going from 0.6% uh, uh, to 0.8% over this plan. Okay, um, but still, so progress towards the goal, but still shy of getting in excess of 1% per year, which is what we would need to be on track by 2050, let alone expediting to do it faster. Is that right? Um, Correct, it's shy of the ultimate target, but uh, an aggressive plan relative to what can be delivered over the next four years and considering the ramp up that's been experienced over the last four. Okay, um, and fair to say that um, a lot of this core and civic infrastructure, whether it is sewer separation, reduction of overflows, or things like renewal of community centers, um, in terms of how they're built, can also contribute to our climate goals that they're not mutually distinct, right? A lot of our investment does also meet our climate goals at the same time. Uh, certainly speaking for sewers uh, and drainage, that is uh, definitely the case. Okay, very helpful. And thanks for walking through these quickly with me. I really appreciate it. Um, the next one I wanna talk about the report that the Vancouver Park Board received last night, which came, uh, I think Councillor Weeb or then Commissioner Weeb and I will remember pushing for this work to get a status on the, um, or to get the status of the community centers, which are aging dramatically. And they received a pretty dire report last night that indicated not only are some of them aging and becoming a uh, pretty poor condition, um, but none of them are upgraded for seismic capability. And they identified three or four priority community centers on the east side. So I know that we hear, for example, in, in previous questions, well, we don't have air cooling in some of our 
libraries, but do we actually have a more dire need that our buildings are literally decrepit for our community centers We and that we have seismic risk? How great is that risk? Michelle Scholes, um, Director of Facilities Planning and Development. Um, a number of our, our facilities are built in the 60s and 70s, um, but we have um, about six or seven uh, community centers that were all renewed prior to 2010. All of those are in excellent seismic shape. Um, and the ones coming up um, that we have prioritized, um, Britannia, West End, Marple Community Center is being replaced right now. Um, we have okay, a few- if I can jump things just because I have time, I know they're prioritized, but there's no funding allocated for them at this point. So I'm asking specifically about the risk. Uh, the risk is low. All of those buildings are kept safe um, from a um, capital maintenance point of view. Um, all the safety is a number one priority. Okay, so we don't have a concern with their seismic, similar to schools are being updated because more rapidly because of seismic issues. Um, well, all the ones that are built prior to 1990 do uh, need replacement and upgrading from a seismic perspective. Okay. Thank you. Mayor, can I move for a second round? Uh, you just lost your time there. You're over your five minutes, so perhaps another councillor will. Uh, councillor Dejanova. I'm happy to move for a second round. Okay. Uh, councillor Dominato, thank you. All in favour? Aye. Any opposed? Okay, okay Councillor Dejanova, go ahead. Thanks very much. Uh, my first question is regarding the Mount Pleasant pool that has been promised for, for quite some time uh, over many different councils and park boards. I'm wondering, is that replacement of the pool fully funded in this plan? The pool is not fully funded in this plan. Bruce, do you want to add to that? Um, we typically allocate funding in accordance with public benefit strategy for that particular community. So for the Mount Pleasant community, uh, community plan and also the public benefit strategy, I do not believe the poll is in there. That one being said, um, we will be um, doing an implementation plan as part of the, um, the Vancouver plan. So we will be doing a citywide public benefit strategy. So um, the polls, any outdoor polls can be part of that discussion and prioritization as well. So can I ask why if several councils and park boards have committed to this over many terms. Why hasn't it already been funded in the capital plan? Um, as I mentioned before, we typically allocate development contributions to um, implement public benefit strategies. I don't believe this is part of the public benefit strategies. That's why it has not been allocated. So but technically we could allocate we could commit funding in this capital plan. That's a possibility, correct? There is not enough community, uh, community contributions. Um, available in the Mount Pleasant area to do that. But what about city, city-wide? Could we not draw on those? There, I don't believe there is a, a lot of city-wide um, uh, community amenity contributions that can be poured like city-wide as opposed to very specific to a community plan and public benefit strategy. Okay, but we do have some city-wide. I remember this was a consternation during my time on Park Board uh, that can be allocated. Is that correct? Council could direct staff to find that funding. You can direct um, staff to find the funding, but again, as I said, um, citywide CACs, we tend to allocate to areas that, again, is, is going back to the trade-off um, conversation, because there are also other council priorities that also require citywide, and citywide CAC typically is very limited. Okay, yeah. thanks so much. Um, I, I have another question, and that's specifically on 24-hour um, childcare or childcare. I really appreciated all of the information, um, and I'm looking at at Sandra mm -hmm. <laughs> um, on on the non-market housing that's coming online and and the investments uh, in capital of sort of city-owned and and where we'd partner with operators um, for uh, non-market housing um, and social housing. I'm wondering if you can can share more on. Child care, I just didn't see that in your presentation specifically, but in the upcoming capital plan, is there a consideration or even a business model that 24-hour child care in, in employing an operator would be used even longer in hours mm -hmm. so it could help offset costs and help us to actually secure more child care throughout? Mm -hmm. Thank you for the question. Um, in response to the council motion asked, directing staff to look into 24-hour child care, there has been study and, and review underway around that, and we do anticipate reporting back through our upcoming child care strategy report to council uh, 
in early June. So you'll receive that before the capital plan. In terms of the capital plan submission right now, none of the uh, child care investments that we've identified contemplate 24-hour care. Okay, but would this possibly be a missed opportunity then if that's going to come forward, that this doesn't contemplate 24-hour care, which could actually change the model because it would include sleeping quarters? Um, I I know it's across yeah. planning and development and community services. My apologies. Yeah, my recollection. I'll have to. I'll get back to you um, offline. My recollection was that in terms of the actual design of the childcare, there wouldn't be significant changes. It's more around the business feasibility of of operating twenty four childcare. So we'll um, we'll report back to you offline. Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, another question that I have, and, and it's building on a, a question that was asked by my colleague before, is the Hastings Community Center. Can you tell me where that is at in this capital plan, considering I understand that, that they have had uh, some revitalization over the years, but they are badly in need of not only a new community center, as we heard last night from the report that came to Park Board, Sorry, I just want to make sure that you, you're able to hear my question, um, but also understanding that there were some concerns, seismic concerns, especially at that community centre. Yeah. Maybe just to um, uh, reiterate, so that is not in this capital plan other than regular maintenance that the park board would have across all of their um, community centres. Uh, in this capital plan, we have um, RACAM, and uh, we've got a significant investment again also in the... Um, uh, Vancouver Aquatic Centre, again, when we talked about those big projects, that's one of those very, very big ones, which is going to use up uh, quite a, a lot of our renewal dollars. Uh, we are completing the Marpole Oak Ridge one in this plan. And then uh, um, what we do, we do, rec I just want to highlight that we recognize we have a renewal challenge and it's not just around community centers, it includes libraries, civic facilities, and we do need to accelerate that. So we are planning to do some uh, um, a citywide strategy around our renewal activity and what we can do to accelerate that. And we really need to prioritize across all the community facilities, but also community and civic. So we'll be doing that over as part of this plan and then bringing that information back to council and that can also inform um, uh, any changes to this plan. But at this point in time, we don't have the... We're well That's over my that. time. I was going to say, yeah. uh, I'll put myself back. Council, if you could leave time for staff to answer your questions, bearing in mind it may not be the same person that answers, so not directed just to you, Councillor Desanova, but we are going over with every... Uh, Councillor, and we do have two rounds, and I'm conscious that we're 10 to 4 with a number of items to get through. So thanks, uh, Councillor Hardwick, up to 5. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I'd like the slide to be put back up that showed the relative funding sources between uh, debt and developer contributions. Could we have that slide back, please? And um, while we're doing that, uh, Patrice, I was just um, hoping that you could take us back to 2009, um, which I understand was was the year that we started to regularize developer contributions as part of our regular uh, capital budget uh, structure. Uh, beginning then to where we are today, today what I saw when we get to that slide is there it is, is that uh, note the the one that you just went past, the one that showed that the amount coming from development sources was equivalent to that coming coming. No, there was there was one other that. Do you want this one, which is more of a summary of defense up here? So it it, it demonstrated that fifty percent of the budget. That's correct. Mm -hmm. So. Um, what we're seeing here is the relative importance of developer contributions or development contributions relative to city contributions, which um, are primarily uh, debt, debenture borrowing, correct? The city contributions are debenture borrowing, pay as you go, and, uh, and reserves. Which would have been what we've always used for capital. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, at, at which point did we introduce developer contributions, which I believe was 2009, answering my own question? Mm -hmm. And how have we seen it grow in relative proportion over the last decade plus? Mm -hmm. um, so, 
We went through a, um, a major review of our capital planning process around that time period. And our capital plan had been done sort of really focused primarily on, on city renewal. And uh, what we determined is in doing our plan, we wanted to recognize all of the work that was happening within the city and all of the amenities and that, that um, uh, assets and amenities that we were working on. So we did um, uh, intentionally adjust the capital plan so it was much more holistic. And as you'll notice, we're, you know, we've, we've all started to look at in-kind projects as well. So again, when we look at what are all the amenities that are coming to the city, we look at all of that. And and we also you know broadened our view to say, what about partner assets and how are we actually using right, the capital plan? Right, but plans? the question so is... That was an intentional um, change to the plan to recognize all of those assets and, and align it to our, our public benefit strategy. But that as doesn't answer as my change, question. Yeah, do you have... Change. Yeah, Grace is going to um, follow up. Thank you. Hi, um, I just want to add to that. Um, basically, the, the whole, I would say, the financing growth strategy started in 2004, and the citywide DCL actually was introduced in 2006. So basically, having this concept of using development contributions to fund um, new amenities and uh, infrastructure is nothing new. I guess your question is, when when did we start consolidating everything in one in one document as opposed to doing it I would say basically outside of the capital planning process. So I um, just want to kind of reiterate that we th this has been ongoing for quite a while in terms of relying on development contributions to to deliver new amenities. But there's a difference between doing it on a location specific basis and regularizing it as part of your financial structure. So the first question was uh, when did we introduce it and and what was it its relative importance in the overall funding and what we're seeing today and what we've seen in this capital period is that it's roughly 50% of the capital budget was funded through development contributions and that was what I was trying to just get confirmed which the numbers uh, do confirm. And I think what I heard, and, and Grace, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, is that the rationale for this was that the, the um, capital maintenance, which was funded through our traditional means of funding capital, was insufficient. So the, all the things that we talk about as council priorities, ca climate, social, economic development, affordable housing, were things that were enabled through the restructuring of our capital finance. Is that accurate? Um, I would put it this way. Um, it is always recognized that our property tax funding, uh, which is basically the city contribution, is always limited. That's why we want to preserve that for renewal and capital maintenance. So basically for all the new amenities and infrastructure to support growth, even when we went to um, the public, um, as part of public engagement, um, um, when we developed the, the last two capital plans, the public is has been on site in terms of um, having the city of Vancouver to rely on development contributions to deliver new uh, and expanded amenities and infrastructure to support growth. So basically, okay, but that's not my question. Thanks, for our Five minutes, and we're going to move. Okay, I'll go back on the queue, but I would it would be Chancellor helpful Boyle. if I could get answers. Councillor Boyle. Thanks so much uh, for all of this information, staff. I have uh, some transportation questions and then some arts and culture questions. So I'll start with transportation. Um, I, I'm interested in a bit more information about the Canby Bridge structural and seismic upgrades and what the urgency of getting that done in this capital plan is. Uh, certainly. Um, I think I'll call on Eric Mattel, who is on the line, our Director of Streets, who can provide a little bit more context on the details of that uh, investment. Thanks. Hi, my name is Eric Mattel. I'm the Director of Streets. Um, the work that's planned for the Canby Bridge is a combination of rehabilitation and also seismic upgrade. Um, the age of the Canby Bridge um, sort of calls for some deferred maintenance that's been hard to prioritize in past capital plans to be undertaken uh, over the next couple of capital plans. Uh, a significant portion of the spend is actually a seismic upgrade, um, and the Canby Bridge uh, actually has the potential to be a highly performing bridge once seismic upgrades are complete. So uh, in order to pursue sort of both uh, the seismic upgrades and the rehabilitation, this work kind of has to happen um, kind of in sync and step with each, with each other. And do we have a specific dollar amount on, on that piece? I don't need it right now. I'm just curious in the buckets of, uh, of projects. Um, but m my next transportation question um, is around the neighborhood traffic management program um, at the amount it's only partially funded as far as I can tell in the draft capital plan um, based on the 
the amount being proposed for funding, do we have estimates of how many neighborhoods we could um, be looking at per year in terms of what I understand is this sort of neighborhood by neighborhood approach to making those uh, slow streets and, and um, traffic management upgrades? Certainly. Um, so there is currently two million included in the draft plan, uh, which would enable eight neighborhoods. Uh, the um, condition is that uh, with that level of funding, it would be primarily temporary materials, uh, and so um, we would not uh, be uh, able to um, kind of uh, fully implement um, the the neighborhood traffic management that uh, might be the ultimate state. But we would be endeavoring to reach eight uh, eight neighborhoods. And uh, to your prior question around um, Granville and Camby, I believe it's 30 million uh, for the Camby, but I don't know the seismic and um, rehab breakdown. Eric may be able to weigh in on that. 30 million total is helpful. Um, can I go back to uh, the temporary neighborhood traffic management? Wasn't the experience with the orange barriers around slow streets that well, um, those temporary barriers or lower cost to install the ongoing uh, management of them ended up being a significant cost. I'm, I'm interested to know why we would be looking at temporary materials for those eight neighborhoods. Certainly, we're, we're kind of working within the constraints uh, of the funding available. And uh, in terms of permanency, there's a spectrum where the water-filled barriers are sort of the, the most temporary, uh, uh, whereas something that involves more capital investment um, would be obviously um, more durable and, and uh, require less operating. Um, but we would be looking to do uh, something that is uh, more durable than the water-filled barriers, uh, but short of a, a permanent implementation. Um, if there's uh, anyone, uh, Paul Storer, on the line who wanted to layer in uh, more detail, uh, please do. Yeah, hi, Paul Storer, Director of Transportation. Um, you know, we've been uh, budgeting on about half a million per neighborhood, and that would mostly be things like gravity barriers. These wouldn't be kind of high maintenance, like the um, orange um, things we had out on the slow, slow streets. Um, but it it wouldn't be kind of the level of uh, treatment that we've done in a lot of the existing um, traffic calming plans we've done over the years, like in the Granby Woodland plan, where we had um, kind of greened, you know, greened uh, diverters and things like that. But we wouldn't think this would be a lot of maintenance funding going into these. Okay. Um. And while we're on the subject, the orange temporary barriers, uh, the funding to make those permanent across the city. It, my understanding is it's not in the capital plan. It was part of the 2022 budget. That's right. That's in our capital budget for this year is okay. to go in through the summer and um, make those slow streets more permanent. Well, put, okay. put in less, put in measures that uh, require less maintenance. Okay. I have one more transportation question and, and arts questions. I'll go back. Thanks. Thank you. Councillor Swanson. Yeah. Um... Thanks for all this amazing work on this. The amount of integration of everything it just seems mind boggling. Can we borrow any more without without risking our credit rating? Um, Councillor Swanson, um, it will be challenging because we have been um, al already maximizing and optimizing, um, balancing the use of pay as you go as well as um, debt financing, but um, and we have really looked into it. Um, right now, we're, we're still at 25% of the capital plan um, is, is using debt financing, so we have already looked into it. So what? What was the last thing you just said? We have already looked into it to try to optimize and maximize the debt borrowing. Um, just one thing to mm -hmm. reiterate is that um, the key limiting factor is that the more we borrow, the more um, challenge and pressure on the operating budget because we need to provide for the debt servicing charges, which is um, in addition to interest and also the principal payment as well. So uh, it will come back um, as the operating budget challenge regardless. Um. At the end of March, we passed a motion about um, getting a report on what it would take to actually meet our housing needs and how we could use the capital plan to do this. And tomorrow we have a report that says we have 86,000 households in need of housing. Um, are we gonna get, when are we gonna get this report? Is it gonna, 
are we going to be able to get it in time to help us make our capital plan decisions? Sandra Singh, General Manager, Arts, Culture, and Community Services. Yes, staff are working on that memo right now, and you will have it in advance of the decision you need to make related to the capital plan. Okay, thanks. Um, I also remember hearing that we were going to get a report on DCL waivers and a possible recommendation to stop granting them for just plain old rental housing. And I wonder if that would increase our revenue a bit if we didn't grant DCL waivers and if that's been factored into anything. Uh, so or if it hasn't been, how much could we get if we did that? Uh, staff will be reporting back as part of the DCL um, update review. So council would have um, uh, uh, would have uh, will be able to make a decision um, in I would say June July ish. So basically, yeah, that will also that can also inform the finalization of the capital plan as well. Okay, and I see there's only 24 million for the SRO replacement strategy, which is supposed to cost a billion dollars. Um, is there, and, and it seems like there's very little budgeted for partner contributions in housing. And I'm just wondering why that's so low, like $12 million for partner contributions. Um, Sandra Singh, general manager, ACCS. Um, in terms of the SRO strategy, yes, it's, it, is, it will be a, a very uh, lengthy strategy. We're anticipating at least 15 years and, and will require significant capital investments from senior government to uh, both federal government and, and the province, uh, in addition to our contributions at the junior level of government to make that happen. And so those discussions are underway and we'll report back to council in the future on that. And in terms of the why you only see 12 million, um, Um, for this capital plan, we, we also kind of learn it from, uh, I mean, for the next capital plan, we're learning uh, the experience from this current capital plan is that instead of basically um, without confirming or without having, a, a, um, I would say, a high level of confidence that we're going to get partner funding, we'd rather not put it in the plan. However, as Patrice said earlier, as, um, as the plan goes along and also when we secure um, additional partner funding, it will be added and adjusted in the capital plan. So you will see that when it is committed. Okay, thanks. Um, then the other thing I was thinking is, geez, it would be nice if we could get, if we could increase the climate fund funding to the needed 500 million um, from the, I think it's 246 that we've got in this. Um, I, does the staff see any options for doing that other than, you know, cutting out swimming pools and stuff? This point, Councillor, we've looked at uh, at options for that, as you know, and uh, the, our our work with senior government is probably our best approach to look at closing that gap. Given the significant size of it, it's very difficult to do with the city existing funding sources. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Councillor Kerr. Yeah, thanks, Mayor. Mayor, I actually have a question that is really more a question of parliamentary procedure. If I sure. could ask that first. Thank you. Um, we have received a number of um, um, emails from fellow councillors who are contemplating amendments to this. Um, and uh, we were advised at the beginning that, that this is for information only, not intended, this meeting not intended to receive amendments. So I'm wondering if there's a process that staff could inform us of I know I'm probably not the only one that has a lot that I could put forward, but is there a process where we could put those forward outside of amendments today that could enable um, information to come back uh, for our contemplation prior to the next plan? I guess that's to the city manager, Mayor. I see the city manager uh, standing, so perhaps I'll ask thanks. for help with that point of procedure. Yeah, thanks, Mayor Stewart. Um, we're certainly happy to take those questions. Appreciate that um, you know this draft plan represents an attempt by staff to balance all the different trade-offs and funding sources before us, and that council may be interested to explore alternatives to this. Um, I think we're, again, happy to take those questions, and as we have, report back to council with the implications of those issues. Um, it's council's option to debate all that here today, but that's not necessary to get the information. Okay, right. I'll take that as a point of procedure. Yeah, so to take, they're, they're happy to take the questions after this meeting. Is that the... That, uh, that that's, seems that's to be, so we wouldn't... Thank you. There's still an option to amend, although we can discuss the amendments if they're brought forward right. and seconded, and that uh, leaves it to debate. So I'll let you go yeah. back. Yeah, to, thank uh, you very much. Appreciate okay, that. Yeah. 
Um, I, what, my first question is very similar to the one asked by Councillor Swanson, which is the upper limit on how much the capital budget, and I assume the borrowing portion of it, can be increased without impacting our credit rating. And the answer to that, it seemed to me like it wasn't very much, but Henry said. Yeah, maybe just to reiterate what Grace said is, is in setting, when we start that with the process, we look at what our, our funding envelope looks like uh, in order to sort of inform the prioritization. So they have looked at what the limit would be without uh, sort, of, sort of triggering that, um, uh, our credit rating. But again, as Grace mentioned, the bigger issue isn't getting the, 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 the debt and borrowing it. It's how do we pay for it? And so it goes back to not so much the financing, but the funding, because either we have to raise taxes or fees or some other type of revenue in order to pay for the debt. So really that's probably our biggest constraining impact. Yes. Yeah, Grace wants to add one more thing. Thank you. Sorry, just one more thing. Um, the one thing that is substantially different um, you know, going forward in the next four years relative to the last 10 years is the interest rate environment. Right now, we're in a very upward trajectory, basically 50 basis point every time when, uh, when, uh, uh, when, when the central bank is actually meeting. So basically, um, I think the whole low interest kind of environment is going to be gone. So again, that goes back to the budget challenge as well going forward. The more we take on, the more money that we're going to pay for interest and, and that kind of thing. Okay. Thanks, I appreciate that. Next question. Um, I really appreciate the list of capital projects that were presented by the Director of Sustainability, Doug Smith. Um, I'm wondering what the process is to calculate the estimated GHG reductions that would be associated with those projects. Uh, so, if I understood the question right, it was, uh, will we will we be reporting out on the GHG reduction of those projects that are right. in the capital plan? Yes. yes. Um, partially. Some of the projects are quite easy to report out, especially around buildings where there's direct uh, cause and effect with green greenhouse gas outcomes. Um, other projects are less... Uh, less accurate. For example, transportation is about a network. A transportation network will lead to a greenhouse gas reduction through our mode split, uh, but one particular piece of transportation infrastructure, it's very difficult to say what the exact impacts of that one bike lane or that bus route will be from a greenhouse gas perspective. Okay, um, so is it possible though that you could do that and then just say estimated for some lines or whatever? It just would be great to see the actual um, cause and effect Yes, we can do that to the best of our ability. Yeah. Okay, that, that would be fantastic. Um, do we have a list of the city buildings that are, cur like, maybe, and the percentage of the buildings, but basically a list, and can that be made public, of how many buildings, what percentage, are near or net zero carbon operationally, including with heat pumps? I was going to ask our, um, our EFM representative, uh, Michelle, to speak to that. Um, we may have to get back to you on a uh, holistic list, but our new, all of our new buildings are um, planned for that. Fire Hall 17, which is just completing, will be net zero. So that that's the goal going forward. Love a list. It would be great so we can keep adding to it. Um, but, but then it's also public and we get a sense also then of the GHG reductions and which buildings are also accessible or could be accessible for the public as safe places to retreat during extreme weather events. Okay, thank you. Um, in my, um, in my, sorry, in, pen, in appendix two, uh, sorry, in page two of appendix A, um, it, the report states that there is a contemplated 20% increase from the 2019 to 2022 capital plan um, for climate emergency action measures and 270 million for additional climate mitigation and adap adaption. You know, my question, it's a different way of framing it from my first one, but if we've dropped 15% um, by 2020, how are we calculating what needs to be spent? I mean, is it the 400 or the 500 million in order to get us to the 50% that we need to get to by 2030? So when we brought the Climate Emergency Action Plan to you back in, in um, 2020, we put together a financial framework saying that over a five-year period, we'd need 500 million. So for a four-year capital plan, it would be 400 million. Uh, we've got 250 million approximately, 246 for this plan. So it, it is 150 million short. Um, 
it, it's not a linear relationship. We've prioritized the highest um, priority projects and the highest greenhouse gas outcome projects. So it doesn't mean we're only going to get 60%. We think we're actually on track. We're going to have to find additional funding for the federal government and from other partners, but we're actually fairly confident that we're, we're getting, we're heading in the right direction at the right speed. Thanks so much. Thank you. Um, I have some questions and they're more of the general type. Uh, just um, talking about the kind of cap on what we have to work with. Uh, one of the slides that you showed had $1.7 billion that we'd be borrowing. And essentially you're suggesting after a lot of toing and froing that that is the kind of cap on, on what we can spend. Is that, would, that would say that's the size of the pie we have to consider? Would that be about right? That's the only thing we can adjust essentially. Yes, we can adjust um, the the debt, but also the um, pay as you go. So we can increase taxes or fees, and and it could be pay as you go finance a funding, or it could be um, supporting debt. I'm just thinking when when we're thinking about funding new capital projects, or uh, accelerating some that have already been approved, it's that 1.7 billion dollars essentially that we're looking at. We can't really change the the, the amount of partnership contributions and and that type of thing. There could be co partnership contributions. What we've included in the plan is, as Ray said, it's sort of what we know of now. Right. But there's going to be many more programs coming through, you know, hopefully in climate and housing. But and usually others, they have, And that would be added. So then we could do like, more. They're not like there's a whole bunch of money. Go spend it how you want. They're usually attached to, to something. Yes. So I, I have in my mind we have this kind of $1.7 billion that's really ours to, to work with. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I guess what I'm trying to get at is that you, as a staff team, uh, have worked to uh, figure out how we slice that pie up, essentially. And I and I do notice from questions today, there's there's other <laughs> pieces that uh, councillors may want to bring in, like for example, a, a new pool somewhere or something like that. But if if we were going to move in one of these projects, we'd have to move out something else. So it's not adding; it's more trading. Is like that's how we're thinking about this. Yes, I, th I think that's um, an accurate summation, both for the renewal, but also for the for the growth. The one thing to anticipate, or and, and that's why I think Councillor Carr, your suggestion to ask ask staff questions to report back is not every dollar is the same. Some have different restrictions. Some, you know, can be funded one way versus another, and so it might not be able to trade specifically. You're definitely trading growth versus renewal, different funding sources, but even within renewal or within growth, there's restrictions. So I think if you ask us to feedback um, your, you know, your trade-offs, we can let you know whether that's viable or not or what the implications would be. I'm just trying to think about things. how... But it, it is a, it, it's a one versus another, yeah. Right, so there are some strings attached to some of the money that we yes, have to be yeah. conscious and, of. And we can help you with that if you say, gee, I'd like to do this instead of that. We I'm just thinking about how... I always think of the decision point and how this stuff hits the floor. So if there's an amendment say to, to say, and, and I'm not picking on the Mount Pleasant pool, but let's say we decide we want to do that, what we'd have to do is take something else out of yes. the plan. And, and and will you be, so if um, if you get suggestions ahead of time from councillors as to things, that, or council, myself even, if things we'd like to add, will you give suggestions on what would be a comparable subtraction from the from the plan? So, some considerations that we could have to make it all balance out? I think we can do our best to do that. We've sort of prioritized based on, on all of the inputs um, and we can let you know if there is something that is a, an equivalent trade-off or areas that you can't really go to, for instance, because there's limitations around the, okay. around the development contributions. The city manager's yeah. thing. Yeah, thanks, Mayor Stewart. One thing, though, that I think building on that that would be very helpful for us is that in making those or exploring those trades, if there are areas that um, members of council would be interested to trade off, having the, that, that um, at least hypothetical trade-off helps us focus. Um, as well as the funding source. So yep. if it's move it from here to there, um, that helps us a lot as opposed to go and find where it could be because that, that's a very difficult position for staff. Yeah, what, I, what I'm worried about is, is at the, the June meeting is that everybody comes with let's add this thing or this, or this, uh, you know, this new addition, but nobody has a subtraction. So then all that does is put pressure on us to in increase the, the pie and what you're saying with increasing interest rates and with uh, pressure on operating budgets, that that could lead to us inflating 
the pie beyond what we can handle, and then we'd be in a position later that we'd have to uh, subtract stuff uh, kind of on an emergency basis. So any suggestions around uh, just building on what the city manager suggests? I see uh, Gracie standing there, so. Yeah, trade uh, trade off ideas and trade off um, uh, um, I would say direction will, will be extremely helpful. The other thing I just want to also reiterate is that this is a capital plan, so this council will approve you know um, this plan, contemplating a certain I would say amount of investment with a certain um, assumptions what the future property tax and also utility fees increase would be, and also the debt borrowing. But all these. Um, the implementation of the capital plan will be done, um, 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 I would say, as part of the annual budget process, which will be subject to um, approval from uh, from the future council. Okay. So basically, even if we were to increase this capital plan by like 50%, doesn't mean that they that will be followed through um, necessarily. So just want to kind of flag that as well. Okay, thanks. Uh, Councilor Domenetto. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, thanks for the... Um, the report it's it's really well done so just thank you for the level of detail that's included in the spreadsheets and everything um i just have a couple of clarifying questions one's with respect to uh the granville street bridge i include see inclusion for um uh maintenance and the seismic upgrade work could you just remind me of um the status of the the further enhancements around the sidewalks and the cycling separated routes and maybe that's not foreseen in this plan i just can't recall i know we had to defer some work Certainly, so the, there is um, a minimum viable option for the um, Granville connector that is part of this capital plan uh, that would carry forward uh, any um, outstanding implementation would carry forward to the next capital plan. And the rehabilitation work um, cited as part of uh, the upcoming capital plan uh, is, is uh, kind of um, uh, over and above that uh, Granville connector work. So can, so for the Granville connector pieces, is. When I'm looking at this, is that included, those enhancements, the sidewalks, the cycling, um, uh, separated cycling path? Correct. That yes. is in this yes. plan. Okay. Correct. Um, okay, that's helpful. I think it's an important piece of work. Um, my other question was asked about the Mount Pleasant Pool. So the, I want to circle back to um, new assets, in particular housing. So you had that pie, and it had uh, $498 million. Can you give me a, just a sense of, of how much of that $498 million is city-funded versus a partner or CAC? Um, I have in my head it's a little more than $300 million, but I, I, don't, I just want to make sure I clearly understand. Um, I would say um, the majority, um, if not all, of the new housing is all funded from development contributions. Um, I would say quite a number of those is actually um, council already approved as part of public hearing and uh, um, uh, rezoning. Those are turnkey housing um, as part of development. So. Okay, fantastic. Um, and then just two more questions. Uh, one is around um, risk assessment. And when um, I know a lot of work goes into um, developing these proposals for council is that do we have a risk matrix that each department uses or um, exercises to determine highest risk projects based on, like there's a set of criteria to determine and then to then evaluate and then, you know, prioritize proposals to council? I'm just thinking in the context of, for example, you know, recently the issue with the pool and more than one pool now. Um, is that, could someone speak to that? Thank you. There is a, a, a detailed uh, asset assessment that happens for each of us in, in engineering as well as in, uh, in facilities that informs that what's brought forward in the priority setting. But if you want more details, we can have uh, Michelle speak to that. Maybe just briefly, because I have one more question. I don't want to run out of time. So yes, I would love a fuller response to that. Thanks. Thanks, Michelle Schulz, uh, Director of Facilities Planning and Development. Um, we have a, a full um, asset database of all our buildings that allows us to um, analyze all the systems within the buildings and do a, a review of them, and that's looked at uh, yearly. The, um, the assets themselves get assessed on a uh, five to seven year rolling basis. Um, and then we um, go in and examine them ourselves. So as, as things come up for renewal, we go and check to make sure whether they're um, safe and how well they're operating. So that um, goes into a, a database that, that um, is called the, the Facilities Condition Index, which helps inform our capital maintenance choices. Um, we also then pair that with working with all the other groups across the city that provide service 
as to how their service levels are working for them in each of those buildings. When we have two things come together, for example, like the Vancouver Aquatic Centre where you know the, the pool is not meeting the current service needs, the building is, is um, getting to be too costly to maintain at the uh, level we would like to keep it at structurally, um, then those things come together to become a high priority in terms of full renewal rather than just continuing to maintain and operate. Thank you. And engineering would have a similar process around street condition and that prioritizes their work as well. Yeah, largely city assets. Okay, that's perfect. Um, my last question is just, I note there's a contingency built into the four-year plan, but um, I guess my question uh, centers around, um, have we been aggressive in our, our estimations around the cost of work um, and largely because of cost escalation that we're seeing in the sectors and we're seeing it, it comes up repeatedly at Metro Vancouver and is have we sort of had that, applied that same lens to, um, and I get that we don't have a crystal ball into the future, but um, it's definitely, it seems- Probably gonna have to leave that uh, answer for, because we're just three seconds left. So, so on the next round, Councillor Dominato, uh, Councillor Weeb. Yeah. Um, okay, good. Perfect. My first question is to Maria, and it's about how are we going to communicate all the strategies in the city of Vancouver that people have worked on, the public, community groups, and have underfunded items? How do we, how are we going to voice to the public that might have been working on a skate strategy for the last three years, dumped hundreds of hours of volunteer work, expecting, right, had it approved in a strategy, and they don't see it funded. So how do we expect to have that communication with the public on all the under, unfunded items and why we're, they're not funded? Yeah, certainly. Thanks for the question, Council. And I think that we'll come back to once we have an approved plan um, after this comes before Council later in the spring um, to kind of suss out piece by piece um, what has and hasn't been approved and doing some work with our various uh, SMEs and business areas to see where there are some risks there in community and figuring out with them what the appropriate um, avenues back are a lot of those will probably be through the stakeholder networks versus broad public channels but we can do that assessment with uh, SMEs once the time comes okay are we going to be connecting with community groups who have been working on some of these projects prior to know what isn't fun and funded so they can advocate for projects or not or how do we know that they missed an opportunity because something they've worked on they didn't realize this was the opportunity to get it into the budget yeah, so we have a pretty broad scale um, communications approach attached to the draft capital plan as I outlined earlier. Certainly if there's specific community by community work that we might be not be broadly aware of, um, we could work with the subject matter areas to go to those. But I'd, I'd, it would be helpful to have a, like a list from you of what you were okay. thinking of there. Like some like obviously the washroom strategy is a big one. A lot of people have worked on it. I don't see any funding for the washroom strategy in the capital budget. Um, when you look at the line items in the report today. So there's ones like that. Um, my next one's to the climate team. Um, our urban forest canopy is to talk about doubling street tree density in below average neighborhoods, recognizing the heat domes and other work we've had. I've recognized in your big move six, in your presentation, you said that we are going to slow down street trees, new street trees. Yet other cities around the world are doing the exact opposite, recognizing the heat dome effect and how trees help with a climate emergency. So can you talk about why we're slowing down our street tree program when we have significant neighborhoods, mostly on the downtown east side, that are under 10% urban forest cover and are really critical to our equity mapping that we've been doing at Parkport and in the city? Um, yes, so it, it's a less than ideal situation. I agree with you that um, not putting in new street trees is, is unfortunate, but it's a, it's a balancing act with other priorities in the plan, uh, both on the climate side and with on the, the climate uh, adaptation side. Um, putting in new street trees in new street locations is, is expensive. They require significant root barriers. So um, from a, a bang for the buck perspective, it is tricky and we're right now we're just budgeted to replace existing trees that are dying. Okay, so how do we balance this capital budget with approved strategies? Like on the website, it says double street trees by 2030. So for me, it's, there's a lot of elements in this, expand greenways by this much. There's a lot of things we've approved, we're excited about, we tell the public we're doing, but then we're not, it doesn't look like we'll be delivering on the strategies. Local food action plans, another one. There's a bunch that, the accessible city strategy that we've approved and the public has gone behind it. We put out press releases on Resilient City. But right now I'm nervous that there's a lot of unfunded items in there. And so how do we rectify that in our communication? 
Um, I'll, I'll let Patrice answer the broader question, but yeah. just a little deeper on the trees. Uh, not to say we're not putting in any new trees in. There are projects for street reconstruction. There's developments that are occurring which are allowing us to put in new trees, just not at the rate we were before. Um, and there is a federal funding uh, opportunity that we're going to be pursuing to looking for funding for trees as well. Okay. Five hundred and forty new trees through green infrastructure work. That's that's in the budget. I mean, we're going to lose. Um, yeah. We can we can have that conversation, but as we've seen other cities planting significant trees to have five hundred new, when we're probably losing over five hundred, is not really kind of the bold moves that we're hoping in climate emergency. But we can have that talk later. Um, I guess for me, it's there's a lot of good stuff in the capital plan, but it's really understanding what's not in here and how do we really prioritize that. So can you talk maybe a little bit, I've got 20 seconds, but how the communication, like how are we really going to talk about this to the public? Because to mm -hmm. me, it's really, it's really difficult to go through the amount of work that goes into strategies and then not being able to fund a skate spot for a group or one of them. I'm going to have to wait for your next round for that, Councilor Reeve, because you just have eight, eight seconds and it's already to be uh, cruel to councillors. I, I just need to keep us on, on time here and keep you within your time limits. You got it, Councilor Fry. Thanks. Um, okay, so first question is uh, so generally on the idea of the plebiscite questions. And is there an opportunity to say, like riffing off Councillor Weeb's concept about the trees, say, ask the public, would you be willing to pay more additional taxes to plant a thousand trees or five thousand trees? Do we have that flexibility within the plebiscite to have a, a nice to have option? I think just to start, that would probably be a better question for the public engagement, but um, Grace can speak to the requirements of the plebiscite. Um, I don't believe we have ever um, borrowed money to plant trees. So, I mean, that's one thing. Because the plebiscite questions, those are for borrowing specifically. It is not for the entire capital plan. But I guess your question is, if we want public input in terms of are is the public willing to pay more property tax or some other fees to plan this then that is not um, a plebiscite question that probably is a public engagement question that we can pose interesting so plebiscite is specifically bound to a borrowing question correct and also non-utility borrowing authorities interesting but we could ask it as a as a plebiscite question and then public engagement would you be willing to pay more taxes to pay for that borrowing the debt servicing um Put it this way, I, I have not considered using borrowing to pay for planting trees, but I think we need to get trees back to Trees as an know. example, it could be, yeah. <laughs> you know, skate parks too. I, yeah. Just putting it out there, thinking outside the box a little. Yeah, we can report back on that. Yeah, like that. Okay. Because ideally your questions in the plebiscite are related to the capital plan that you approve, right? Uh, as opposed to new questions outside of the capital plan. So it's, the order is important. Okay, so maybe that is a great question to riff into my next question for Maria, which is is really around the idea of, of how much um, does this engagement that we'll, we'll be going into, it, does it inform, the, is it testing the assumptions or is it, will it actually inform changes in the final plan? Or are we pretty much, the draft is the draft moving forward? Yeah, I mean, the draft is pretty constrained in terms of how much money is committed to various things. Um, the engagement that we're doing is at a pretty high level along 10 specific questions that will be brought back to council so you can see what the public has said in terms of where there may be wiggle room, where there's been a ton of feedback about a certain thing for you to maybe make alterations in the final plan you approve. But as you've seen through the presentations from staff, a lot of this funding is pretty constrained and committed to various things. So. Um, for that that wiggle room piece if you yeah. will and, and and could we have started this engagement earlier sooner to better inf so you know the, the critique yeah. that it's so just we like started the, the public education phase back at the start of March to kind of kind of set the stage for what this is and to talk about people even in broad strokes what a capital plan is because as you can imagine awareness of what these things are and how complex they are is, is fairly low um, I don't think within the constraints of staff developing the capital plan, going out any sooner would have been possible. We're really tracking to the first day we can. Okay. Thanks. Councillor, if, oh, if I could just uh, add, I think your question um, in some respects as I'm interpreting also depends or is pertaining to what's the size of the pie that we're working with here, back to use the mayor's analogy. I would say that's really a question for the next council because it's the next council that's going to be determining the tax rates. And if this plan doesn't satisfy the needs of the public or the aspirations of the next council, the decisions on uh, obtaining additional revenue would really be made there. 
So I, I think this council, I mean, we would really encourage this council to work with the envelope that we've articulated now, which is based on a set of assumptions. The next council could change those. Um, but I, I, I would suggest spending a lot of time revising those assumptions with this council um, is, is may undermine the utility of the plan for the next four years. So that's the worry that we have. Yeah. And, and again, this is a plan within this envelope, but um, the plan can change over the four years and, and it really becomes solidified in the, in the annual budget, right? So just as this council has changed things over the four years from the original plan that, that came to them. Okay, and so looking forward, and obviously we haven't approved the Broadway plan, for instance, yet, but as I look at some of the community benefit kind of infrastructure pieces like the, the Fire Hall Library, the Kitsilano Library are both pretty aged and we're talking about significant, where would funding for new facilities and community centers and parks and that kind of thing along the Broadway corridor, is that four years out potentially? It could be depending on the, the development along Broadway because once council approved the Broadway plan, it will take some time for development to trickle in and in particular for new and expanded asset, they will be almost 100% funded from development contributions. So depending on the timing of the development co uh, contribution coming in, that, that will be the time when we can add to the plan if it is within the next four years or it will be like the follow um, the, the, um, I would say that the next plan as well. So we might have a challenge if we went with a rental focus that had no DCL contributions, for instance. Um, that, that is a trade-off that council would need to make, for sure. Thank you. Uh, I think we're on our second round now. So we've got uh, Councillor Kirby Young up for uh, five minutes. Yeah, thanks. I have a couple of follow-up questions. And the first one I want to ask is about the Fire Hall Art Center. Um, and I know that that is unfunded. I think the line items around 12 and a half million in this capital plan. I had an opportunity to been there and attended shows there, but to tour it recently. And it's pretty dire shape in terms of um, it's um, just the physicality inside the building, but the accessibility artists um, can't even um, you know, sort of easily use a washroom or enter or, or participate in any of the public areas. It um, doesn't provide any accessibility, doesn't meet requirements for actors. Um, I know that there's no provision here, but the study has been done. Is there, are there any opportunities within this plan to potentially prioritize the Fire Hall Art Center renewal? Yes, um, this is actually one of those projects that we will be reporting back potentially with options for council to consider as part of the, um, I'll say the July final um, capital plan report. And can you expand a little bit, Grace, on, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me, on what that means in terms of options? Is it trade-offs? Um, is it looking for alternate funding, you know, capital applications for capital support as well from senior levels of government? Like, what's sort of the scope of... I would say all of the above. Yeah, because uh, okay. as the city manager just um, uh, alluded to, basically the financial, um, I would say the funding envelope is really, um, we have already really stretched. So basically it's really about engaging senior governments, which I know that there is a path forward for that. And Sandra is going to talk about them. Thank you, um, Sandra Singh, GMACCS. Yeah, I think this is one of those interesting projects where um, there's an opportunity with senior government. So we do have um, an expression of interest from the feds, for example. They've, uh, they've indicated that this is a compelling project for them and that they would, uh, if it were to move forward, that there would be an opportunity for us to land some, some cultural spaces or uh, Canadian uh, federal funding on this project. And so um, this is one of those ones where um, through the plan, we, we may have opportunity to advance it. Okay, that's good to hear. So we should hang tight and hopefully have some more info before council has to finally approve the plan. Um, appreciate that. Um, with respect to fire halls, we heard a lot about two or three specific fire halls. And I know that in the early discussions, it was difficult to make an allocation given the constraints. And we've got uh, some allocation here for planning of two fire halls. Um, Yelltown was mentioned, uh, the Canby corridor was. Can you speak to how much those discussions have been advanced and if we have any ability to deliver a fire hall in this next capital plan or just to initiate planning? I think it's about $2 million per line item for two fire halls. Uh, we are working really hard on um, at least um, advancing one of the two fire halls. Um, basically, there, there there are some sort of co-location opportunities. So um, as part of the report back in July, we will provide you with options as well. But um, yeah, one of yeah one of the fire halls, um, um, which is the one in Yaletown, we we are actively working on the timing of that as well. Okay, so kind of similar to the fire hall art center. More more info to come. That one's a live discussion. Is that fair to say? Correct. Okay. 
Thanks. Um, and then another comment, I wonder if you can sort of speak generally because um, the best laid plans, as they say in life, um, are put together and then life happens. Um, and while we're in the middle of contemplating this plan, um, we saw the significant issues of the extreme weather events at Kitts Pool. Um, and I'm wondering if you can talk in general terms how we handle a situation um, where you have um, a significant issue with a really utilized asset like that, but yet you haven't contemplated um, an allocation in an upcoming capital plan. Yeah, maybe I will uh, ask Erin uh, on the line from Park Board. Are you there, Erin Embley? I just have a minute left, so should I come back on for that answer? Staff aren't available? Maybe, yeah, that might be better. Okay. Oh, okay. One second, no. It's pool oh, right. I'm, lo I'm losing a third of my time here, so is there somebody or no? If not, I'll come back on. Yeah. Um, Michelle Scholl's um, facilities planning and development. Um, I understand right now uh, Kitts Pool is being looked at by engineers to understand the extent of the damage to see whether it, it can be repaired or whether it needs um, a, a more fulsome replacement. So until we um, have that information, we really can't come back with anything further and, and we're hoping that it's in the, in the status of repair. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, Councillor Boyle. Thanks so much. Um, I uh, also had a, a, a the same question as Councillor Kerb Young about the fire hall. So really appreciate hearing more about staff's thinking and uh, that will that will hear back on that. I had a couple other questions as well about the um, letter that Council received from the Arts and Culture Advisory Committee about uh, funding. Um, promised funding to culture shift and the gaps that exist in this proposed capital plan. So I'm wondering if staff can speak a bit more to that, both around um, the Chinatown grants and partnerships, as well as the Vancouver Cultural Spaces Fund and Cultural Land Trust, what is proposed in here and what the gaps are and what we might be able to do to, to um, fill those gaps. Um, thank you, Councillor Sandra Singh. Yes, there are uh, th those two um, those two lines in the capital plan right now. Currently, the, um, the Chinatown Grants and Partnerships is currently allocated one million, and uh, and we had uh, identified the need for about five million over four years. So that does remain a gap, and uh, and it will impact our work um, around uh, cultural heritage pre preservation and the work uh, to advance the UNESCO application. And, um, and with the Cultural Spaces Fund, it is, uh, uh, that, is, um, that is not uh, identified in the, um, in the plan. Uh, there's a cultural infrastructure grant. Oh, sorry. Yeah, there's cultural infrastructure grants at a five million. Um, and uh, it's a reduction of one million from the previous plan. So there are, there are some uh, gaps in the plan in terms of... Um, in terms of funding those, I think that uh, I think that is that same discussion that you've been having with Paul and Patrice and Grace around uh, trade-offs and prioritization. And, and do you have a sense um, among those gaps of if council isn't able to um, fill all of them, where the highest need or priority would be? Glass Brown is Lob Henselman, our managing director of cultural services. Just Thanks. Thank you, Councilor Bill Bernstein, Hands on Managing Director of Cultural Services. So, um, as we had actually done a, a very hard exercise of the prioritization, we've identified that the Chinatown funds uh, would actually be our number one priority, um, in part because of the important work, particularly around UNESCO and revitalization of Chinatown. Um, having said that, um, on the cultural land trust specifically, one of the pieces that we need to contemplate is actually uh, um, alleviating the burden of maintenance and ongoing capital investment in, um, in community facilities that would be um, presented to us as an opportunity through uh, the land trust itself. And so there is another trade-off in addition to the general trade-offs that, we, that we've been talking about here. I hope um, that answers the question. Yeah, that's helpful information. Thank you. Uh, my last question is around um, Gas Town, and I'm wondering where we are in the plans for a car-free or car-light Gas Town. 
Thank you for the question, Margaret Whit Whitkins Engineering. Um, so the, this capital plan anticipates um, um, first and foremost responding to some of the urgent works required uh, to rehabilitate um, some of the core area around uh, Carroll Street, uh, Trounce Alley, Maple Tree Square. Um, concurrent to that process, we would be looking at undertaking um, kind of the, the more fulsome planning design for the broader area, um, anticipating a flexible design for Water Street that would uh, enable um, uh, different uh, potential futures around uh, the role of the car. Okay, um, and in that more short-term um, upgrade work, are we looking at uh, at surfaces that are m more wheelchair friendly than some of the current um, pretty raggedy cobblestone? Certainly accessibility will be uh, a key consideration in the design. Okay, great, glad to hear it. Um, were we, and I, I'm just um, asking in anticipation of an amendment I saw circulated, were we to try to do all of that work um, in this capital plan, do we, ha would we have time? Do we have the plan, enough of the plan in place that we could do that larger uh, flexible space upgrade as you say? Uh, as well as the planning, all, all in the the next capital plan timeline? When we look at the needs in Gastown, we see that it will need to span um, multiple capital plans. Um, the full scope that we had identified for this capital plan is 20 million, and currently there is 7 million of that funded, uh, which accounts for the urgent need uh, and the initiation of uh, the planning uh, and design um, uh, for the broader works. Uh, the remaining 13 million identified for this capital plan would enable um, some um, additional work to be done on the rehabilitation along Water Street with the completion of that to be uh, uh, done in the subsequent capital plan. Thanks very much. Uh, Councillor Hartwick. Thanks. Um, I'm going to shift gears a little bit. Um, it, it's clear in, in the uh, that recent capital plans have been increasingly moved into areas that are not municipal responsibility. And um, the question it, to, to staff is, what is their strategy for funding those projects in this plan and how is that different from prior planning processes and how much of the plan funding do you put into that category? There was a memo, Patrice, that you put out um, in December of last year on uh, city funds allocated to downloaded services that have been traditionally delivered by senior governments. So. How are you treating those um, and how have they been allocated in this budget? Um, the majority of it, um, when we look at the capital plan, I would say the two key areas that is most obvious will be housing and childcare. So as you can see for housing, the majority of the, the new asset, they're funded from development contributions. So I would say that basically this strategy um, changes quite a bit over the last decade because originally we typically um, provide land um, and then we expect um, or wait for a senior government um, to provide funding and financing to, to build housing on our land. Um, over the last 10 years, because of the housing crisis. So we started using development contribution to pay for the construction of it, which you can see in the in-kind turnkey um, uh, uh, contributions. So basically, again, um, council can definitely um, direct staff to maybe consider changing the strategy and go back to the previous model, which is just basically making land available and wait for senior government to, to finance and fund the construction side of things. This is totally within council's jurisdiction. And another path is that um, in June, um, staff will report back on um, the DCL review. So um, that is another area that if council um, feels strongly about um, adjusting the allocation of DCL going towards both housing and childcare, um, council can definitely let staff know as well. So the largest single component of this capital budget um, outside of the norm is the housing component. Is that accurate? On, on the growth side, the housing is the largest proportion. Yeah. Yes. Right. Um, have you taken into consideration in this business model the impact on land inflation? Um, 
I, I understand this has been um, a, a question that you have been raising. So I think that is more than, um, I would say, turnkey housing. I think your question is more about um, adding density. So this capital plan is not about adding density, but this is to reflect as a result of adding density, then we get the turnkey housing. So um, I, I, I get your question, but that is not part of the capital plan consideration. Well, it, it is because we've set the targets that we've built the business model around. Uh, but that answers my question. So it, um, this, this capital budget could be brought more in, in line with uh, historical norms were it not for these additional areas that, as we've identified in, the, in your earlier memo, Patrice, have been downloaded from senior levels of government. So that was just really, I just wanted to confirm that. So thank you very much. That's good. Thank you. Uh, Councillor, we have about 14 minutes left and four councillors left on uh, you. So I'll just uh, go ahead, Councillor Kerr. Yeah, uh, Mayor, if I could move um, to extend the meeting past five to, con to finish the, um, uh, the speakers list. Speakers list? Well, no, I'm not, I mean, not the speakers list, the um, questioning list. Okay, so to finish council questions. Okay, yes. we have a seconder for that. Um, can we amend that to complete this item there? Uh, there are a whole bunch of amendments and uh, a bunch of speakers, and there'll be questions. So uh, if somebody seconds it, we could amend. Anybody want to second that amendment? I don't hear anybody seconding, so uh, we'll take a vote on the... Uh, on the extending here from uh, remainder of council questions, all in favor? Aye. Any yeah. opposed? Okay. So, uh, sorry, Councilor Carr, please. Uh, yeah, that was a, a point of procedure, and I my little timer was know, going. There. Thank you. Um, so, what is the current intelligence um, on federal provincial funding sources uh, that, uh, um, uh, and, and especially what what do they target? in capital projects that we would want to see or that would amplify our funds in the capital plan? We, we are actively pursuing the Disaster Mitigation and Adaptation Fund. That is a huge one that we really want to augment our, um, um, yeah, basically is, is to augment our climate emergency and also um, um, mitigation type kind of work. And I think even early on when we talk about planting trees, that is actually one of the um, federal a funding source that can actually help us to do that as well. So um, just want to flag that. That's one of the examples. Mm, that's great. I love it. Trees to mitigate. Um, okay. Um, and what about, uh, I know it's a, 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 I know I've been asking a lot of issues on climate, but in housing, um, what are the opportunities um, that, I mean, it's, it's in the federal budget, but it's very vague. So what do we see the opportunity there as? Right. Um, in particular, I think in addition to the provincial government, uh, we have been working with BC Housing on their CHF program. Basically, it's really um, delivering really deeply affordable uh, units with 20% of the units at shelter rate and also 50% of the units at hills. So that's like um, a hugely affordable. Um, on, at the federal level, we also have been participating in uh, shaping up the new program called a housing accelerator fund. Um, that basically is to, I would say, incentivize delivery of um, housing. And um, there, there, there's some sort of formula to say that if you're delivering affordable housing, you will be incentivized and kind of help us to kind of move that along. So those are some of the examples, um, not just the existing funding and also some sort of new funding streams as well. This is something that we're pursuing. Happy to see that work. That's great. Um, in terms of private sources of funds, is there something that I'm not government related, but other sources? Um, I'm thinking of PACE financing, uh, for example. Um, are we pursuing accessing that so that, I mean, those would be private, but they certainly would achieve, achieve an objective of ours? Absolutely. <laughs> uh, we have been trying to do that. And, and as you are aware, I think it was like 2014 or even before that, we because we couldn't get the legislative change in our Vancouver Charter, that's why we did a roundabout way, kind of like a pace equivalent, but it was really, really ch challenging in terms of the uptake. Um, right now, my understanding is that um, at the provincial level, it seems like there's a lot more interest in doing that. And if and when they're willing to basically um, give local government, be it in the Vancouver Charter and also the community charter to allow us to do that, um, that could be a huge opportunity in particular uh, on the, um, I would say, um, building uh, energy retrofit uh, on private properties. That's, that's great. It would be really helpful at some point to have a list of the um, kinds of programs that we are. So if any of us have conversations with provincial or federal ministers or staff, <laughs> we could, uh, um, we could uh, certainly encourage those things happening sooner. Um, I noticed that in the operating budget, um, 
that we had specific consideration of investments that overlap into the capital budget. Um, so my final question is just really around how that overlap is going. So for example, um, it, it, do we include in the capital plan power drops for community events and the film industry? Question, Margaret Witkins, Engineering. Um, so the draft capital plan does include some uh, additional funding for power drops, events, food trucks, and uh, a variety of uses that rely on electrification. Um, and so the current draft has uh, 4.5 million, which would enable um, roughly uh, about like 35 to 40 uh, connection types. Uh, and uh, typically we look to optimize those locations so that they can serve uh, a number of needs, um, whether that's uh, for uh, electrification for bikes or for food trucks or for events. Um, we co-locate them in areas of high need. Great for you for having that data right there at your fingertips um, or in your head. Um, in terms of city equipment, zero emission landscaping equipment and uh, zero emission vehicles, is, is that also in the plan? Uh, yes, it is. I mean, the, it's part of the capital replacement program for the fleet and everything that we essentially can buy at this point that is zero emission, we are buying. And we, as, as per a motion that was put forward uh, earlier this year, we will be uh, putting together a landscaping equipment sort of policy, uh, um, uh, policy for council's consideration next year. Okay, a final point, uh, walking cycling connection to Vancouver schools. Uh, Margaret Witkins. Um, so the uh, cycling connections to schools are covered through a variety of programs. Uh, we have a school-oriented program that aims to serve around three to six schools uh, annually. Uh, and then we also look to ensure that we're addressing the needs of schools as part of our other uh, active transportation uh, and cycling programs um, to maximize those connections. Thank you, Thank you. very much. Councillor Dijanova. Thanks. I will keep it short because I I know we're uh, maybe moving over time here, but we also have speakers afterwards. Uh, I'm just wondering if staff can confirm how much money uh, or how much funding we have currently in the reserves for the capital plan. Well, you'd probably have to get back to you on that because there's a number of different reserves that can fund capital, including CECs and the empty homes tax, et cetera. So maybe we can come back to you with which ones are okay. reserved. I was specifically, that would be great. Another question is maybe um, what funding do we have available in reserves that could fund projects like the ones the mayor was alluding to when he asked the question mm -hmm. about funding and how large the pie is. I understand that this is what we currently have in front of us, but I also understand that we have uh, a significant amount of funding in our reserves, funding that at the time you know that we approve projects and that comes forward from CACs those are cash CACs that people expect to see delivered in their community so it would be great to have that information if possible before we have to make a decision this evening thank yeah. you and that, that's a key part of developing the plan is utilizing those reserves um, and any reserves that would be available we would be incorporating into the plan unless there is some restriction or mismatch between the funding and and the, the assets so we can report back but we that's kind of the this is the key part where we look at utilizing those reserves absolutely thanks would you be able to have that information for us when we come back yes thanks so much Councillor Weep. Yeah, um, yeah, the information would be great on how much we have in different reserves, like park acquisition and others, to know where we can go. It'd also be good to have a list of kind of the, what is in this capital budget that's gonna be funded next capital budget. I know that's something that's coming forth, and so it'd be nice to just, for the public to be like, this is being funded, this is being funded, because sometimes we're looking in this one, we're missing something, but it's actually being funded in the current one. So it's good that that's coming. My last one is we talked about if we had to remove items. It is really difficult for elected official right now to look at this and know what we can remove because of the difficulty on what funding that is and what it's not. So um, like one of the ones, we know Metro Vancouver's made significant investments in new regional recycling and they've talked about an opportunity to explore using um, Metro Vancouver to take over the Vancouver South Transfer Station. And I see there's millions of dollars in capital infrastructure for that project and there's ability to work with Metro to take on some of those responsibilities. So 
how how do we have conversations about how do we move some of this money to different partners or different groups so that we can expand money? You want to answer specifically on the transfer station or? Transfer, it's just, I mean, for me, it's these, I much want larger conversations because I don't want to go into the details. So that's one I think staff is going to respond to in an email, which is yeah. fine. But um, just how, one, yeah. One of the pieces I would add is there is in the detail for each of those projects, it shows you the funding source. So how much is from reserves you can see in the detail, all of the reserve funding. And just as far as giving you some sort of control as within renewal, transferring between renewal, but not transferring between renewal and growth and then within growth. So within funding source, is if you wanted to look and say what is viable, that, that information is there. I mean, we can help you with that as well. Okay, course. I think it's a little more complex than that because we knew last time we're like, okay, why don't we take a million and a half and do the Douglas Park Community Center? And it wasn't that easy because it had to be certain growth and what is growth, so. Yes, um, there's limitations. Okay, yeah, so the, having this information back for the next time would be great. Thank you very much. Councillor Fry. Uh, yeah, so, uh, um, I guess, uh, uh, thinking back to when we, we had that comparative chart and it showed that, um, developer contributions had dropped by 18% from the last capital plan, what, what is, what is the root of, of that? Mm -hmm. Is that a sustainable kind of, um, deficit in DCL contributions? Yeah. I mean, Grace will add to this, but if you recall when we did the midterm update, we had actually brought the development contributions down from what was in the original plan. So um, it was re it was responding to the economic situation, right, and the delay in, in development. So we look at those trends. And so that was adjusted down. And then the, the, um, Grace can comment on how we calculate the amount that we put available in this plan. If it becomes higher or lower, we adjust the plan accordingly. Um, correct. Um, actually, um, when we look at the current plan, at the very start, I think in particular certain areas, park is one of those, that they actually has a sizable, um, um, I would say, um, DCL kind of in the reserve. That's why at that time we said that, you know what, maybe this is the time that you need to kind of really ramp up your land acquisition strategy within the current plan to use up that um, the, the money that is in the reserve. So, um, however, once it's down, then we are going back to the more normal historical kind of trending for DCL coming in. So that's one of the key examples why when you see park, actually there, may, it, it appears to be a dip, but essentially it's not. It's just kind of like in the current plan, we expedite the use of the reserve money instead of just kind of like lay, lay, putting it in a bank and basically land value Keep go, keeps going up and our interest is not really kind of compensating. Okay, okay. Well, that, that's, so you're not concerned with it as a trend necessarily. It's not. Um, to be honest, going back to, I think, an earlier comment, we don't have a crystal ball, but the, the what we have learned from the current plan is that if we are way too optimistic and then we basically, I would say, increase the plan and then midterm we have to reduce the plan, that is even tougher. But if we try to be more realistic in the expectation and when money comes in, we can add to the plan, that is a lot more, I would say, more palatable in a way. I like the way you think, Grace, thank you. Um, as far as uh, infrastructure deficit, I mean, we've, we've heard that the last decade plus, we weren't contributing, it was supposed to be something like one to 1 1.5% infrastructure renewal. And, and, and we, we've lagged and we're still not really caught up to that kind of metric. Is that a is that an exponential kind of so if if we're supposed to be doing one percent but we've lagged for a decade does it become one point one percent how does that work out as an exponential equation is it getting bigger and bigger correct it will get bigger and bigger I think that is the reason why for us in addition to saying that we need to keep increasing the funding envelope to really focus and target renewal and capital maintenance the other the other side of the equation is can we limit the growth of our asset base? Because when we are not even keeping up with maintaining what we have on the ground and we keep adding to the base, then that will even be more exponentially growing. So I think that's basically, we need to do a two-pronged two approach and be creative in terms of how can we partner with other maybe government agencies or with our community partners to deliver um, services without us owning and operating everything. So I mean, that is one of those kind of, I would say, business model transformation ideas that we need to push forward. Okay, so then lastly, on that same sort of theme, as we look to places like the, the Fire Hall Theater, which we're, we're hearing is, is really in trouble as far as maintenance and, and, and degradation of the asset. Is that kind of a concern that if we don't, does that factor in your metrics when you, when you do an analysis of where we should be putting these capital spends? Like, if we don't fix this now, it's gonna be even worse in 10 years or we'll have to just sell the thing off or, or whatever. Um, this is part of the facility kind of about the risk assessment, which 
which um, I would say which building or which property actually has a, a bigger impact for not moving forward with the, the capital maintenance and also renewal. But Michelle, do you want to add to that? Or? I, I think that, yeah, that, that's the response. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, well, that's it for me for questions then. Okay. Council, we're just at 5.02, so we are going to break for dinner. Just before I do that, though, I want to remind you uh, we have to get through uh, this item. Then we do the uh, property tax distribution. We uh, have bylaws. We have a number of motions that come forward to be introduced. We have uh, notice of council members' motions, new business. So there is still quite a lot uh, to do. Uh, we're coming back at 6 o'clock, but I just remind you, I know these questions are important because this is a big item. Um, but uh, just to keep in mind, we'd like to get done by 10 o'clock this evening and uh, so we can get on to the standing committee tomorrow. So thank you very much, everybody, and uh, we'll be Mayor, back at I 6. Mayor, I had a question. Didn't Councillor Carr move to hear the three speakers before we break? No, she didn't. No, speakers will come back after 6. Oh, okay. Thanks for the clarification. Yeah. Thanks. So we'll be back at 6 o'clock. Thanks very much.
Welcome to TELUS Conferencing. Testing, testing. Denise, can you hear me? Hello, yes, I can hear you. Well, cool, thanks.
speakers now. So, uh, Council, I'm just going to call this meeting to order. We do have um, enough members for, for quorum. Uh, we did uh, go through two rounds of questions to staff on the capital budget, and now we're going to hear from the public. Uh, we have three members that are registered to speak, and I am going to start with uh, speaker number one, <coughs> Tom Bickley. Yes, uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. Can you hear me all right? Sure can. Thanks for calling in tonight. Uh, please go ahead up to five minutes. Thank you very much. So. Uh, I'm an individual and a resident of Vancouver, and uh, I put myself down as opposed to receiving this report. Um, I don't really want to be opposed, but I'm opposed for one big reason that I want to tell you about. Um, and for a bit of context, so I'm a lawyer and I'm a scientist, and I uh, work in the uh, innovation economy. Uh, so I work with clean tech companies, uh, startups, and life science startups. So I'm a fairly technical guy and uh, I'm a resident of the record in Point Grey where I'm a uh, long-term renter out here in Point Grey. Okay, so the one big reason that I'm opposed uh, to uh, receiving this report on the capital plan is that there's one big number missing. And I've been through all 84 pages of it and I heard your uh, excellent discussion and excellent staff presentation just now. Uh, you're obviously um, extremely uh, good and well-researched plan, but the big number that's missing is the embodied carbon cost of the plan. Okay, the embodied carbon cost of the plan. How many megatons of carbon dioxide is this plan going to release to build our city? And I'm pretty sure you all understand uh, what embodied carbon cost is. Um, and just to review, uh, this council, you guys are leaders on this, and uh, you've been studying this for years. There is an operational carbon cost of running our city. So those are the issues mainly like transportation and heating, which we measure on an annual basis. And when you have questions like, um, you know, a zero emissions buildings, um, that's the, the operating cost, operating carbon cost of those buildings is zero. That's what we're aiming for on the operational side. But the embodied carbon cost that I'm asking about are the emissions from manufacturing of materials that go into our city. So, uh, you know, when we drive a car, uh, drive a Tesla down the road, uh, you, we're all aware that the uh, we're not using a liquid fuels. So for every kilometer, we're saving about four kilograms of carbon because we're running on electricity uh, and we're not uh, putting four kilograms of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. But what about the materials in that Tesla? Okay, the steel and the plastic and the glass, all those materials have a carbon cost. And we call that an embodied carbon cost. And uh, so just for further comparisons, because this is going to get very relevant to this, uh, to this capital plan, if uh, I were to fly to Toronto, uh, the carbon cost of that trip would be 400 kilograms of carbon dioxide. And when I look out my window here at, uh, at the sidewalk on the street uh, out front of my house, there's two small sections that need to be replaced out there. They're crumbling. Um, and those two small sections is going to be about the same. 400 kilograms of carbon dioxide. That's the embodied carbon cost of the cement, uh, of the concrete that's going to go into the, uh, the two sections of sidewalk. So I like what you've got in the plan. You've aligned it with the Climate Emergency Action Plan, and I heard uh, Councillor Carr ask that excellent question, what are the estimated GHG reductions? And I know you're looking into that. Uh, and that'll, uh, that'll be a, a really good question to have. But that's primarily the operational carbon cost. And uh, what I think it's just a failure not to include the full embodied carbon cost because for sidewalks, I see we've got 1.9 kilometers of new sidewalks in the plan. Okay, and, hold on. Uh, so, yes. Yeah. Sorry, uh, somebody had their microphone on. Uh, please ask folks to mute while we're while we're hearing speakers. Thank you. Go ahead, speaker. Okay, uh, I, I just to, to quickly finish up. I think um, you can uh, calculate the embodied carbon cost. Someone on the staff 
And there are a hundred people on your staff, I know this, who can do this much better than I can. Uh, I'm just a citizen uh, here saying that they could count up all the buildings, the, the sewers that you're laying down, the roads that you're laying. Uh, there was a question about the Canby Bridge earlier and the seismic upgrade. Well, how many tons of steel are going into that? And what is the carbon cost of building our city? Now, let me say the benefits to you uh, are, are extremely valuable. I, I think maybe we could accept this um, uh, plan and uh, if simply with a question to, um, to the staff, maybe if one of the councillors would ask the staff, what is the embodied carbon cost? The benefits are this, accountability. We are at the no five minutes. Uh, thank you. We do have yeah. Councillor Carr with questions for you though. Uh, go ahead, uh, Councillor Carr. Yeah. Thanks. I was just uh, um, thank you very much for coming to speak, and um, uh, and I do think that over the long haul we absolutely have to look at embodied, embodied carbon. Carbon, and I don't know if you were listening earlier, but um, staff did talk about uh, um, uh, uh, moving forward with requiring embodied, embodied carbon. It wasn't on this report; it was an earlier report. Um, uh, so and and, re and reductions in that. Um, but I'm sorry, failing, I can't quite hear you. Failing, failing the, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, so failing the ability to actually calculate all that, um, uh, would you agree that, um, that at least moving towards the eventual um, calculation of embodied carbon along with reductions in actual GHGs uh, would be a good idea? So if it can't, if the, information is not available right now do you really think we should hold up the plan in order to um to get those those calculations tom digby are you um there Mayor? I'm here. I don't think Tom Digby's here anymore. So, Chair, uh, Chair oh. the clerk, uh, he's still on the line. Okay. Sorry, I, I, talk I, I, I did lose. I, I did lose Councillor Carr's question there. Um, okay. Are you asking if we not to hold up the current plan so that we can uh, we can go with just the GHD reductions? Well, and wait for. Well, I mean, the, the point is, yes. Do you think that the, you're saying that you wouldn't want us to approve the plan unless there was calculations of embodied carbon? But we're already asking for. Um, um, well, yeah, I, I, uh, I, I think the staff does have enough information to do this for you. And this is a huge opportunity for leadership for this council. Um, there is, uh, it, I, you have the understanding and capacity to do this. And it was, you know, I've seen that you are the first city in the world to disclose the climate risks in your financial plan. And we could do this with the embodied carbon costs. You would be the first city in the world, but I think you are beautifully positioned to be the city to do that. Certainly, I can commit to you to asking staff the question. Great. Okay. Anything else, Councillor Carr? Nope, that's it. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, really appreciate you calling in, Speaker. Um, thanks for that. And we are now going to move on to our second speaker, who is uh, Marjorie Duda. Mayor Speaker 2 is not on the line. Thanks, Clerks. Uh, and then we're going to look at Speaker 3. Uh, speaker 3 on my list is Anita, Roma uh, Anita Romaniak. Speaker Mayor number speaker three. Speaker 3 is not on the line. Okay, great. Thank you so much. So that uh, completes Speaker's Council. Um, we are now uh, uh, need somebody to move the report. So moved, Councillor DiGenova. Thanks. We have a seconder. Councillor Boyle. Councillor Boyle, thank you. So uh, we are on the main queue now for debate and decision on this, uh, whether or not to receive this report. May I have a point yeah. of privilege? I, um... I, I can't get my panel up right now. So okay. Could, uh, Go on the list. My, my apologies. I just want to make sure. If, um, I would like to uh, put forward an amendment that I circulated earlier. Okay. And the amendment is regarding the um, 
the replacement of the Mount Pleasant pool. And I'll be brief on this unless anyone has questions for me, but this has been promised to the community um, over several terms of council as well as as the park board as well has promised this over several terms to the community. It was supposed to be in previous capital plans and delivered in previous capital plans. Uh, that was my understanding that that is the direction the park board and council had given to our staff. So I'm I'm putting this forward in in hopes that Mount Pleasant will finally have um, this pool that they have been fighting for for a long time. I know that many of us have have heard from the residents in Mount Pleasant um, that have enjoyed the pool and that it, it has come to be on the end of its life. So uh, although there are many other amendments I could make, I think this is most, the most important because it's a promise you know, that was made to the community and it's a promise that needs to be kept to the community. Yeah. And seeing that the Aquatic Center and you know, other park board facilities are um, you know, in, in uh, this capital plan, but the Mount Pleasant pool is not, and we do have the ability to do this through reserves as well. Um, I would like this to come back uh, to, as as our city manager said, the next council for consideration. And right now it's not in the plan and it will not come back to them for consideration in this capital plan. That's what I understood from, from staff in asking my questions. So uh, I'm I, I'll, I'll leave it there, but if others have questions or points of information, I'm happy to answer them. Well, we do need a seconder for this to carry on. Do we have a seconder for this? Councilor Kirby Young. Okay, uh, so now we're on the amendment queue. Hey, Councilor Carr. Um, yes, I just uh, have a question, if a point of information through you to staff, if I, I can, Mr. Uh, Mr. Mayor. Yes, Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Great, and so um, I, uh, my question is, uh, does the wording here um, state uh, in staff's opinion that this is going to be included in the capital plan or that they're coming, you're gonna come back with um, recommendations around funding it or delivering the replacement of it? Um, so I, I'm just wondering if this is direction to include it for sure or direction to staff to just come back with information around the funding and potential trade-offs because it says recommendations. So I'm assuming that that would include uh, uh, trade-offs, but I, I don't know how you're interpreting this. Uh, Mayor Stewart, Great. I can happy Yeah, to please go ahead. ahead. Yep, go see you ahead. See you, Manager. Thanks. So yeah, at this point, there, there isn't sufficient specificity in the motion for us to make any conclusions with respect to inclusion of the capital plan. What we would do here is take this direction and come back to council with the implications and options. Okay. Again, it, it doesn't propose any specific trade-offs, which does make it more difficult for us in terms of determining where that, where in the capital plan to take the funding to come up with this, but happy to come back with, with those implications. Right. Okay. Um, thanks. Th thanks. I really appreciate that information. Um, you, you know, I, um, I, I had heard very clearly that staff were not recommending that we come up with individual one-off recommendations to have staff look at different um, projects for, um, for assessment as to whether or not they would be included in the capital plan. Um, so I, I noticed that some people have decided to do that on council, other people have not. It does not reflect the interest, I think, of all of council in seeing some changes to the actual plan itself, both in recommendations um, to fund things that may not be listed, um, but there are trade-offs involved um, if that happens. So I'm, I'm fully aware that, um, uh, that the response here is one from staff that they are not looking at this as a full inclusion, but that they are they will come back with the cost or the trade-offs or the implement, implications of this. And um, although I'm, I have a lot of projects I would love to put forward, but I am not going to burden staff with that at this moment. I will do it through due process. Um, however, um, based on the city manager's response um, that, um, that they are going to just come back to us with information. Um, and my interest in seeing what that information is regarding the Mount Pleasant pool, I will support this. Thank you, Councillor Boyle. Thanks, I, I was going to say something similar to what uh, Councillor Carr just said, which is um, just a reminder, as we all know, through the many 
conversations we've been having about the capital budget that council will ultimately have to make choices and trade offs. And um, I certainly am having a very difficult time with uh, the number of things I would like to see added to this without being able to uh, without there being things I would like to remove from it and ultimately in all of the amendments I see coming around um, asking for more information about how can we fund this and how can we fund that. Uh, when we come to the final vote, that will be the responsibility of councillors to put forward uh, where they propose finding the funds. Um, but uh, uh, as we lead towards that work, I'm certainly happy to um, see uh, what staff recommend in terms of what it would look like to uh, to present those trade offs and um, and fund different projects. Uh, so uh, happy to to support that. Remembering it's it's information for our hard final decisions down the road. Mr. Kirby Young. Thanks, Mayor. I will be brief. I had the benefit of sitting on the part board last term along with then Commissioner and now Councillor Weeb. Um, and I think we had a chance to go through the entire Van Splash aquatic strategy and to hear from residents that were incredibly passionate and acknowledging that we are actually depleting um, our amenities in terms of the outdoor pools per capita and this was fully supported by a couple of park boards so I would like other councillors to be able to have the benefit of the same similar information that I have um, around this pool and how it fits into the strategy and how it was endorsed and supported and so in that spirit um, I am happy to support getting information back um, I think it's helpful to give staff that input at this point so that we can have a more fulsome discussion um, when we get uh, this coming back to us in July and when we also are able to balance that with the public input from the consultation period. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just wondering, I'm not uh, as chair, I'm not supposed to enter debate, but I'm just uh, as chair. So I'm wondering if Councillor um, Councilor Boyle, I think you're the deputy. Very happily, I will chair. Thank Mayor you. Stewart, would you like to speak? Yeah. Um, I, I think this is a healthy thing to do to ask for more information, but I, I after listening to staff today, um, uh, what I'm worried about is um, this council not being responsible to the next council and just loading in tons and tons and tons of new projects that would force the next council to increase property taxes astronomically to pick up the debt and the uh, and the principal costs, as was explained. So I'm happy to get information on the on the projects, but if these come forward as amendments to the capital plan, I will be proposing amendments to amendments that if the councillors do not uh, or those proposing do not put trades, uh, what they're willing to trade in their amendments, then I will uh, have a series of trades that I will add in as amendments uh, to make sure that the choice is clear for um, uh, for the public, that it can't just be adding in. If, if we decide that the, the Mount Pleasant pool is a priority, then something will have to come out and those choices will have to be made uh, during, the, during the capital plan. So just to let council know that uh, that I'll be uh, that'll be my approach as we go forward with this plan. Thanks very much, and and that's it for me, uh, Councillor Boyle. I will hand right. the chair back to you. Thanks, Mayor Stewart. Uh, with that, then I don't see anybody on the queue, so I can call a vote on this item. Councillor Kirby on Councillor Hardwick. May I get a vote of system favor, please? Having trouble with my. Oh, there we go. I think it worked. Okay, great. Thanks. That has passed with all in favor. Thank you. Um, going back to the main queue, Councillor Dejanova, anything else? Not from me right now. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Carr, you're next, up to five minutes. Oh, sorry. That was to speak to the. Um, you can take me off. That was to speak to the amendment. Okay. Uh, Councillor Kirby Young, up to five. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. I have uh, proposed two amendments. And I'm wondering the interest of time if council would like to consider them as one amendment. Um, so perhaps I will try that just respecting time. And I know you're wanting to finish in a good hour, Mayor. Um, and I see staff have um, brought them up. Um, and in the spirit of the conversation that's happened, I'm looking to get some really good information back um, that will help inform the, excuse me, I'm losing my voice, <coughs> that will help inform the discussions when the capital plan comes back to Council in July. The first one relates to the Gastown Streets project, um, which is a project that is prioritized in the capital plan, but it's really about the weighting of how much resourcing we put towards that. I would note that um, the importance of this one from my perspective is that this historic neighborhood is degrading and it's degrading really quickly. 
um, and it's it's quite easy to see um, when you go down to Gastown. Um, my understanding is that in ongoing conversations with staff and BC Transit that we are some quite some time away from the idea of a more pedestrian only um, street, um, which would be quite dependent upon relocation of um, traffic and transit onto the adjacent Cordova Street um, and dealing with the buses and expanding that there. And that is a much longer term project. But in the meantime, we have a historic site designated neighborhood in Canada that is degrading. It will be more expensive to fix it later. You can see the degradation and the impact that that is having. And so I really want to have good information back about the ability to complete the street repair um, beyond just patching, but the street repair to a, a higher level than is currently contemplated by splitting the allocation over two capital plans. Um, and I really want council to have that information in terms of making a decision. And so it does ask to your point around, it's not an addition um, to the point the mayor made earlier. Um, it's a question of waiting um, for an existing project and it does specifically ask staff to provide options for reallocation within that engineering and streets um, existing budget. So that's the first one. The second one is on the kids pool, which is an emerging situation as we know, not contemplated um, to the situation that we have now when the capital plan was brought forward and looking for us to be able to have some information around is this is there an opportunity for a short term fix while looking at a longer term issue around how we would best support a facility like this with climate change and increasing weather events and what is the magnitude of difference um, between those two different pieces is this something that we can and should fix in the short term or are we looking at some more something more significant here and I think that that's pretty important um, we saw how important our pools are were during the heat wave and the increasing weather events that we're having to enable people to cool down um, as well as mental health and fitness and recreation during the pandemic so that is the background on the two amendments. Thank Second. you. Councilor D. Tanago. We're on the amendment queue then. Anybody like to speak to this one? <clears throat> I don't see anybody on the queue, so we can call a vote on these additions. Board in favor. Councilor Weed, vote says. Oh, okay, it has you marked as absent, so you're present now, sure. Uh, Councillor Weed, we want to mark you in favor. That's uh, fine, we've done that. Councillor Dejanova. Oh, I, I've just voted mayor. Is it not coming up? Uh, no, it's paper, not. Paper, please. Okay, you know, sure. 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 being marked as absent. Dejanova in favor. Thanks very much. That's unanimous. Uh, Councillor Kirby Young, anything else? No, thank you for to Council for the support, and I look forward to getting the information. Appreciate it. Thanks, Councillor Dominato. Uh, thanks, Mayor. Uh, similarly, I'd like to move an amendment, uh, and I've circulated it to Council previously, um, and it reads uh, that staff report back prior to the final capital uh, plan on the viability and implications to increase allocations for new traffic signals and flashing beacons for pedestrian and cycling crossings and neighborhood traffic management and spot improvements. And uh, this I recognize uh, within the draft capital plan, there is um, an increased allocation for traffic signals. Um, however, I would be interested in, in hearing back on, are there options specifically um, to um, increase the allocation for these areas? And it stems from public feedback, uh, particularly around uh, pedestrian safety, cyclist safety, um, I think it's actually one of the number one issues I've heard about over the course of four years, uh, uh, probably after you know housing and public safety is um, how do we ensure uh, we have safe crossings for families, uh, for individuals, especially as we're encouraging the public um, to walk more, to cycle more. And, um, I, and I haven't been prescriptive intentionally because I know in the past it's difficult if we say, well, take money out of this bucket or this allocation. So my hope uh, for this amendment is that staff would go and look and see if there's any way to beef up this area. And I recognize there may be trade-offs, um, but um, it is something that's a priority for the public, including the neighborhood traffic management. Again, um, there are particular neighborhoods that uh, struggle uh, because they are close to freeway entrances to bridges and they do see a higher level of traffic and uh, rat racing. And so if there's an opportunity to address that, um, and again, I, I would turn it over to staff to come back with recommendations if there's an opportunity to be set up, but um, that's the recommendation before you. We have a seconder. Second, Councillor Kirby. Okay, we're on the amendment queue. Anybody like to speak to this one? Okay, if not, we'll go to the vote. Board of Citizens Fair, Mayor. 
Thank you. That's Councilor Weave in favor, please, clerks. There we go. That's in favor, unanimous. Thank you so much, Council. Anything else, Councilor Dominato? No, thank you, Mayor. Councilor Carr. Um, yes, thanks. Uh, Mayor, I would like to start by asking a point of information, if possible, through you to staff. Uh, sure can. Thank you. Um, and that is regard to the speaker, um, Thomas Digby, who uh, talked about uh, calculations of embodied carbon. I wonder um, if that is something that staff has looked at at all in terms of, we've talked about certainly reducing carbon and GHGs, but have we ever thought of or, cal or have we the ability to calculate embodied carbon in terms of an uh, aspect of our, of our um, capital plan? Beth? Um, Councillor, I do have a note from Doug Smith who says that there, there is, um, they are writing policy right now for our buildings and or if I'm planning to look at embedded carbon um, going forward. So I think we could probably ask um, for a report or if you can respond back. Okay, I, I can pick it up later. Uh, There's it, some information that we could share. Yes, I, I, I recognize that. Um, that Doug Smith had talked about that we're moving forward with some policy around requirements um, in our building um, bylaw. So anyway, it's great. I can, we, it can come. We have a, a number of sessions still around the capital plan. Um, so I'll just uh, um, at the end, Mayor, just talk about the um, this uh, this capital plan and. Um, start by thanking the incredible work of staff. There's a, a lot of work that goes into this and you laid it out, I think very clearly for us as council in terms of the um, information um, relevant to us to make decisions around different priorities of council um, and different departments uh, within, uh, within the city. Uh, I know that they, um, if there are any changes made, those will have to be trade-offs. I understood clearly about the limitations on increasing the budget um, uh, in terms of especially an era where we may be um, entering, well, we are entering, I think, rising interest rates and uh, the implications that that might have. Um, so I appreciate your answers to all our questions, the way you've laid out the information for us and the public. And I really look forward to the public input back. Um, I did not choose to table any specific requests for information um, at this meeting around what might be so far not listed as a priority for the plan. And that might have to be, if included, come at a, um, a trade-off uh, uh, regarding something else. Um, I, you, know, you can expect that I and other counselors will probably <laughs> be sending um, emails to staff uh, asking for those kinds of specific questions. I mean, for me, for sure, you know, the, um, I'm hopeful that we are pursuing the idea of at least adding uh, one replacement fire hall in, into the plan. There's the fire hall theater, the West End Community Center, Joe Fortes Library, um, Britannia Community Center, maybe more climate action. There's a lot of things on my mind at this point, um, but I chose not to put the motions forward here, uh, rather um, look at them more contemplatively uh, as we move over the next month or so, and then also receive public input. So. Um, with that, that, again, my sincere thanks uh, for the work that's gone into this. Thank you. Councillor Swanson. Yeah, I also would like to give the staff my heartfelt thanks for all this amazing work balancing all this complex stuff. Um, we're between a rock and a hard place, I think. 60% um, of infrastructure spending uh, the cities have to do, but we only have 8% of the revenue. And we have to get that revenue with a flat, not a progressive property tax. We need the Mount Pleasant pool, the Kitts pool, the Fire Hall Theater, the Joe Fortes Library, the, the Aquatic Center. We also desperately need money for sewer upgrades that nobody except staff talk for. And we desperately need to reduce our GHG reduction, uh, GHG emissions and start adapting for climate change. And we need that SRO strategy that's gonna cost a billion dollars and we need to put our, our part into that. Plus we have the 86,000 people that are in housing need plus 50,000 more that are coming. So, 
I'm going to vote for this, of course, but it, it, it points to the fact that we desperately need a progressive tax and we desperately need fed, federal and provincial governments to kick in more to help municipalities. So that's it for me. Thank you, Councillor Swanson. Uh, next up is Councillor Hardwick. I'll be brief. I think the business model that we've developed here is unsustainable. And we need, uh, instead of what we've been doing, it's looking at the individual use cases, we need to be looking at the larger model. But that's not something we're going to do in, in this environment here. But I just want to go on the record as uh, stating that we are perpetuating an unsustainable model and it will come back to uh, haunt us. Thank you. Councillor Carr, you have a minute and a half left. Thank you. Um, it, yeah, Councillor Hardwick's um, point has um, prompted in me uh, a response, which is what is unsustainable is what we're doing to the planet in terms of emitting greenhouse gas emissions to the point at which we have absolutely catastrophic climate change. We saw evidence of that in the last year. But um, to the point that I often hear Councillor Hardwick raise, which it's not our jurisdiction. It is our jurisdiction. It is everyone's jurisdiction. The latest IPCC report of global scientists said that cities account for rising GHGs, rising, not dropping GHGs, um, to the point that, um, uh, that uh, it, it is completely threatening the future for humankind and for the biodiversity of this planet. In that same report, the um, scientists state that, in fact, cities, by just looking at their own emissions, reducing carbon emissions in the buildings in their cities, in the traffic and transportation within their cities, um, in waste in their, in their cities, that they, there was a projection that they could decrease to three uh, gigatons by 2050, their emissions, this is on a global level, compared to at the current rate, what would end up being 34 to 40 gigatons of emissions from cities if we don't change our ways. Um, so I am really hopeful that, uh, that this plan is going to take us on that downward trend that we need to go. Thank you, Councillor Carr. Uh, that's it for time. All right, so that's it for speakers. I'm going to call a vote then on this amended staff report. Clerks, if you could trigger the queue, thank you. Vote assist in favor, Councillor Weeb. Thank you, Councillor Weeb. Councillor Hardwick. That's unanimous. Thank you, Council. Thank you, staff, for all your great work. And we, uh, I think, Councillor Kirby Young held uh, report number four, which is the 2022 property uh, property tax distribution. We are. I did not hold it. I believe there was speaker who's mayor. Ah, uh, right. I'm sorry. Sorry about that. Um, I think it's because I saw your event. Sorry about that. Um, no right. Uh, okay. So um, we're going to ask first if anyone has a conflict of interest on this, and if I don't hear any, um, city manager, I'm going to ask: Is there any staff comments before we start hearing from speakers on this item? Thanks, Mayor Stewart. Uh, no, nothing from us. Okay, great. So with that, uh, Council, then we're going to move to hear from speakers. There's a few uh, that have signed up. Sorry, let's give me my email open here. Um, first speaker is uh, Paul Sullivan. Speaker one is not on the line, Mayor. Thank you very much, uh, Clerks. We're going to move to speaker three, Neil Wiles. Sorry, Mayor, Paul? Speaker 2 is on the line. Speak 2. Uh, Paul Sullivan, thanks for calling in tonight. You have up to uh, five minutes to speak to our uh, property tax levy distribution item. Hello? Hello, Speaker? Sorry, Mayor. I, I'm here. There's been some confusion. It's it's Speaker 3 is on the line, not Speaker 2. Oh, okay. Sorry thanks. about that. Neil Wild, uh, please go ahead. Um, up to five minutes, please. Thank you. Apologies for being the only speaker. Otherwise, you could have done this on consent. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, thank you for all your discussion about the Mount Pleasant Pool. Uh, I look forward to seeing that uh, return one day. Um, I do want to have a quick uh, a quick word about this uh, this report. Um, 
I do want to mention the inequity um, of the tax share, uh, 57 to 43 uh, residential to business, when business only occupies 7% of the property in Vancouver, and yet is expected to bear 43% of the tax burden. This ratio is not likely to be changed at this meeting. This absolutely needs to change, but that's not why I'm here. Um, I do want to address the comment section of the report uh, from the city manager regarding property assessment reform. I also recognize the need for reform and staff have worked with various groups to seek changes to our current system of taxation. This work has been going on for years. Uh, a possible solution that has been presented um, by these groups, including city of Vancouver staff to the province, you know this as the split assessment model um, that municipalities could use to address some of the uh, issues around highest and best use. The province put forth something different called the interim solution for property tax relief. Um, I wanna note that no municipality used this tool. There's various reasons stated in the report, um, but I think that it uh, could be summed up as it was cumbersome uh, with not enough time or data to implement. I'm often hearing that this is a Vancouver only issue. Um, we're seeing various stories in the media that this is a problem across all major centers in Canada. These other cities are looking at various other ways to address the fairness in their tax systems right now. In the taxation report before you, you can see in uh, figures nine and 10, uh, which the taxes have increased on the underdeveloped properties uh, nearly 300% over the last eight years. Figure 10 shows that the developed property, in this case an office building, has not increased and has actually decreased uh, over the last eight years. The other report that I have in my hands right now is the retail inventory update. Things that jump out for me is that vacant storefronts have jumped 29%. While I recognize that there are some factors involved in this, the primary one being the pandemic, the trend has been ever increasing commercial vacancy over a much longer term. The report notes that a 10% vacancy is considered unhealthy, while also noting that many of the neighborhoods which we know and love are over the 20% point. I wanna note that the area where I work, Mount Pleasant, has been identified as one of the, if not the fastest growing neighborhoods in Vancouver, and yet we have 14% commercial vacancy rate. With 300% uh, tax increases uh, for some of these properties, I don't need to connect the dots for you as to why these storefronts are empty. BC assessment has identified up to 2,800 properties that are deemed underdeveloped. The vast majority of these spaces are in areas of the outside of the downtown core in neighborhoods like Mount Pleasant, Commercial Drive and Kitts. We need more tools in the tax system to help protect these areas. The city of Vancouver needs more tools at its disposal in order to deal with some of the issues I mentioned. As more urban centers are expressing concerns about the current taxation system, we see that this is not just the Vancouver only problem. The tax increase for hundreds of properties uh, at over 300% for the last, over the last eight year span and nothing in place, place to change that trend. Urgency is needed before we lose all of the interesting spaces that make these areas so desirable for our residents to live, work and play in. I call upon this council to write to the Premier and the Minister of Finance, immediately requesting a legislative solution to help protect these areas from the highest and best use issue and do so in time for the 2023 assessment role. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for calling in. I've actually got a couple of questions for you. Um, so on the split assessment, I think uh, a lot of us worked uh, hard on this in the past, and thanks to the BIAs uh, right across the city for helping, as well as the Board of Trade. And we did get some movement uh, from the province, but we didn't get the movement uh, that we needed. Would you be willing to join uh, with us again if we uh, go for a, another big push to try to get this uh, try to get this across the line? Absolutely. Okay, great, thanks. So I know I've, I've raised, raised this with the Urban Mayors um, Caucus, uh, the 13 mayors of the largest cities in BC. Uh, would you be willing to help uh, reach out to their business improvements associations to uh, kind of uh, get a whole new group of folks involved in this? I'm presenting at the BIA BC conference on Monday about this very topic. Great. Well, if, if you'd be willing to uh, put that in, that I'm sure I could get the uh, the other mayors to join in again. And uh, we have a new Minister of Municipal Affairs, so let's hope uh, he'll listen and help. So thanks. Uh, my second question is around your idea of other tools. And the vacancy rate is disturbing to me as well of commercial properties. And what I'm worried about is that um, that now is becoming uh, a speculation vehicle. Um, I'm wondering, do you share that same concern? 
Uh, in part, yes, I do. Um, you know, I, I, I'm aware of some of the nuances of why this property is empty and why that property is empty. Um, but on a larger uh, picture, you know, the trend is moving towards uh, more commercial vacancies. Um, and so that I'm is wondering... concerning. And yes, and yes, speculation is, uh, is a big concern. So uh, our empty homes tax has been uh, very, um, uh, I, I guess, important. It, the, according to Statistics Canada, it's helped get 5,000 units of housing back on the market. Would you be uh, interested in exploring something like that for commercial properties at the provincial level? It does, it does have some interest um, around it. Um, but sometimes there are uh, you know, there are other issues. I mean, I think it's upwards of two years right now just to get your um, your permitting done. Um, so that's not uh, not necessarily you know the, a, a solution. It's a, it's a thing, but it's, I wouldn't say that uh, a solution. Oh, so you wouldn't be interested in pursuing that as a tool. Um, I, like I say, it's 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 a much it's a much bigger picture. I don't know that uh, um, taxing empty storefronts with so many other mitigating factors uh, is is what we're looking for. Didn't quite get it. Yes or no? <laughs> no, uh, no, not as a, as a single solution. No. Not as a th okay. So no interest at all. Got it. Okay. Thanks so much. Uh, that's it for questions from me. Um, Council, any other questions for the speaker? Councillor Kirby? Yeah? No, I don't have questions for the speaker, but I'm prepared to move the report and I have an amendment there. Okay, thanks so much. Uh, do we have a seconder? Second. Thank you, Councillor Weep. I'm over at the main queue now, Councillor Kirby, Young, if you want to uh, go ahead with your amendment. Okay, I have, thank you, Mayor. Um, I have circulated it to Council. Um, and I appreciate you raising the question and the work that's been done and the advocacy that you've been doing, Mayor, on the split tax assessment and also with the other mayors, um, which I know was noted in the report. Um, and that work, I think, is really important to continue to elevate it and keep it top of mind with the province because split tax assessment has been identified as the single most effective tool to address the issue of unrealized potential and the tax on highest and best use. And I think we heard from Neil Wiles on the 2800 properties that are impacted. So. That is the spirit of the amendment is to support um, you, uh, Mayor, in that work and put Council's full weight um, behind that advocacy. Um, and it's requesting that um, you write to the Minister of Finance to strongly convey Council support for and the importance of the implementation of split tax assessment through the commercial subclass um, as advocated for by the Intergovernmental Working Group. I won't read all of the rest of the language because you can see that there on the screen, um, but I'm hopeful that uh, Council will send a strong signal of support for this to our small business and our BIAs and the Board of Trade who are all have all been advocates and lent their their names to this work previously. Thank you. Thanks so much. Just looking at the speakers list here. Uh, sorry, am I? It's too many screens. Right there in a second. There we go. Uh, there we are. Okay, okay Council. Uh, do we have a seconder for this amendment? Second. Okay. Does anybody wish to speak to this? I do, actually. Um, <clears throat> Councillor um, Boyle, would you be kind enough to take the chair again? Uh, yes, absolutely. Go ahead, Mayor. Okay. Uh, so, Council, I'm going to suggest an amendment to the uh, to the amendment and. Um, I've uh, just sent it in now, is that the uh, council direct me to uh, approach the uh, provincial government to explore the idea of a uh, empty tax for uh, commercial properties, much like the empty homes tax. Um, this isn't instituted, of course, it's it's just to uh, it, it's just to give us a, a, an, an extra tool, especially to cut down on speculation, because my worry is that um, now that we've been so effective with our empty homes tax and forcing residential properties off the market uh, into the rental market, that this is what's happening as well, is that uh, investors are buying commercial properties, sitting on them, waiting for them to deteriorate, uh, and then um, 
And that's the detriment, as we've heard, uh, up to 20% vacancies in, in some neighborhoods, which is just atrocious. So this, again, would be a tool uh, that we could explore. And um, it's been effective in one case, and um, I hope it's effective in another. Uh, so that's my pitch. Happy to second it. Thank you. Okay, and I, I hear Councillor Fry as a seconder, so we'll move to an amendment queue unless we're there already. Uh, Councillor Weeb, you are first up on the amendment queue. Yeah, um, I would like to speak in support of this. I know that in our paradigm shift to support small business, the motion we passed here at Council, we asked staff to report back on the feasibility of an empty storefront registry to identify the availability of retail spaces and look at creative options to incentivize the use of these spaces for pops up, arts and culture, nonprofits, social enterprises, business incubators. And I know that in speaking with the BIAs, it was something they talked about is how do we better utilize our empty storefronts? So, Knowing that staff are coming back with solutions on how to do that and having a proper registry, I think would lead right into what this is, is looking at different opportunities to scale it for if they're empty for one, two, three, five years, which is some of the conversations I talked to the BIAs where it can't be just for a short period of time. It has to be for a longer period of time, recognizing our permits and licensing and some of the change in use bylaws that we have, but I will be supportive of this work. Uh, Chair, point of privilege. Yes. Go ahead. I do, I do notice a typo. It shouldn't. It should be and, not and. So I was hoping, with chair's discretion, you might make that uh, correction in the explore and tax. Uh, explore. Yes, I, um, I wondered the same thing when I read it. So I think that typo is um, fine to correct. Is that all, Mayor? Yeah, thank you. Great. Um, and Councillor Weed, that's it for you. I will assume yes by uh, by your <laughs> silence. Uh, Councillor Fry, you're up next on the amendment uh, to the amendment queue. Yeah, and uh, really happy to support this, and I'll, I'll move things along without talking too much about it. Um, it is something certainly that we've we have talked a lot about, and it's been something that we've all noticed. I think uh, my only hope is that we'll also be sort of turning a mirror on ourselves because we have a lot of pro uh, commercial properties. In the PEF and owned by the city of Vancouver that are sitting vacant and uh, I think what's good for the goose is good for the gander so if we're if we're going to take a look at, at this I hope that we take a look at some of our more abundant uh, commercial properties that could possibly be put to better use. Thank you Councillor Fry. Uh, Councillor Carr you are up next. Oh, Councillor Carr, we're having trouble hearing you. Yeah, that's, I'm sorry. I had to have the, put the mic on it. I, I couldn't do it here at my desk, so thank you. No um, problem, loud and clear, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I just wholeheartedly support this. Uh, you know, it's been, I, there's not a day that goes by where I don't walk by the old Dover Arm pub on my street and I think, oh, it has it has been five years um, that it's sat there and, uh, and those um, storefronts that are boarded up and not active, they really are um, a blight in the neighborhood in terms of decreasing sort of the public interaction and just the liveliness of a neighborhood. So um, I'm hopeful that in the exploration of this, um, there will be an attention paid to the comment that, um, uh, that our speaker, Neil Wiles, pointed out, which could be extenuating circumstances due, due to how long permitting takes place and those kind of things. But I'm assuming that those details will get worked out and uh, and and uh, therefore um, SSA fully and in support. Thank you, Councillor Carr. Councillor Kirby Young, you're up next on the amendment to the amendment. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I appreciate the amendment, but I think it's important to note a difference here is that the split tax assessment is research policy that we know that there is support for, and we've had a forum for discussion about that. I think the challenge that I see here is that when presenting an amendment without the opportunity to engage with stakeholders more meaningfully to understand if there is full support for this um, or to research and discuss the implications, because the commercial sector is very different than the residential sector, um, I would much prefer to see this brought forth as a separate motion and for the opportunity for some of that dialogue to happen around understanding some policy implications so that we can make a really informed decision. I know very few commercial um, property holders that want to hold vacant property. In fact, they want to ensure that it is 
um, occupied and they lament a higher vacancy rate, um, which is not um, because they're in the business of having spaces be occupied um, and occupied in a way that is sustainable um, so they can sustain those properties. I fully agree with the comments that I've heard from councillors about wanting to ensure that um, you know having full storefronts is good in terms of vibrancy in our city um, and it's good in terms of safety and the public realm and the energy that it creates. But I think that this is fundamentally different in the in the private sector, and I heard quite clearly from Neil Wiles, who I know um, in speaking is doing a lot of work with the BIA um, partnership um, throughout Vancouver and has been the lead on the file and I think really has a pretty good handle on the perspective of the different BIAs that this is no, this isn't something that they would support as a standalone and I think it really deserves a more fulsome conversation. Um, and further study. And so I, for that reason, would like to see it come forward that way and not this way. I don't think that this is the way to do it because I think we need to make really strong, well-informed, evidence-based policy. Um, and I don't think we have the opportunity to do that here right now this way. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kirby and Councillor Bly, you're up next. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, I, I mean, echoing Councillor Kirby Young's comments around pro, uh, just sort of a, perhaps a an opportunity for us to have a um, uh, some more time and and a better understanding of how um, this uh, type of policy could um, have unintended consequences. And I think immediately jumping to which I appreciate the sentiment that it is important to protect um, our, our local small business and ensure that we have lively um, high streets and that um, businesses are, we don't have these empty storefronts. There seems to be this immediate assumption that something like this would actually help and not harm that situation and make it worse than it already is. Fundamentally, um, home ownership versus a commercial landlord, it, it, they're not even in the same realm. So to think that something like the empty homes tax would have a um, sort of um, a, a, the, the sort of direct um, benefit that we've seen in around uh, the empty homes tax in a commercial context, I think is really naive to be quite honest and needs much more um, discussion and, and fulsome investigation because even just tacking this on to this amendment here um, is an endorsement from this council that we support a tax for empty commercial properties and none of us really understand fully what those implications are. Um, so I think it shows a lack of understanding in terms of how the commercial real estate um, world works. And at the end of the day, if there are additional taxes, we already know with the very merit of the beginning of this amendment that it is the end user that gets hit with that tax and commercial uh, landlords own many many properties generally speaking so they will make sure based on what they can charge the end user that they're not paying any extra so i would just caution council to challenge this particular amendment in terms of how it's been brought forward to vote against it let's do our homework and let's make sure we're not um voting in favor of something that ha could have dire um, um, negative impacts, unintended consequences that would be on us as a council if we vote, vote to support this. So I'm most certainly voting against this at this time. Thank you, Councillor Bly. Uh, Mayor Stewart, you are up next. Uh, th thanks, Chair. Um, well, in the last item uh, where we had a capital uh, you know, a big capital plan, and we agreed uh, councillors wanted to explore some different projects, and we unanimously voted to uh, to do that, even though that was really not the, uh, the you know, the, really the agreed upon way of doing things. I, I think we came together and were able to explore something different, and in that spirit, that's why the core verb in this uh, amendment to the amendment is explore. Uh, and you know, in, in one way, I'm kind of shocked that councillors wouldn't want to explore something when we're hearing from uh, hearing from the community BIA side or BIA roundtable yesterday, and and uh, um, co empty commercial properties are a huge concern, and uh, we could call it the uh, Dover Arms of the Amendment uh, because I too am really sad that folks are sitting on these valuable commercial properties and to the detriment of neighborhoods. So. Um, 
But I guess I'm not surprised when I hear who's opposed to this. Um, the folks who are speaking out against it, of course, are against the empty homes tax and avoid, uh, voted against it. Every Mayor, I'm going to ask for a point of order from the chair because that is impugning motives of councillors and you do not know our positions on the empty homes tax in terms well, of... I know your voting record, councillor. Okay, okay, thanks. Uh, you are, you are I'm speaking gonna... to specific councillors and, and who it is yep. something... You I'm voted against it every time, councillor Kirby. I'm going to stop, I'm gonna stop both of you right there. Um, that is uh, incorrect. And I would like Kirby the chair to. Uh, can the chair please advise Every the mayor? Every time, Councillor Kirby. Okay. Council Boyle. Council Boyle. He is still let's... doing it. I need you to caution the mayor that he is out of line in his comments. Oh, yeah, out Councilor of line. Kirby, but I... you haven't named the uh, procedural bylaw number that yeah, I, I, I heard. You. I, I will really caution. Still doing it. Can you please do that in the interest of maintaining a respectful workplace? Oh. Yeah. Okay. I, I I will caution to uh, stick to the um, the amendment to the amendment at hand and not speak to um, past votes or or, or guesses. Um, Councillor Kirby Young, if you want me to formally rule, you can uh, name a point of order. No, but thank you. Otherwise, I, I will just spoil for cautioning the mayor. I think that's appropriate. Thank you. Um, leave that at a, a reminder. Uh, mayor Stewart, you have. Uh, Three and a half minutes left if you want to uh, continue. Thanks. Um, I guess all I'll say is this vote will say a lot on who wants to work to make our city a better place and get uh, these businesses that are struggling back into uh, commercial properties that people are speculating on. So I uh, emphatically ask Council to uh, vote for this to help uh, me do this work provincially to make our city a better place and thank councillors who are speaking in support of this. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor and Councillor Fry, you are up next. Thanks. Uh, yeah, you know, I think uh, we're reading too much into this too soon. This is just a request to the province to have the ability uh, through the charter to, 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 to levy a tax and it could be 0.1% or it could be 1% or 10%. We haven't determined any tax amount. We've had this conversation at this chambers uh, just, what, like two years ago? Uh, we was quoted in it extensively. Chris Robertson commented on it. This isn't something completely new. So uh, I think it's, it's, a, it's a solid amendment. It's a thoughtful addition to consider, is this something that the province would consider allowing us to do? Because there are vacant uh, held commercial properties, and I think it would be disingenuous to pretend that there are not properties that are being speculated on and held uh, vacant. So why not explore if the province will even grant us this ability? Because dog knows we have tons of requests through the, uh, for the province to amend the charter that have yet to be acted upon, so we might as well add one more to the, to the queue. I'm happy to support this amendment. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Fry. And seeing no one else on the list, I'll ask the clerks to take us to a vote on the amendment to the amendment. Chair, just uh, Councillor DiGenova to vote. Okay, thank you, Councillor DiGenova. And clerks, if you can let me know uh, when we're ready. We have I to, don't see we have to, I think we have to pause the vote chair. Um, Council Di Genova's on, but uh, not responding. Okay. Um, should we take a two minute recess and? Sure, we'll reach out, yeah. reach out to the councillor. Okay, thank you. Council, it's uh, 7.04 by my clock. So we'll come back at 7.06 to complete this vote.
you let me know what the final vote uh, outcome is then, or or put it up on the screen so I can read up read out the results. Thank you, Council. That passes with Councillor Dominato, Councillor Bly, and Councillor Kirby Young in opposition. And so we'll move back to well, the. I see, uh, I see Councillor um, Dejanova on the screen. She's still too late to vote. I, if I if I could have a point of privilege. Uh, yes, go ahead as a point of privilege, Councillor Dejanova. Thank you very much. I'm sorry. I would. I was. Um, I, I had uh, some very last minute emergency parenting responsibilities, so I was away, so I didn't vote, but I'm back here now. I missed the vote, um, but if I can vote, I will vote. Oh, I'd be willing to move a motion to reconsider the vote to allow uh, Councillor Dejanova to vote. Uh, okay, um, it, it's my understanding that as you voted in the majority, you can do that, so uh, we would need a seconder to for a vote of reconsideration. Do I have a seconder for that? Second, Councillor Carr. Thank you, Councillor Carr. Um, clerks, can we just do a verbal vote of sure. on this? Okay, uh, Council, um, all in favor of reconsidering the previous vote on, on the amendment to the amendment, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, great. Clerks, I'll ask you to bring up that. Could you bring vote. up the amendment? Could I ask, Chair? What's that? Could you bring up the amendment in writing? I was listening the best I could during the. Uh, yes, um, you'll see it up on the screen. It's an amendment to the amendment moved by Councillor Kirby Young, and it reads. Further that council direct the mayor to ask the provincial government to explore a tax for empty commercial properties. Okay, thank you very much. You are welcome. Don't see anyone else. Uh, okay, the the voting screen is up council. Councillors uh, Dominato and Bly have not voted. Councillor Dominato has left the meeting. Right. They both left the meeting while Mark is absent. Okay, thank you. So that passes um, with Councillor Dijnova and Councillor Kirby Young in opposition. And we will now go back to the amended amendment. And Mayor, I will hand the chair back to you. Thanks very much. I don't have anything else. So Councillor Weeb on the uh, Councillor Kirby Young's amended amendment. Um, I will be supportive. I have a point of information through to staff. Sure thing. And that is, can you talk about the impact of the reversal of the Amicon case um, to the pre-zone split property class assessment and how it might relate to the amendment in front of us? That's a, that's a fairly in-depth question. Uh, City Manager, is, do you have anybody there prepared to answer this? Yeah, we got, we got the specialized team here today. So, sorry, can you repeat the question again? Yeah, I was wondering if you could talk about the impact of the reversal of the Amicon case against the pre-zone split class assessment that could relate to the report that we're asking for here um, to the province. The report that we're asking? To well, we're asking the province right now to talk about doing the subclass consistent with the right. split class. And I'm wondering if the Amicon case, how that reversal of that decision would impact what we're asking for. Actually, what we're asking for is exactly to, to mitigate that because um, the reverse Amicon basically originally 
it was um, basically everything is in class six, which is business. And then because of the Amicon, they moved the airspace, um, the value to residential, so they got the tax relief. And then reverse Amicon, meaning that they can basically bring back the class one value back to class six. So what we're asking for is the split assessment through a subclass so that the development potential, um, if, if the legislative change go through, council can make a policy to say that um, moving certain uh, portion of the value of the airspace into the subclass, and then council can decide how low the tax rate you want to tax. So basically, it's exactly to help that. Okay, thank you very much. Really appreciate that. Thank you. I will be voting in support. I think that uh, the reversal of the case is a really big decision here in the province to affect some of the property owners here, and I think it's something we need to reflect in our decision making to make sure this is done appropriately. So I will be supporting this. I think it's a really important policy that we've continued to advocate for since day one. Very much, uh, Councillor Weave. I don't see anybody else on the queue for this one, so we can call a vote. Um, Move to sever. Procedure. Move to sever. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, you can call the sever, Councillor Kirby Young. What would you like to sever? The two clauses. Okay. Sever the two clauses. Okay, great. Uh, and the Councillor Dijanovic, do you have anything? No, nope, I was just asking the same. Thank you. Okay, sure. So I'm going to call a vote on the uh, the, the section that the uh, clerks have highlighted at this point, and I'll ask votes uh, clerks to trigger that vote. Clerks, Councillor Bly and Dominato are still absent. Looks like it. That's correct. Okay. I've left for their leave, leave of absence. Okay, thank you. that has uh, passed unanimously. The first clause. Now we'll highlight the second clause, clerks, and that's what we'll call a vote on. Oh, there it is on screen. Thank you very much. Is this, part, is this the second? It is, yeah, the one highlighted. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, that passes with Councillor Kirby and Councillor Dejanova in opposition. Thank you, Council. And I don't see anybody else on the main queue, so unless anybody else wants to talk to the amended motion, I can call a vote. Oh, Councillor Weed. Yeah, I've got, I got one more um, point of information through to staff. Your sure thing. Uh, first one is the three sites that were converted from business class to recreational class. Have they got a recreational zoning bylaw? Do they meet our recreational zoning bylaws? I know that we talked about that some of these properties, when they become a recreational property, we do have bylaws on recreational properties. So are the three ones, I think it's $197 million in valuation that have been transferred from uh, residential class to recreation class. Now that they're a recreation class, are they meeting our recreational class bylaws? I need to get back to you on that one because my understanding is that not I'm not sure particularly for that area, but my understanding from the planning department is that a lot of areas within Vancouver, um, park use is actually an allowable use. The question is really about when there is a change in use, whether they have come to the city to get um, a permit to change the use. So that is more like the question, but I can actually report back to you. Okay, you can report back on those three. It's just I know it's something we've talked about, and I saw that. Um, the next one, it's in the middle of the report, it talks about a 56.8% um, residential share, and then a 57% is the one in the actual recommendation. Can you talk about the little differential between Yes. Graph in the middle and the other one. Okay. Yeah. So basically, um, when we talk about residential versus non-residential, residential includes class one and eight and nine. So basically, when you add those together, it is it is fifty seven. So the non-residential basically is class two, four, five, and six. Okay. So when you put them together, you get yes. that differential. Yeah. Um, perfect. Thank you very much. Appreciate those answers. Thanks. Uh, that's it. So I think we can call a vote on this uh, amendment, amended staff report. Go ahead, clerks. Um, Mayor? Yes. Councilor Dejanova? I'm, I'm sorry. Are we voting on the entire amended motion? We are. Yes. Could I please request a severing of the paragraph? Uh, we're, we're actually halfway through the vote now. So I know I was trying to call a point of privilege, so I, I would need to. Yeah, but to the, the vote is the vote is in process. But I had done that, Mayor, for the last two clauses. I didn't think I had to do it again on the final vote. I thought. Well, that no, I only sever what I'm asked and we're 
I am asking. I was waiting. No, we're, that. we're in the middle of a vote, Councillor Dejanova. I've ruled. Uh, you could ask before the severing, but folks have voted. So uh, you could always ask to reconsider if you vote in favor. Um, okay, I will abstain and ask to vote uh, to reconsider. You, you can't if you abstain. Really? Even though a vote of abstention is counted in favor? Yeah, we've made that ruling before. Uh, Councillor Kirby Young. Councillor Kirby Young? Don't see her on the call either. Councillor Kirby Young is left. Will marker is absent. Oh, okay, great. Uh, that passes uh, unanimously. Mayor, I'm on the queue. I'd like to ask for a vote of reconsideration. Oh, get up. Do we have a seconder for that? Going once. Councillor Carl, second. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, so we've got a vote of reconsideration. Um, so I'll just I would be like to ask me. for the part to be the portion to be severed that I'd ask yeah, for. Yeah, we got to get the reconsideration vote first, though, Councillor Dejanova. So I'll ask just verbally. All in favor of reconsideration, say yay. Okay. I'm happy to say yay. And uh, any opposed? Okay. So we'll uh, we'll have to. I'll get the votes to uh, the clerks to. Um, do the vote again. We'll do all the uh, reports uh, with uh, Councillor Kirby Young's amendment, but uh, as one vote, and then we'll have the addition, uh, my addition to Councillor Kirby Young's amendment as a second vote. Hope we're all clear. The yellow on the screen is highlighted. That is passed. Unanimously, thanks clerks. We're on to the next. Second clause after you've shown it on the screen. Thank you. Councillor Weep. And that passes with Councillor Dejanova in opposition. Thanks very much. Okay, we're off of that item. And on to the next. So, uh, Council, thanks so much for that. We have uh, 10 bylaws on the agenda for enactment. Uh, council members who are not present for the meeting related to public hearing and that uh, bylaws uh, must confirm that they reviewed the proceedings if they wish to vote. Uh, bylaw 5 is from the public hearing of April 14th. Councillors Bly, Boyle, Dejanova were absent for this item. Uh, Councillor Bly is absent. So, uh, Councillor Boyle, have you reviewed the proceedings and will you be voting? Councillor Boyle is not. I have and I will. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Dejanova. Councillor Dejanova, have you reviewed bylaw five and will you be voting? Sorry, I was on mute. I That's okay. Have you will? Great. Okay, thanks. Uh, bylaw 6 is from the public hearing of April 12th. I was absent, but I have reviewed it and I will be voting. And same with bylaw 9. I have, I have reviewed it and I will be voting. Uh, so does any member wish to hold uh, any of uh, these bylaws for debate, separate debate, or conflict of interest? I see Councillor Swanson on the queue. Councillor Swanson? I'd like to hold 8 and 9. Okay. Let me just write these down. Maybe the clerks can help me through with this one. Uh, Councillor Swanson, eight and nine. Uh, I've got Councillor Hardwick next. In addition to eight and nine, I'd like uh, six, please. Six. Okay. So, Councillor Hardwick, sh sh could we, uh, or maybe I'll ask Councillor Swanson. Councillor Swanson, can we group these all together, or would you like eight and nine as a package and then six on its own? The latter. Okay, thanks. So let's uh, work in reverse order. So we'll vote on bylaw number six. Uh, we'll need a, uh, just one second here, please. Uh, okay, so we need somebody to move bylaw number six. Thank you very much, Councillor Dejanova. Do we have a seconder? I can. Thanks very much. So clerks, we can move to a, a recorded vote on uh, bylaw number six.
Uh, Councillor Boyle, there we go. Well, that passes with Councillor Hardwick in opposition. Clerks, next we'll move to uh, uh, bylaw number eight and nine. Can we have a mover for those, please? I moved. Thank you, Councillor Dejanova. Do we have a seconder? Second. Thank you, Councillor Weave. Um, we'll move to a vote on bylaw eight and nine. Councillor Hardwick. And that has uh, passed with Councillor Hardwick and Swanson in opposition. Now we're going to go the remainder. Uh, perhaps the, I don't have the sheet in front of me, but it would look like it would be uh, bylaws one to uh, one to five and seven. Uh, sorry, <laughs> everything but eight, nine, and six. Moved. Also ten, Mayor. And ten. Yes. And ten. Okay. The remainder of the bylaws. No second, oh. Councillor Carr. Thanks. Clerks, if we can trigger the voting queue. Councillor Dejanova? Favor? Sorry. That's I okay. it already. <laughs> nope, that's fine. Thank you so much. That is uh that has passed unanimously. So now, Council, we're on to Council members' motions. We have four Council members' motions. Uh, the first one's easy. It is the motion uh, request for leaves of absence. Uh, we have Councilor Kirby Young for meetings on June 16th from 4 to 6, the civic business. We have Councilor Boyle uh, for meetings May 26th from 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. Councilor Carr for meetings on the following days and times, May 10th from 3 to 10, May 11th from 3 to 10, and May 12th from 3 to 10. Uh, is there a mover, please? So moved. Seconder? Second, Councillor Carr. Thanks very much, Councillor Carr. All those in favor, yay. yay. Opposed, nay. That's passed unanimously. Thanks so much. Uh, the next uh, motion is uh, from Councillor Fry. And Councillor Fry, we'll get you all queued up here to, to uh, do your two minute introduction. That's on the list. I'm just going to make uh, right, so this is uh, catalyzing planning for the future of the Central Waterfront District. And Councillor Fry, you have about two minutes whenever you're ready. Yeah, uh, thanks, Mayor. And I'm uh, co submitting this with uh, Councillor Dominato. And, um, you know, a lot of this, of course, of late inspired by uh, the jealousy of looking at what's going on over at North Vance Shipyards and what a fantastic job they've done. Uh, uh, because we have a magnificent uh, Central. Uh, waterfront that could be a natural focal point for our city. Uh, it's long been a gateway for visitors from steamliners traveling across the ocean to rail passengers traveling across the country. And today with the sea bus, cruise ships, West Coast Express, helicopters, seaplanes, and two SkyTrain lines, it is one of the busiest multimodal transportation facilities in Western Canada. And of course, for millennia, uh, this area that we today call the Central Waterfront was home to the first people of this land. And famously, it was to this shore that the Squamish paddlers came over to rescue the desperate residents of Granville Township during the Great Fire of 1886. Uh, and over the years, since the steamships were retired and the railway re relocated and the grand old marine building and the customs examining warehouse that we call Sinclair Center uh, were eclipsed by bigger and bolder modern towers, uh, we've seen plans come forward for this, this part of our, our beautiful city from the Project 200 freeway plans uh, to the subsequent 1979 ODP in the sea bus terminal and the construction of Canada Place and SkyTrain in 1986. Um, we've seen a lot of plans coming forward from the previous council. There's been a lot of work and initiatives. It's complicated partnerships between the CPR, the port, landowners. Uh, but over the last several years, we've seen renewed interest. And more recently, um, I was uh, introduced to a group of retired planners who've been really working on this and trying to champion this uh, through the VCPC. And I think they were really engaged over the potential of, of the redevelopment of that parking lot. Um, <clears throat> we've variously met with this group, we've met with staff, uh, and as per a recent memo that we did receive from staff, <clears throat> they are looking for our direction potentially to budget this and embark upon some kind of planning exercise to try and pull some of this amazing work that's been going on and a grander vision for the central waterfront that it can connect East Vancouver to, 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 to Crab Park better, greenways, cycling, the entire thing, and really embrace the, what I think what really defines us as a city, which is the access to the port, the water, the views of the mountains, and- um, Thanks yeah. so much, Brett. 
Oh, thank you. Okay. Do we have a seconder for this? Second, Councillor DiGenova. Thanks very much. Uh, we do have uh, speakers to this tomorrow, so if you'd like to hear from speakers, we can. Thank you very much. Uh, that's Wednesday, April 27th, starting at 9.30. Mayor, Mayor sorry, it's the clerk. Uh, no speakers on this one. Actually, a point of privilege, though, uh, as Councillor Dominato is away, we were hoping to refer this to tomorrow so Councillor Dominato could speak to it. Oh, sorry, am I, my clerk, uh, my script clerk, it does say there are speakers, but I, it is speakers that was wrong. Yeah, that's an error. Okay, but we can still refer to tomorrow if councillors want to. Yes, please, just to allow Councillor Dominato to co-submitted with me. I've already moved the referral motion, so I'm happy to keep Yeah, just giving it. the reason, though. Uh, so, and it's sec and we have it seconded? Yeah, second. Thanks so much. Uh, all in favor, yay. Yay. Uh, opposed, nay. And that's passed. Okay, now the chair goes uh, back to... Um, I'm introducing a motion, so I'll turn it over to uh, Deputy Mayor Boyle. Thanks, uh, Mayor. Motion three is increasing the MD homes tax to 5% and improving compliance. This motion is being moved by Mayor Stewart. Um, and Mayor Stewart, you have two minutes to introduce the item. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, so, Council, I, I'm hoping you'll support this, um, this move. Uh, you know, in the middle of our housing crisis, we have we have two um, two mechanisms that we ha we have to uh, employ to uh, to reduce vacancy rates. Uh, the first is supply, and council has been doing a, a very good job uh, approving rental units, like we did uh, earlier today. However, demand is the other side. Uh, we know from uh, Statistics Canada data that. Um, our current empty homes tax has uh, pushed, helped push uh, 5,000 units uh, back onto the rental market or uh, make available for, for first time buyers. It's been incredibly effective and uh, kind of uh, envied, uh, envied across Canada at this point. Um, so uh, two things this motion proposes is that we, uh, we go for broke and we try to end uh, empty homes for good by increasing the uh, the limit, uh, the taxation limit to 5% from three to 5%, and we do that for next year. But secondly, that we double the number of audits. I have heard a lot of anecdotal information that folks are finding creative ways to avoid this uh, tax. And I think that's unfair to the, the vast majority of, of uh, folks that are that are lining up, trying to, trying to get homes and work in this city. So, Increasing this tax to 5% and and uh, doubling the number of audits would really uh, double down on what's been an incredibly uh, effective tool for uh, making our city more livable. So I would uh, ask for your support on this uh, and uh, and and let's try to uh, get that vacancy rate uh, back up higher than 1.1%. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. You have questions, uh, councillors. You have a minute, uh, Councillor Hardwick. You're up first. Thank you, Mayor. Um, one of the clauses talks about people that have legitimate reasons for vacancy. Um, how how would those be treated? Do do you imagine in this um, for people that have a second property that that ought not be penalized? Thanks very much for the question, and thank you, Councillor Hardwick, your support on the uh, on this exploring a commercial uh, business tax, uh, empty business tax. Um, the um, that's part of the motion as well is to have staff kind of make sure that everybody is treated fairly. We have enough experience at this now. We have heard uh, through the appeal process uh, the folks that have uh, really been illegitimately affected by this. So this would uh, this would uh, compensate that through a proper staff study. We have lots of data now, so we should be able to make the right call on that. So that is built into this motion. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, and Councillor Tichnova, you have a minute for questions. Thanks, uh, Mayor Stewart. I'm just wondering for people who are audited and it costs them thousands of dollars in lawyer fees to go back and forth with the city of Vancouver, but it's found that these are some of the folks that you're talking about, the you know, low income or pensioners who, for instance, I just heard from a woman who missed uh, putting in you know, her stuff by the deadline because her husband died. So I'm just wondering, are you proposing making anything easier for people who actually aren't leaving their home empty, but are, are being audited? 
Uh, Councillor Dejanova, thank you for raising that. Uh, you know, death in a family is is traumatic. It's it's the worst thing a family can go through. So, uh, I know that we have made adjustments to make sure that that folks that are suffering tragedy are provided relief, and that is something we've learned through uh, this process already. So uh, that would definitely be something that, that I would ask staff to consider as they go through and making this a fair application. Again, we're going after speculators that uh, own multiple properties, hold them empty, flip them fast, keep everybody out of them. Uh, and again, Statistics Canada says we've pushed 5,000 just in the city of Vancouver back onto the market, which is an incredible success, and we've got to continue. That's my time. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Carr. You're up next. Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, Mayor. I'm wondering in, in Section B, you talk about increasing the number of audits, doubling it from 9,000 to 20,000. Have you uh, uh, talked with staff about the cost of that? Well, uh, actually, that's built right into the charter clauses is that all the costs for empty homes tax come out of the tax itself. So uh, it is, uh, this is, I think, good use of that empty tax, uh, empty homes tax money is to uh, increase the audits to make sure, like, again, this this could, if we do it right, could end this. And that's really the goal of the empty homes tax is to get all the units back onto the market that are being, being illegitimately, illegitimately uh, held empty. And uh, the audits will be covered through the empty homes tax that we collect uh, themselves. So it pays for itself. And I don't think anybody really should disagree with the audits because um, they'll uh, they'll give much certainty to the public that we're doing this right. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Carr and Councillor Fry. Yeah, uh, thanks, Mayor. Uh, what do you say to the staff comments on, on the feedback that that warn about unintended consequences and the need to analyze the data um, on the on the new three percent rate that we recently passed before moving to a five? Yeah, well, I've I've, I've built this uh, motion to account for that. So staff are busy uh, analyzing data. We've had some initial feedback, but we will have official report. Then we'll have uh, staff uh, in my motion, they'll have an ability to bring recommendations back to council about how it'll be the new council about how we adjust uh, this tax framework. But then the new, uh, after that's all done, then the increase comes in next year. So there is uh, all kinds of time for staff to analyze what we have, present it to us, uh, look for adjustments, and then uh, move ahead with the new rate and the new uh, level of audit. So the amendment that you uh, just proposed on on the commercial tax, which we supported, or some of us supported, uh, do you see that as a as 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 a safeguard against the potential gaming of the system on an increased residential empty homes tax? Are you worried uh, that people will move to that? Just three seconds. Yeah, I, I think they can be complementary if we do it right. Thanks. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Um, Seeing no questions, is there someone who would like to second the motion? Second. All right. Thank you, Councillor Fry. We have received requests to speak to this motion. If Council would like to hear the speakers, we can refer the motion to tomorrow's Standing Committee on City Finances and Director. Services meeting. Councillor uh, Thank you, Councillor Dijnova, and a seconder to refer. Yep, second. Thank you, uh, Mayor Stewart. Um, all those in favor say yay. Yay. Yeah. And any opposed say nay. Thank you, Council. Motion three is referred to tomorrow's standing committee meeting. And uh, Mayor Stewart, I will pass the chair back to you. Thanks very much, uh, Chair. Uh, so we're on to motion four, CCTV cameras for the purpose of public safety and deterring and solving violent crime. Uh, Councilor Dejanova, I will put you on the list and you have up to two minutes to introduce your motion. Thanks very much. I've tried to make it rather self-explanatory in the whereas clauses to my motion, but Vancouver uh, has seen a rise in violent crime. We've heard this from many people who write to us council who have come to other types of council meetings uh, to speak to us. And we also uh, will be having a, a dedicated special council meeting. Uh, thank you, Mayor, for calling that uh, on, uh, on Thursday. So I think that it's important to note that this is just one tool in the toolbox. This is not um, something that I think will uh, completely solve the problem, but I think that we need to you know, implement many different tools in moving forward. Uh, that being said, uh, violent crime, there are statistics that show uh, that CCTV cameras 
uh, and, and deploying those uh, throughout large cities, as we've seen worldwide, do help to decrease and prevent because it also helps to, to with evidence uh, for the police and the prosecution. Um, I also would like to say that I think that for people who are committing violent crimes and are doing so because they have mental health or addiction issues, it also helps to find a way to offer them treatment um, or help if they need that. Um, but that being said, I've heard from many people who don't feel safe going out in our city. I want to be very clear because there has been some misunderstanding perhaps in the media, although my motion is very clear, I'm not asking for live facial recognition software here. This would just be something that the police are able to see. Um, if there is a violent crime that it would be recorded, it would not be live watch. And I also wanted to mention that with everyone today walking around with a cell phone camera and us not having issues, it seems as a society because uh, businesses are able to have uh, their own private CCTV cameras for my colleagues who'd like the police to work more efficiently and would like to see us be more efficient in dealing with violent crime. Those CCTV cameras from private businesses take the police, my understanding from the BPD and my inquiries, is a great deal of time just to canvas for that footage. Uh, that's time that they instead could be spent uh, doing other things, including building cases to bring to crown against violent criminals, like people who uh, are stabbing others in public spaces. Um, we've, we've seen a number of different incidents. I couldn't name them all here, but as we know, uh, the increase in crime is up hundreds of percent. It may go down a percent or two over a couple of days or through a quarter, but overall we know that um, violent crime, anti-Asian hate, uh, a number of different violent crimes in our city is up, and I, I believe we have a duty as a council to do what we can to address that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have questions. Councillor Fry, up to a minute forward at the request of the police department or police board? Uh, no, the police department and the police board do not direct counsel. Yeah, so do you think that... We do not the, direct that. Do you, oh, I'm sorry. Do, I was do, answering your question. Do you, do you feel that police, policing decisions are best made by the police or by counsel? Well, I feel that when counsel governs the pub public realm and the public realm is what we're talking about here, then it's a decision that has to be made with the city um, and with the police involved as okay. well. Okay. The police have the evidence, but it would be our job from a jurisdictional point of view to decide if we had cameras up in the city. Well, we'll have to disagree on that, but what do you, what do you say to section 487.01 of the Criminal Code of Canada that suggests that uh, that under Section 8 of the Charter Rights and Freedoms, Canadians are entitled to a reasonable amount of, of privacy, and without a warrant, uh, this would be invalid. Well, then I think that uh, we, we really have to have a bigger conversation about smartphones, and if businesses in the city of Vancouver uh, that have cameras pointing at, at sidewalks right now that are used as evidence um, should, should be allowed to have those cameras, and that if people in the city of Vancouver should be allowed to use those cameras because that's what's happening hundreds of times a day. The average person is caught on video surveillance somehow and some way. And one more time to make sure that we deter violent crime with the right checks and balances, um, I don't think is out of line. I again, sir, by Councillor Councillor Boyle, up to a minute. Thanks. Uh, we are uh, all hearing significant concerns uh, about the way that CCTV um, further criminalizes poverty and people already experiencing uh, various forms of marginalization. And there are certainly studies out there uh, that, that back up those concerns. Do you have any comments on that? I do, or actually, and I'm glad you asked that, Councillor Boyle. Thank you, because vulnerable people, vulnerable and marginalized people, especially people who are homeless um, are often, as we know from the statistics and the presentations that Council has received from the Vancouver Police Department, often the victims of violent crime. So in moving forward um, with you know, this resolution and, and these recommendations that I'm bringing to Council, I'm hoping that we will make it a safer city for everyone, especially and including vulnerable and marginalized people that can't go anywhere else than be in the public realm. Thank you. That's the minute. Uh, Councillor Hardwick. 
Councillor Di Genova, what do you say to uh, the criticism that this is just leading to Big Brother is watching you and a further erosion of our privacy in society? Well, I, I think we probably should have had that conversation before we allowed smartphones to have, uh, you know, video options where anyone could be filmed anywhere. There are no laws that state that one person can't film another in a public space. We also have hundreds and hundreds of cameras uh, in private businesses. We see these used in the media. We see these used in, as, in evidence by the DC Prosecution Service, by the Police Department, by the Crown, um, such as you know the young man uh, who was stabbed at Tim Hortons recently and almost lost his life. But right now, the police have to rely on that footage. They don't have cameras like we do in with the Olympics. We had cameras here. And also, if we're willing to turn them on, Council, one day a year for celebration uh, lights, why not the other 364? Thank you. Yep. Councillor Swanson. Councillor Swanson. Yeah, what do you say to the women's groups like uh, PACE, Women Transforming Cities, and West Coast Leaf, who say that sex workers are less safe with CCTV, that women spend less time in public spaces when there's CCTV? and that CCTV doesn't protect women from sexualized violence? Well, I would say to them, Councillor Swanson, come to the table and maybe there will be an amendment proposed that you know their lived experience could help to uh, make sure that there's the right amount of checks and balances in here because if they're standing in a public space, Chances are there could, there may be some private, uh, owned uh, cameras already deployed, as well as cell phone cameras. Um, so I, I think that we need to make sure that, you know, people who are vulnerable and marginalized, as you said, especially women, uh, feel comfortable. And I think that they can be a part of that discussion. And that could happen when staff go away, speak with the Vancouver Police Department, as I'm recommending, and also do some research on this. Thank you. Uh, I just have one quick uh, question, Councillor Dejanova. So this uh, this could cost tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars to, uh, for the infrastructure and, and the staffing. Will this come out of the police board budget or the council budget? Well, uh, Mayor Stewart, I'm glad that you, you asked that question. I understand that there are still some cameras that are operational in the city of Vancouver that we only turn on for the celebration of lights. I also understand that there are cameras that were, you know, Many have, have been are no longer activated, but from the 2010 Olympic Games, and as we move forward towards the 2030 Olympic Games, perhaps there's opportunities for funding police board, other than within the bank. Police board or city budget? Pardon? Police board or city budget? City budget and perhaps other budgets as well, Mayor. So property tax increases to bring CCTV in. Not necessarily. I can I see us um, looking at of, other areas. Not the property tax increases. Okay. Uh, no, that's not the case, but you interrupted me answering your question to make a point in a statement, so I'll stop there. My apologies. Thanks for your answer. Okay, uh, we do have, um, we don't have any more questions for Councillor Dejanova. I'm uh, happy to refer this to- We do need a uh, seconder. We do need a seconder for this. We I believe Councillor Hardwick was seconding this. Second. Thank you, Councillor Hardwick. So we do have speakers for this. Move referral. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a seconder. Seconder for referral. Second to refer. Thank you, Councillor Hardwick. Uh, that has been referred to tomorrow. Okay, making the great progress here. Um, so we're the next one is everybody's favorite time of the council is <laughs> notice of council members' motions. Okay, uh, Councillor Swanson, you've got the floor. I have two motions for the May 17th council meeting. Okay, thank you. One is called urging the BC government to end its immigration detention contract with the Canada Border Services Agency. Okay, thank and you. And the other is called emergency actions to protect SRO tenants from displacement to save lives. Okay, thanks for that. I don't see anybody else on the, oh, Councillor Harvick, I've got you on the queue, go ahead. I don't know if it's the right time to do it. It's uh, not a 
motion on notice typically, but we did deal with uh, motions for requests of leave of absence earlier. Yeah, that's just coming up this right now. This section's uh, members' motions. I'll get to that section in a second. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Thank you, uh, Councillor Dejanova. Members' motions. Yes, I have two that I'm submitting. One I'm co-submitting with Councillor Weed, titled "Amendments to the Procedure Bylaw to Enable Council to Hold Meetings for the Duration of Council Terms." And the second is missing middle, the missing middle moving forward. Missing middle moving Goes forward. For the next council meeting, which is May 17th. Okay, great, thanks. And it looks like that's it for um, for for motion. So now we're moving on to new business. Anybody have new business? That would include uh, leaves of absences. Uh, and we have uh, Councillor Fry. Uh, yeah, Mayor, I submitted a, am I on? Yeah, I've submitted a leave of absence to the clerk for tomorrow morning. Um, do I need to pull that up? I can respond to the, we do have some other ones to go through first if you want to just, or, or can you deal with it now? Uh, do I need to read it out is, I guess, the question. Yes, the clerk. yes, you do. Yep, can you read it out? Uh, leave of absence for tomorrow morning uh, until uh, 10.30 a.m. Okay, thank you. Um, what, yeah, we can do all these at once. So we've got the new one from Councillor Fry. Uh, we have Councillor Dominato uh, for June 9th from 3 p.m. to 10 p.m. with Councillor Hardwick for April 27th from 9.30 a.m. to 1 p.m. We have me, uh, myself, April 27th, 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. for civic business. Uh, sorry, the, the, the previous ones were for personal reasons. Uh, for myself, May 17th, 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. for personal reasons, and June 14th, 15th, 16th for personal reasons. Uh, anybody else on this uh, leave of absence? If not, we have a mover, please. So moved. Thank you. Seconder? Second, Fry. Thanks. All in favor, yay? Yay. Any opposed? Those have passed. Thank you so much. Uh, Councillor Hardwick. This is was that for leave of absence or is this that was I, I wasn't sure whether it had made its way through. Thank you. Right. And new business is pretty narrow. It's usually for leave of absence or kind of uh, matters that need attention right away. Uh, and that's what I'm bringing up. Uh, uh, so, Councillor Boyle, if you'd be kind enough to take the chair again. Absolutely. Go ahead, Mayor Stewart. I think maybe the clerks could pull up the uh, the new business item that I sent earlier today. I hope it's not too buried in your your inbox. Uh, Council, I'll just start and say that um, I had a um, I had a meeting with uh, the mayor of Bristol, England, and the head of uh, C40, uh, David Miller. Uh, they have been working very hard to um, have a, a declaration signed uh, on electric vehicle production. Uh, so they've got it, it. I have sent it around to you earlier. It's a, it's a fantastic resolution that I thought we should get behind because not only does it really uh, match, I think, our goals in the Climate Emergency Action Plan. But because we've signed on, it actually highlights the work that we're doing internationally. So I thought it was a uh, a good motion to bring forward. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just looking here at clerks. Did you? Yes. And so you've got that on screen. I'm uh, happy to ask questions about it. It doesn't really uh, commit us to anything more than we're doing, but it does uh, it does allow us to join this uh, international consortium. Basically, that's it's, it's companies, it's countries, it's cities, it's other organizations pushing, pushing, pushing to get uh, to, to get the very uh, strong uh, EV targets. So I'm, I'm hoping. Thank you very much, Councillor Dejanova. It still says CCTV cameras, just so you know. Oh. oh, OK, weird. Just wanted you to know. OK. I did email to the council as well. I know. I just wanted to, just as a point of procedure, a point of privilege. I, maybe I could ask you the question, but um, now, uh, now we're now, we now everything's good. It's updated. I think chair. All oh, right, and chair Boyles. Oh, sorry, chair Boyles. Dr. Rain here. It's updated now. Yeah, it looks updated to me. Thanks for pointing that out, Councillor Dijanova. Um. Mayor Stewart, it looks as though you still have the floor. The clerk's oh, I'm, I'm fine. I'm happy to answer any points of information. Okay, or, uh, but I, I, we need it done by like tomorrow. <laughs> so that's why I brought it in new business uh, today. Otherwise, do, it we have a, do we have a seconder, Council? 
Councillor Dejanova seconded. Oh, sorry, I missed. I missed that. I, I just heard the point. Um, okay, uh, and so the clerk is moving us to a separate queue, and Councillor Weeb is up first to uh, comment. Yeah, I just like to speak in support. Um, I recognize this is timely, um, and I appreciate getting this in advance and kind of getting to read through it because it's really interesting. Um, how the global movement is happening and that we should be a part of it. So thanks for bringing it forward and I will be supportive. Thank you, Councillor Weeb. Councillor Carr. I'm uh, sorry, my, yeah, I think my mic's not on. I'm, I'm a clerk, I am having problems getting my mic on enough, so thank you for assisting me. Um, yeah, happy, happy to support this. Anything that we can do to actually move forward in reducing GHGs is incredibly important. As we all know, 36% uh, of our emissions in Vancouver are due to vehicles. Um, so, uh, and we are on track around that, but it's important, I think, to work also in global um, unity around these things. To, so to be part of, of uh, um, a, a movement of other cities um, doing this, the COP26 Zero Emissions Vehicle Declaration is fantastic. The more people that sign on, the better. And uh, so thanks for bringing this forward, Mayor. Great, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Carr. Uh, and seeing no other comments, I will ask the clerk to take us to a voting queue. That passes uh, with none in opposition. Thank you, Mayor, and I will pass the chair back to you again. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, I think that's it for new business, unless anybody else, I don't see anybody else on the queue. So we can move to inquiries and other matters. Um, this would be questions to staff or thank yous or condolences or whatever you'd like to add. Uh, Councillor Fry, you have up to five minutes. Yeah, thanks, Mayor. Uh, I have a couple of inquiries um, uh, to the city manager, and if, if it's cool, I'm just going to look at you on the screen rather than turn around. Uh, number one, uh, warning on a report back on the Chinatown Plaza. Um, back in November 2020, Councilor Kirby Young and I had brought a motion forward uh, directing REFM to work with the Chinatown Transformation Team and other uh, the Legacy Steward Group and others in innovating and expediting and tenanting an activation strategy for the Chinatown Plaza. Wondering where that is at and how we might leverage that to meet the social uh, public good objectives of the PEF. Thanks, uh, Councillor Weeb. So REFM has, uh, oh, didn't get, the other guy. Oh, sorry, <laughs> Councillor Fry, long day. Um, you're right here. Um, I really don't have an excuse for that one. Um, REFM did engage with uh, Colliers to do a study, a reef merchandising study of Chinatown Plaza um, following that, and the report was received following the motion. Um, there was discussion with the Chinatown Transformation Team as well as the Chinatown Legacy Group as part of that work. Uh, the report we got back about a year ago now, um, it did um, identify as a re-merchandising, and the re-merchandising study uh, at that time focused primarily on retail, which was the the dimension of the property that was having the, the biggest issue with vacancy rates. Um, the, the primary uh, recommendation or option that was identified in that was um, to essentially repurpose the property as a kind of destination food hall. Uh, there are significant issues with that. Uh, it would take a pretty significant capital investment. It's, there's, there's a fair bit of commercial risk on that. It would impact some certain tenants as well. And then in the middle of the pandemic, um, we just didn't have enough information to kind of proceed on, on that particular concept. So there is a, there is a concept there. Um, but I would say, uh, Councillor, at this time, we don't have a particular recommendation. Happy to come back with you know, more detail for Council around that. We certainly understand, particularly now, given the impacts of the pandemic, the challenges with um, tenancies in Chinatown Plaza. Um, so the, all, you know, those issues have certainly become more severe over that period of time. Okay, thank you, thank you for that. Uh, appreciate it and looking forward to, to working further on that because I think there is some innovative stuff going on uh, and opportunities there. Uh, second inquiry for me is uh, there was a recent incident with a threatening interaction with a food delivery scooter riding on the sidewalk. Um, and it's not the first one that we've heard, but this one was well publicized. Um, where are we at with licensing um, for food courier app delivery riders? I understand that um, we, we do have a bicycle courier licensing requirement, bylaw 6066, 
And I'm wondering if that bicycle courier definition needs to be updated to specifically include food delivery and micromobility devices, or does it apply um, to the, this new food app delivery? Thanks, Councillor. H happy to get back on you. My, to you on that. My understanding is, is that the current um, licensing regime does not apply. Um, we can confirm that. It may require some direction from Council uh, if there was an interest in um, either implementing a new uh, regulatory requirement uh, or expanding that. But I'll start with providing just kind of the base information about what the current state is. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, I had some inquiry stuff about, about the Winters Hotel fire, but I understand that we're all asking about that, and I think that we've all got some very serious concerns, and I, I know that staff are working diligently and have had an opportunity to speak to some of them today, so I'll, I'll table that, but obviously we're all very concerned about the outcome of what happened at the Winter Hotel, and, and I think we'd all um, look forward to, I, I, obviously there'll be a coroner's inquest, but I would imagine that we'll get a fulsome report back from um, uh, Fire Rescue and Chief Fry. Yes, uh, certainly we, the, the investigation, the fire investigation is ongoing uh, and there's other dimensions, of course, of this incident. So we, yeah, we will be providing council with a further update uh, on that issue for sure. Thanks very much, city manager. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Wade. Um, yeah, I have two other matters. One is um, just kind of announcements, what's going on. One is the Year of the Sailor Sea conference is happening and just want to let people know that the two students that spoke here will be speaking with Chief Jen Thomas uh, for the final presentation of the conference um, and are very supportive of the work and leadership of the City of Vancouver on declaring this the Year of the Sailor Sea. Uh, the second one is the Restorative Justice Conference is also happening worldwide. And there's a lot of excitement that Vancouver is looking to become a restorative city and that the staff have done great jobs advancing that so quickly. Um, for my inquiry, there's been a lot of conversations between different levels and orders of government on the Vancouver Agreement and opportunities for us to work collaboratively together between different levels and orders of government um, to deal with different crises, including food insecurity and others and water quality. And so I'm wondering, has staff looked at new models of integrating different levels of government um, from an elected standpoint and supporting those conversations as we try to tackle some of the very difficult inter-jurisdictional conversations happening in our city today. Thanks, Councillor. I want to make sure I understood your question. Um, you referenced, have staff done work on integrating at the elected level? Sorry. Well, I'm just wondering, the Vancouver Agreement had elected officials from all levels um, at those conversations, and I'm wondering yes. if there's opportunity for the intergovernmental team here at the City of Vancouver to support those conversations when we are talking about food security or affordable home ownership or um, what's happening downtown east side with homelessness because it seems like we're meeting different elected officials from different orders including Nikki Sharma now is in charge of food security. It'd be great for coordinated conversations on topics and so I'm just wondering if there's an opportunity to move some of the Vancouver agreement work forward. 2.0 like a new version that is supported by our intergovernmental team, recognizing that when we work together on policy, it can be very effective to help deliver some of the very complicated interjurisdictional issues that we deal with here at the City Hall. Certainly. So, yeah, the, the Vancouver Agreement, that construct is um, was a very specific uh, agreement that was founded on the basis of a, a tripartite MOU. Yeah. Um, so it, it was not an ad hoc, as you, as you know, Councillor. Um, at this point in time, the discussions that we've had with the province and the federal government, there is not kind of a shared understanding or agreement to enter into that type of formal under, uh, formal agreement at this point in time on, on the topics that were addressed in the Vancouver uh, agreement, the original version. So, so that model from, from a staff perspective is not one at this time that we believe is feasible in the sense of interest on the part of both the federal government and the provincial government. In terms of coordination with those two orders of government, we're doing that certainly all the time. Uh, the mayor, of course, has discussions with uh, elected officials at both the federal and provincial levels as well. Um, and where there are particular issues, I mean, staff, we generally work at a staff level. So, I, you know, as staff, we don't interact with elected officials. We work with the bureaucrats. Um, so I think if there was an interest on the part of council to engage with um, elected officials on a particular topic, um, we're certainly happy to do what we can to facilitate that. 
um, and support it as best we can at, at the staff level with those uh, other two levels of government as well. I'm not sure if I'm addressing right. your question. Yeah, I guess a follow-up question. Why do you think there's not an appetite from the provincial and federal government to work on a collective MOU to tackle some of these difficult topics? Yeah, I'm not, not really in a position to speak on behalf of the other levels of government. That's just what we've heard from, from the staff, um, from both the province and the federal government. The discussions we've had, I think there's a lot of questions about from the Vancouver Agreement what the outcomes were and did it work. Uh, obviously, the downtown east side is no better than it was when that agreement was entered into. In fact, in many, on many objective measures, it's worse. Um, so I, I think that's the challenge, um, is it was not necessarily, from my perspective, at a staff level, it, what I've heard is it wasn't necessarily viewed as a successful approach. Okay, thank you very much, appreciate that. Councillor Dejanova. Thanks so much. Um, in inquiry uh, to the city manager. My apologies if I missed this, but I've been looking for it and it came from the last inquiry, uh, the last um, regular council when I had uh, inquired specifically about the budget that's being put towards um, the efforts uh, to make Chinatown a UNESCO World Heritage Site. I'm wondering if you can can share with me when I can expect um, the council will receive that information. City Manager. Yeah, I'm just looking at for now, Councillor. I had thought that we had sent an email this morning that included. Oh, that I'm sorry if I missed it, but I'll I'll take a look and maybe connect with you if I can't find it. Is that all right? Certainly, and I'll and I'll confirm as well that it actually went out. Uh, and if it Thank did, I, I can resend it to you. Thanks very much. Really appreciate all the all that staff is is working with it and doing here. And and I did have actually an inquiry also. Um, just uh. And, and it does have to do with the Winters uh, Hotel and the, the devastating and tragic fire. And I just want to acknowledge, um, you know, the absolutely terrible tragedy um, of the lives uh, that were lost um, and, you know, the people who also lost their homes and appreciate others doing that today as well and acknowledging that. But I'm wondering, I, I've heard from um, people in the downtown east side who live in other SROs, I'm sure that other council members have as well that are concerned that there are smoke alarms and and that are disconnected and there aren't appropriate fire watch measures in place at those SROs. I'm wondering if staff can provide an update as to what the state of that is and how often those are checked and what the requirements are. I mean, are there any, um, I mean, how many SROs right now uh, do not have fully active sprinklers or um, smoke alarms and smoke detectors to warn residents? Yes, certainly, um, uh, Councillor, we, we can follow up on that. Um, uh, you know, functioning fire safety systems, including alarms and sprinkler systems, are mandatory for SROs. If for some reason those systems were not functioning, there would be an order in place, uh, as, if they were reported, uh, an order in place from the fire department to remedy that situation as well as to maintain a fire watch pending the resolution of those issues. And from time to time, you know, our, our teams, inspection teams do identify issues with fire safety systems. Um, we, can, we can certainly follow up though with more statistics. If there are, certainly if you are hearing from uh, members of the community who are living in buildings where those systems are not functioning, um, it would be critical for us to understand that. If you could pass it along or have them call through on one. I, I will pass yeah. that along if that's Thanks. all right. Also, would it be possible to, to also add to that in inquiry uh, to share with us how often our city bylaw staff, um, you know, that are that are able uh, and and trained to inspect um, as well as fire are, are going through, as you said, from time to time. You know, there are these inspections, but I'm just wondering how often are those inspections happening and do they cover all of the SROs, even if there isn't a complaint filed? Yeah, so the regular inspections from standards and maintenance are at least annually. That's the frequency. If fire, as I understand, and I'll confirm this for you, Councillor, that fire uh, is inspecting SROs as regular inspections twice a year. Okay, thank you very much. And any other information that you can provide is helpful. And I will pass that information on that, that this can can be reported and should be reported. It should be reported. My understanding is, is it to fire or through the city of Vancouver? These bylaw infractions. Um, well, 301 would take those um, complaints, uh, Councillor, and pass them on to fire. 
Thank you very much. That's all for me for now. Thank you. That looks like it for inquiries and other matters. So we're at that magic moment, Councillor Hardwick. Ooh, <laughs> motion to adjourn. Okay, thank yeah. you. Second, thank you, Councillor Dejanova. Uh, all in favor of adjourning, yay? Yay. Opposed, nay? Clerks, have we forgot anything or are we good? All good, Mayor. Thanks, everybody, for all your work today. Really appreciate it. And enjoy the sun set. <laughs> Thanks, bye bye. Everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye.